group of sessions today. We've got a session on following the rules. We've got a session on water, a session on what's happening in Butte, and a session on tailings reprocessing. So a lot to be covered today. So with uh, no further ado, I'd like to announce our first speakers for today from Crowley and Fleck. They'll be talking about the current environmental legal developments affecting the mining industry. And that is Chris Stonebeck and Selena Sauer. Please welcome them. everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. <clears throat> My name is Chris Stonebeck. I'm an attorney with the Crowley Fleck Law Firm in Billings, Montana. I do environmental and natural resources law. With me today, helping me today, Selena Sauer, also an attorney in our uh, Kalispell office. Um, we're here today to discuss current legal issues and developments affecting the mining industry. <clears throat> it's a broad and interesting subject, at least to lawyers, but why does it matter to you all? The law, statutes, regulations, case law, these all form the context in which you operate or regulate. I know we have a fair bit of regulators here. This law must be complied with. These issues must be resolved before mining can occur. Federal District Court judge in Montana, Rock Creek mine related case, answered it better than I could. Why do you guys care about the law? Nonetheless, the Byzantine legal administrative issues must be resolved before any added or mining can lawfully be approved. There is no way that Selena and I today can cover all the legal issues affecting the mining industry. So we're gonna try to put just a few on your radar screen today. What are those? Broadly speaking, we're gonna cover two general topics. Uh, we're gonna address some recent cases, uh, some recent regulations, um, and some various issues in those cases. The right to mine, environmental review, and if we have time, uh, do a little Superfund work with you. A second general topic that we're hoping to get to today is policy. And in particular, environmental policy and climate change. Got to address climate change. And the important thing about climate change is for the mining industry, there's actually a bunch of opportunities there, especially in the legal realm and we'll get to those. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Selena to talk a little bit about the Clean Water Act. Thanks, Chris, <laughs> and good morning, everybody. Most environmental requirements that mines are subject to come from state and federal statutes and regulations promulgated by uh, administrative agencies and departments pursuant to their rulemaking authority. The orange box includes several of the Clean Water Act regulatory programs that in many cases are administered by states, including total maximum daily loads and uh, the point source discharge permits that I will be talking about this morning. So why is it important to uh, pay attention to what is happening in the courts. State trial courts and federal district courts settle controversies between parties, and those parties are the only one bound by the decision. Uh, however, if the decision is appealed, an appellate court will determine if the trial court applied the law correctly. Now, in the case of the federal system, a United States appellate court a, a, and a court of appeals holding its interpretation of whether a statute and or whether a regulation is carrying out the purpose of the statute must be followed and applied by that court in the future and then by all lower courts within that court circuit. And a circuit is just a region of several states. When several federal circuits end up with differing interpretations of a statute or regulation, the Supreme Court may decide to settle the issue by taking a case on the subject. Thus, since the Supreme Court has the ultimate say on interpreting laws, its holding will be followed and carried out by all of the courts in the United States 
and administrative agencies will adjust their regulations to be in line with the Supreme Court's decision. The Supreme Court's interpretation becomes the law of the land. So watching the courts is like watching a canary in a coal mine. Oops. All right, the Clean Water Act states that waters of the United States are subject to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. I don't know if you've ever read the Clean Water Act, you know, just for fun. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, oh, I touched the mic, the, the, this thing. Don't touch the middle of it if you're a speaker because bad things happen. Okay, so I don't know if you've ever read the Clean Water Act just for fun, uh, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't define the scope of waters of the United States. What is this? It's like moving around. <laughs> I'm not touching it, okay. So it doesn't, it doesn't define the scope of waters of the United States and what they actually are and what they aren't, leaving that interpretation up to regulatory agencies and through lawsuits to the courts. Thus, the Supreme Court's decision on the Clean Water Act will directly affect which part, uh, parts of a mine's operations are subject to Section 404 permitting or Section 402 point source permitting how many permits a mine will need and what types of permit conditions the mine will have to comply with. In 2006, the Supreme Court, in a case everyone calls Rapanos, attempted to find Clean Water Act Section 404 jurisdiction over tributaries and wetlands, limiting the scope of the Army Corps of Engineers authority to require dredge and fill permits. Out of that case came the infamous significant nexus test for non-navigable tributaries of navigable waters and adjacent wetlands that takes into account the flow characteristics and functions of the tributary and wetlands adjacent to the tributary do, to determine if they significantly affect the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of downstream traditional, traditional navigable waters. Okay. Fast forward 14 years and the Supreme Court takes the case of County of Maui, the Maui Wildlife Fund, which came up through the Ninth Circuit, which is Montana's circuit. Rapanos defined the scope of waters of the United States under section 404. County of Maui defines what can be permitted under the Clean Water Act section 402 point source discharge permit program. And specifically, it answers the question, can I just discharge through groundwater to a water of the United States be regulated as a point source with a yes? Very basically, County of Maui was pumping four million gallons of water per day uh, into the ground and it was allegedly traveling one half mile uh, to uh, discharge into the Pacific Ocean. Here, reading the case is like reading Goldilocks and the Three Bears. First, the Supremes try the Ninth Circuit's interpretation of what should be a point source called the Fairly Traceable Test. And basically that says if, if any of the original discharge into groundwater can be traced at all whatsoever, it should be considered a point source. But that is too broad, the Supreme Court said. Then the Supremes try EPA's, it, this is the 2020 Trump EPA's interpretation and county, county of Maui's interpretation that all releases to groundwater should be absolutely exempt from point source permitting. But that is too narrow, of course. So then the Supremes take the middle ground that the discharge to groundwater and then to waters of the United States will need a permit if it is the functional equivalent of a point source discharge. So a little bit more on what happened with this case. The Supreme Court remanded the case back to the district court for the district of Maui. I'm sorry, not the district of Maui, the district of Hawaii. And that court used the functional equivalent analysis to find that the county of Maui's discharge was indeed a point source uh, discharge to waters of the United States. Uh, but Maui, of course, is not happy with the application of that test uh, now by the district court. So it, it, I 
think it might have already appealed the decision and the saga will go on. Meanwhile, just a couple of months after the ruling in June 2020, the Trump EPA finalizes its nav navigable waters protection rule. Notice the first item on the list of waters that are not under Clean Water, As uh, Clean Water Act jurisdiction is groundwater. Now, remember, County of Maui does not propose that groundwater is a water of the United States, only that it can be a conduit for a discharge to waters of the United States. And this is currently in effect in all 50 states for now. And we already are seeing this playing out. In March 2021, the Army Corps of Engineers decided, based on this new rule, that the Rosemont mine planned in the Santa Rita uh, mountains does not need a 404 permit, a Clean Water Act permit, to place dredge and fill in ephemeral washes. I think EPA is also saying that the Army Corps of Engineers did not consult with it properly, and there is at least one lawsuit in the District of Arizona on this case. So uh, we'll see how long it lasts. And. Here is a summary of the EPA's functionally equivalent analysis test from its January 2021 guidance. You will notice that it is much like the significant nexus test. And if you haven't read the guidance and you are dealing with groundwater at all, then you really, really should. Uh, and big surprise, in June 2021, the Biden EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers have announced their intent to revise waters of the United States once again. Uh, I am sure that the National Mining Association and other mining uh, you know, um, entities and um, groups will be heavily involved in this rulemaking, but uh, if you are at all involved in groundwater and um, how this might affect the mining community, you should definitely uh, join in the rulemaking process. You can make comments or whatever. And uh, that, the, you know, the more uh, entities and individuals involved in this rulemaking process, the better it is for the mining community. Uh, they're taking uh, pre-proposal written feedback until September 3rd, which is, I know, only a, a week or two away. Uh, however, then that's just the pre-proposal feedback, and then after that, the real rulemaking will start. Finally, uh, with all this constant shifting and occurring, uh, shifting and like the pendulum swinging back and forth, regulators and permittees should really be keeping up good lines of communication on what is happening with these these point source discharge permits and with their minds that, that y'all might be associated with. Now I'd like to switch gears and mention two mining specific cases that you may already be following. The Pebble Mine Plan in the Bristol Bay area of Alaska recently had a, a rough go of it when the Ninth Circuit said that a Trump EPA's uh, withdrawal of an Obama era EPA 404C determination on adverse impacts from the mine's dredge and fill plan could be reviewed by the court and there would have to be a showing that an unacceptable adverse effects are unlikely. So we will have to see how that pans out. And Earthworks v. the United States Department of the Interior was decided in October 2020 and it's under appeal right now in the District of Columbia. And this is a really interesting general mining uh, law case. So basically, uh, Earthworks is a conglomerate of NGOs and they sued the Department of the Interior over two of its mining rules and lost on both accounts at the district court level. And this kind of shows the district court's deference to the Department of the Interior's interpretation of the general mining law. First, Earthworks claimed that the 2008 mining claim rule violates the mining law and the Federal Land Policy Management Act, FLIPMA, by improperly restricting the application of FLIPMA's fair market valuation mandate for unvalidated mining claims. Here, the court said that the rule is a reasonable construction of the general mining law. So, regular claim maintenance fees can be charged, and rather than fair market value, 
rather than fair market value, right? And a validity examination does not need to take place. I know Chris is going to be talking about this maybe a little bit more uh, very quickly. And Earthworks claimed also that in 2000, the, the 2003 mill site rule that allows for the location of more than one mill site claim violates the mining law by allowing excessive mill site acreage. And here the court found that the mining law does allow more than one five acre mill site per claim if, if those mill sites are reasonably necessary. And now I'd like to hand it over to Chris to talk about some <laughs> other cases. Thanks, Lena. Speaking of the general mining law of 1872, <clears throat> there are a number of issues circul circulating around it at the moment. Broadly speaking, the general mining law governs how private citizens can enter public lands to search for and ultimately mine hard rock minerals. Currently, and often actually, there are efforts to amend the general mining law. It's a popular target uh, for change. Uh, there are efforts that could fundamentally alter how the mining law works. There are efforts to turn it to a leasing system, or to a royalty system, or to impose environmental regulations through that law. Uh, for anybody in here mining, it is a process worth paying attention to. I know there were just recently hearings in Congress on it. I don't know if proposed legislation has come out, uh, but it's very much something that you all should pay attention to. The courts, however, are also addressing various right to mine issues, so it's not just a congressional issue. Um, Selena mentioned this case. Down in the Santa Rita mines, or Santa Rita mountains of Arizona, the Forest Service recently, or here now a while back, approved a, a large-scale pit mining operation. It was challenged. Federal District Court vacated the permit. In short, the court held that there was no right to mine in the manner approved. In order to have, in order to mine on certain mining claims, in this case unpatented mining claims, you may or may not, and it depends on the context and time, have to show that the, there's a valuable mineral deposit underlying those claims. The court said, well, now while there is a valuable mineral deposit evidenced under where the pit mine is going to be in the future, you haven't shown a valuable mineral deposit underneath the waste rock area and a tailings impoundment, or a tailings area. The case is highly controversial. It is currently on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, and it is very much worth paying attention to. Um, not wanting to get down into too much of the legal minutia, but the question is, did the court impermissibly use what are generally legal provisions relating to land tenure or property rights? Do you have a right to mine, essentially? And take those provisions and apply permitting provisions. In blunt, the question is whether or not the court interpreted the general mining law correctly. Um, this is far from over, but for everybody here, a question that should be in your mind, regulars and miners in particular, is if necessary, could you make a showing that the land you're mining on or intend to mine on, can you show that there's a valuable mineral deposit underneath? Another right to mine issue currently circulating in the courts is that regarding bad actors. The bad actor provisions are efforts under the law to facilitate the cleanup of abandoned mine sites or other uh, hazardous weight sites. For instance, under Montana's bad actor provision, if a person or any firm with which that uh, individual is associated uh, failed to comply with its cleanup obligations, failed to comply with its permitting obligations, uh, that person may not be able to mine or, or explore in Montana in the future. How these provisions will play out is a very interesting question. Uh, for instance, uh, Montana DEQ recently, uh, here a while back, everything's a while back now, but it's current, uh, filed a lawsuit against a mining company here in Montana and its president asking that the president uh, be removed from operations. That president was previously affiliated uh, with an operation that had some unreclaimed um, obligations in the state. The action bogged down in what only lawyers find interesting, some procedural issues over jurisdiction. Can the court even hear the lawsuit? Uh, is it appropriate for the mining company's president and uh, the, the, the successor mining company, uh, not the successor mining company, but the mining company now seeking to mine, even be heard in that court? The court said yes. 
uh, which in and of itself is, is a pretty interesting decision. That just came out. There are probably people in this room I suspect more familiar with the latest developments, but I know I think DEQ at least has sought to dismiss the action. Uh, their rationale in a public res release was due to a number of factors, including complex procedural hurdles that complicate the case and potentially risk DEQ's ultimate goal of preventing bad actors from operating in Montana. All due respect to DEQ, I don't know what that means, and we haven't heard the end of this issue. The takeaway, though, for everybody in this room is be cognizant, be aware of your corporate structure, how you, how you organize your mining operation, who the permittee is, who the applicant is, and regulators as well. Um, pay attention. If in that corporate structure you have an entity or a person uh, whose history might raise questions, that could be a question in the future. Leaving <laughs> the esoteric realm of the right to mine, go to the equally complicated subject of the sufficiency of environmental review. In order to authorize a mining operation, environmental review has to take place. In, in, in NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act context, uh, regulators, the courts take a hard look, well, regulators first take a hard look at the environmental impacts of the mine. The question, however, that bedevils courts, regulators, everyone, is how much environmental review is enough? The question has no simple answer. I pulled together from two recent cases two proposed projects. Um, they're both very similar. They're both exploration permit, uh, exploration efforts. In project A, we'll call it, there were a uh, mining company seeking an authorization for an evaluation added in project B, an authorization for exploration activities, drilling some drill holes, monitoring wells. The purpose of both, basically to evaluate that stage of the mine, evaluate the deposit in project A, future mine design in project B, uh, to evaluate the subsurface geology, typical exploration type work. Project A, and this is kind of an interesting one, required additional environmental review in the future, and more authorizations would be required from the regulator before any mining could occur. Very similar in Project B, more environmental review would be required, and there would be additional authorizations needed before any mining could occur. The question uh, is, does the environmental review have to cover only the first phase, the exploration activities, or does the environmental review have to encompass the entire mining operation, essentially a full-scale mine? Anybody want to guess at the answer? Neither do the courts. You'd be right and wrong, actually. Project A, full-scale review required. Project B, only review of the initial exploration phases. There's a lot of reasons why these courts came to different conclusions. The main word, the word here, uh, right there in that left half of the first slide, these turned on the facts of the case. There were some narrow issues about the Endangered Species Act, prior review, that the two cases turned out differently. But <laughs> the two cases illustrate a very important point if you're seeking to mine. <laughs> The sufficiency and the scope of environmental review is an incredibly complex issue. If you have a project that is segmented, that will pursue in phases, there's no easy answer to how broad the environmental review needs to be at the start. And courts have come up with, in different contexts, all sorts of adjectives, all sorts of phrases to try to answer the question of whether or not you need to analyze only that initial scope or further scope. An even more pressing question, however, is not the scope of environmental review, but the repercussions if it is not done correctly. That, too, is a complicated question. The Park County case, recent case out of Montana, has required reading, at least in Montana, on the question of remedies. In Park County, the uh, Montana DEQ issued an exploration license. It was challenged on various grounds, including the insufficiency of environmental review. The court considered a number of issues in this case and actually gave DEQ a lot of, a lot of victories. Uh, uh, environmental review only had to cover phase one of the project, as we just discussed. DEQ was given deference in some water quality data and its interpretation of that water quality data. And the, the project, as defined, was the applicant. By the applicant was the definition of the project. That's a whole separate discussion for another day, how you define the project and evaluate alternatives. But there were some initial wins, I guess you'd call it, for DEQ. 
But DEQ failed, according to the court, to review the impact of a proposed uh, expanded road and its impact on its Montana grizzly bear and brown trout, I believe. Wolverines, wolverines and grizzly bear in this one. Uh, in fact, in the court case, DEQ didn't even defend its analysis and asked the court to remand for supplemental environmental review. The question, though, becomes, what's the remedy? Mining company has an exploration license. DEQ says we need more review. Does the exploration license remain in effect? Montana's Inf Environmental Policy Act, MEPA, seemed to have provided an answer. MEPA provides that where a remedy, uh, where there's insufficient environmental review, the remedy uh, should be limited to remand and further environmental review. The license should remain in effect. The one problem, the major problem, the big issue here is Montana's constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. Montana has a very robust right to a clean and healthful environment. It's both anticipatory and preventative, words you'll see over and over in the case law. In short, that means to give that right any meaning, environmental review, environmental analysis has to take place before mining can occur. Uh, Justice Treeweiler, I believe, in the case you'll hear often, you know, dead fish don't need to float in Montana waters before something is approved. Montana Supreme Court interprets that right, says MEPA amendments, unconstitutional, mining permit, exploration permit, vacated. Park County case, uh, very interesting read and useful for regulators, mining industry alike. It also provides some information for anyone wanting to amend legislation or regulations. Uh, the Gianforte administration here in Montana currently looking at regulatory reform and seeking input from stakeholders on that reform. Uh, my admonition to anybody seeking to modify regulations, MEPA or otherwise, is be cognizant of the implications of any legislative changes. Environmental review is a good thing. It's required under the law. Changes can certainly be made to MEPA and to the regulations and MEPA that implement that. But if you go after sweeping changes like MEPA amendments of 2011, you might have a short-term victory, but you risk complications in the long term. Stepping back really quick from Montana, mining companies need to rethink how they address environmental review. Wild Earth Guardian's another case about environmental review that was found insufficient. But my focus is gonna be on that second blue bullet point down there. Um, when natural resource project applicants hear things like greenhouse gases, climate change, social cost of carbon, they too often run. They say it can't be done. Courts say, however, that it must be done. And if courts are saying that, take advantage of that, embrace it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Selena to talk us down the path of how you do that. All right. The shift to renewable energies is going to be really good for the mining sector. We don't know if it will happen as quickly as some folks are telling us it is going to happen, but it is coming and with it a large incre increase in the amount of minerals needed to build out the infrastructure. Electric car batteries, wind turbines, solar panels, just the increase in demand for copper and aluminum alone is really going to be huge. So it seems that this increasing demand for minerals and metals and increasing, or at least not decreasing, uh, environmental regulation of the mining sector are like two inapposite forces pulling on the mining community. A perfect example of these forces is Biden's Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis. The first bill bullet of the slide illustrates how extremely broad this thing is. Now, any time that you see clean energy technologies and infrastructure, I, you should think of that as an implicit nod to the mining industry. Uh, let's see. Environmental justice is also a very hot issue. It is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, income and income, with respect to environmental laws. EJ is getting written into NEPA regulations and EJ bills are being introduced in state legislatures. For mining, EJ may look like a consideration of whether the facility location or truck routes 
or traffic would have a disproportionately adverse impact on low-income or minority communities, and if so, what can be done to mitigate that impact? Other items in uh, EO 14008 include the 30% of lands conserved, lands and waters conserved by 2030. You might hear this of this as the 30 by 30 goal. And of course, uh, federal permitting consideration of GHG emissions. But the Biden administration is very serious about this new green energy sector. What green energy sector? Mining. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to get so excited about that. Okay, recently the administration released its 100-day supply chain review, and this directly addresses the mining sector. It is definitely worth a read. I'm not going to read it now because I'm in a hurry. Here the executive is stating that mining is important to our future, and the environment is also important, and the two will need to successfully come together for the good of our nation. The supply chain review is clearly a call to action for the United States and the mining sector, and it gives you a glimpse into where mining is headed in the short term and in the long term. Yeah. Chris, do you have no. time for <laughs> So yeah, just thinking really quick about how you turn abstract policy into concrete practical steps. Include this policy in your environmental documents, in your environmental review documents. The courts are going to consider downstream impacts. Tell them what those are. Tell them that mining is critical to climate solutions and the transition to renewable energy. Explain how your minerals you intend to mine will fit into those solutions. Turn the narrative around, essentially, in some of this review. Acknowledge, however, as you must, that mining has impacts and analyze those impacts. But the permitting process too often is viewed <laughs> as trying to smash through hurdles. I've never seen a professional hurdle racer win a race by smashing through th hurdles. Figure out how to jump over them. We've got just a minute. I want to cover just really briefly uh, some cleanup cases, CERCLA cases. I clicked too far. I had clicked too far. Um, Atlantic Richfield, um, many of you may know, it's right in this neck of the woods. Uh, under CERCLA, in cleaning up a historical waste site, such as a historic mine, uh, an assumption has typically been that the cleanup plan proposed generally by EPA uh, would not be subject to collateral attack by third parties. The Atlantic Richfield case uh, put some added nuance on that. Uh, in Atlantic Richfield, uh, mining companies sued by landowners for the important thing here, restoration damages. That's a, another topic for, for Montana law. Uh, but the landowners wanted to implement their own restoration plan. And the question became, well, that doesn't exactly comport with EPA's plan, so what do we do with that? Went all the way up to the US Supreme Court. US Supreme Court says, yes, landowners can seek their own restoration plan, but in an interesting little turn, that plan has to be approved by EPA. Uh, how much that'll actually change. Some people think the sky has fallen in this case. Other people think it won't matter a lot. But another case to be aware of, and if you're cleaning up mine sites, know what stakeholders, know what the local uh, community is interested in. And I'll turn it over really quick to Selena for a, if we have time. Yeah, we're, we're, we got five minutes left. Huh? Total. <laughs> Total. Questions, oh. Uh, so, um, last but not least, there's one more big Supreme Court case that came out in 2020, and it's out of another small island very far away, Guam, and it's over uh, CERCLA happenings at the Oro dot, uh, dump in Guam. And uh, the very short of it is that uh, CERCLA and its state counterparts, well, hold on, sorry. The very short of it is EPA basically was claiming that Guam could not file a CERCLA contribution against it because the statute of limitations had run on a 2004 settlement of Clean Water Act liability, and the court held that only a settlement of CERCLA-specific liability will start the clock on the statute of limitations for the period of time that parties have to file a CERCLA contribution claim. Um, and Chris, I'm not sure if you have any last words to say about CERCLA before we... <laughs> it's a complicated, horrible pun, super fun statute. We'll go with that. <laughs> and uh, that's it for us this morning. I guess we have, do you have a couple minutes for questions? Yep. Yep. Okay. Right. 
All clear. <laughs> oh, that last slide had our email um, on it. And so if anyone else has other questions, our email will be, I think it'll be posted soon, um, you know, with all the rest of the, the information on the MINE conference, all the rest a, of the presentation. I got a question, uh, really good information. Uh, I should have had a lot more coffee for this one. But, uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I was curious a little bit about this valuable mineral deposit uh, information you brought up, how that in, would impact like tellings of helmets, land application disposal ponds, um, underground mining, that type of thing. Could you talk a little bit on that? Yeah, um, very complicated question. I don't have a good answer for you. It could, if the Ninth Circuit upholds the Rosemont decision, very touchy questions are going to arise about whether or not any mining development can occur on any lands where there hasn't been a showing of a valuable mineral deposit. How much evidence will be needed to make that showing will become a question. I mean, validity examinations are typically done in interior. They're a whole separate process. And that's why this case blurred lines that nobody thought needed to be blurred. Well, it depends who you ask, whether or not they should have been blurred. So yeah, the repercussions at the night, many expect that it'll go to the US Supreme Court too, even uh, regardless of what the Ninth Circuit says. But um, that's a poor way of answering the question. I don't know, um, but it raises a lot of questions if that case is upheld about, can you make a showing? Do you have enough evidence to show that there's a valuable mineral deposit under a particular unpatented mining claim? How much evidence is needed to show that? What if there's valuable mineral deposits around it? What about mill site claims? Uh, does the Forest Service even have the expertise or the resources to make that determination? That was one of the arguments of the Forest Service. Sorry, uh, long answer, not a good answer. Thank you. Time for maybe one more question. Uh, going to the Maui uh, case in terms of using groundwater as it charges to the water from the U.S., I guess I'm just curious why, why there wasn't a groundwater permit, discharge permit, or a UIC permit, and the taxpayers prevent that in the first place? Sure, and I, again, I'm not exactly sure. There, there, I'm assuming there would have been some kind of state groundwater permitting but that's on the state side. And so now we're, we're going over to the federal side, which is the Clean Water Act. And, um, and that's where the point source discharge permitting scope question has come up. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really guessing that there was a groundwater discharge permit, but it didn't cover those discharges when they came out um, uh, of the ground into the Pacific Ocean. If they did, this is still under a lot of uh, legal scrutiny right now. Um, so it, it's still wrapped up in the courts again. Uh, so we'll have to see how that plays out. So there might have been some disconnect in the standards for groundwater discharge. Yeah, and I would say ge generally, you know, there are, there are state standards for groundwater permitting and then. But the, the Federal Clean Water Act doesn't, it doesn't recognize groundwater as the waters of the United States. So that's the state side of it. It only recognizes when there's a discharge to, again, waters of the United States. So that's why the EPA is getting involved in Maui. So it might not even matter what the quality, what the water quality is, it's good or bad. It's just a discharge. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. I don't know if we had any questions electronically, but I, at this point, I know uh, Chris and Selena offered to answer some questions if you send them an email in order to stay on track. I think we'll jump into the next presentation. And we'll be here as well. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Have a great conference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, up next, we have Lynn Workweary with CDM Smith, and she'll be discussing how to apply risk-based cleanup levels, and are you doing it wrong? Good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Woodbury, 
Uh, Chris and Selena were talking a lot about the legal aspects of uh, the, the environmental regulations. We're going to talk a little bit more in this presentation about some of the practical application of uh, risk-based cleanup levels, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, whether or not you are applying these risk-based cleanup levels incorrectly. And so I've seen this happen a lot of times. Uh, I'm a risk assessor, so I calculate a risk-based uh, cleanup level or a remediation goal, pass it off to the engineers, and then they don't know how to properly apply it. And so sometimes they apply that level in a way that it wasn't intended to be applied as. Um, and so we're going to be talking about whether or not it's appropriate to apply some of these cleanup levels as a not to exceed action level. So I'm probably one of the few risk assessors in the room, would be my guess. And so we're going to go through and just, at least initially, uh, lay some foundation, because it's important to understand some of the basics of risk assessment for you to be able to understand the proper application of a risk-based remediation goal. And so on the screen here, I'm showing a basic risk calculation example. And so this happens to be a human health risk assessment example. Um, this would be how we would calculate a non-cancer hazard quotient, or an HQ. And so the basic components of this equation is first we have the EPC, which is the exposure point concentration term. And that's going to be a critical term to, to keep in mind and understand for today's talk. And so the EPC is going to be that chemical concentration that we plug into the risk assessment. It's the concentration within the exposure area. And we usually, it's based on our sampling data and we calculate summary statistics and that's what we plug into the equation. The next set of uh, equation parameters are the intake rate and the exposure frequency. So these are going to be specific to the receptor populations that you care about. So if it's a, a resident or maybe it's a recreational exposure scenario, uh, you have information on, say, a soil intake rate, how many days per year that receptor might be exposed. So those two uh, terms get combined with the concentration term to yield the site dose. And so that dose is then compared to a toxicity value, which is this reference dose that's in this equation. And so we calculate the ratio. And if your site dose is higher than the toxicity value, you have an HQ of one or greater, that would be an unacceptable risk. If your HQ is one or lower, that would be an acceptable risk. So, those are the basic components of this equation, and let's focus in a bit more on this exposure point concentration term. So the exposure point concentration term is applied in an exposure area. And again, exposure area is going to be a critical component of what we're talking about here today. So the exposure area is just that, is the area where the receptor of interest is exposed. And within that exposure area, that receptor is assumed to be moving around at random. And so you have my very simplistic graphic of just someone moving at random within my green exposure area. And usually, we don't have a homogeneous uh, contamination within an, in that area. We have a range of concentrations that that receptor might be exposed to. And so we can't ever really know what the true concentration uh, distribution looks like, right? We don't have perfect knowledge. But what we're really after is to get that average concentration within the exposure area. So as I said, we don't know the true mean. All we have at our disposal is the sampling mean. We go out, we collect a finite number of samples, and from that we can estimate the average concentration. But in risk assessment, we like to make sure that we're being properly conservative. And so rather than just taking the arithmetic mean, what we like to do is we like to calculate the 95% upper confidence limit on that mean. And that just adds a little bit of buffer, if you will, to make sure that we're being adequately protective in our risk calculations. And so you can think of the 95 UCL as meaning that we have 95% confidence that the true mean, which we can't know, is going to be below the value, this 95 UCL value that we use as our EPC. And so we can say it the opposite way. There's really only a 5% chance 
that the true mean is going to be higher than that 95 UCL. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of how to calculate a 95 UCL. If you want all the gory details, I'm happy to talk to you after the presentation. All right, so now we're going to go back into our equation. So how do you calculate a risk-based remediation goal? Well, you take that original equation, that risk-based equation, and you rearrange it. And you're going to rearrange it so that you're solving for the exposure point concentration term. Then you set your risk level to the target that you want to achieve. So in this case, let's say we're going to set our HQ to a value of 1. And then we solve for the EPC. And so that EPC that we solve for now becomes our risk-based preliminary remediation goal. Now, the same process can be done if you're interested in protecting for cancer. And a similar equation can be done if we're talking about wildlife. Same general concept. You solve for the concentration. All right, so now let's talk, now that you understand how we derive that risk-based remediation goal, let's talk about the proper application of this. And so this is just a hypothetical example to illustrate the concept. This large box represents my exposure area. Within my exposure area, I have collected 100 samples, and you can see the value, um, the concentration values within each of the, the squares here of, of what my samples show. I've color-coded them based on the magnitude of the concentration. So yellow is not so, uh, not so high. Pink is quite high. And so we can use this data set. We calculate our 95 UCL. Remember, that's the, the statistic of interest when we're talking about risk assessment. And in this case, we get a value of 60 ppm. Now, let's also say, for the sake of illustration, that I have a receptor of interest, and I have back-calculated a risk-based PRG. And for the sake of illustration, we'll say that our risk-based PRG is 50 ppm, OK? So what is the incorrect way to apply our risk-based PRG? So if we were to take that risk-based PRG, and now anywhere we had a colored square before, uh, we apply that value because the colored square would mean that it would be greater than 50 ppm. For the sake of this illustration, let's just say this is an excavation, right? So we're going to excavate it, we're going to remove it, and replace it with clean fill. And our clean fill, uh, we've measured it, and uh, we have concentrations of 15 parts per million. So every square that was above that PRG, I'm now going to remove it. I'm going to replace it with the clean fill. And so all of the green squares here that you see, we have replaced 55 of the green squares and replaced that with clean fill. And now we calculate our 95 UCL for the exposure area to get our post-remediation EPC. And what's happened? The 95 UCL is now 26, but we were shooting for 50. So we are well below the value that we were shooting for, and that means that we just did a bunch of unnecessary remediation. So some key concepts that you need to understand when you're applying risk-based PRGs is that PRG, remember, it's the EPC. It represents the average concentration or the 95 UCL of a chemical within the exposure area that yields a target risk. And so it's not necessary that every single point within that exposure area needs to meet the PRG in order for the overall average to meet the PRG. So a PRG, or an RG, or cleanup level, many terms, is different than a remedial action level. A remedial action level, it's the RAL, is the not to exceed value. That is the concentration above which you need to remove to make sure that the overall average is going to meet that risk-based remediation goal. A key point here, though, is the RAL is something that is exposure area specific. So you can't just calculate an RAL and assume that it's going to apply at multiple sites or even multiple exposure areas within a given site. It's exposure area specific. So let's go back to our hypothetical example. On the left-hand side here is what our pre-remediation concentrations were. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to illustrate what it looks like if we are to uh, perform the cleanup using a not to exceed RAL. And the way that you do this practically is you start with the worst first, 
and you work your way down the list. And so you clean up until you make sure that that 95 UCL for the exposure area meets the PRG. And so you can see here that the uh, squares in green are the ones that we're going to remediate. And if you look at the summary statistic statistics on the right-hand side here, you can see what the outcome is. And right down here, we've calculated that 95 UCL, and now it's 48. Remember the PRG that we were shooting for is 50. And you can see that there's a lot fewer squares that are in green. We only had to do 15 of the sampling units versus 55 from before. So the remedial extent is gonna be much smaller. All right, so that was a hypothetical example. Let's talk about a real world example. So I can't provide a lot of specifics for this particular site due to confidentiality. Uh, but what I can tell you is, this is a site that is in a popular recreational area. Um, it is a former uranium mine. And uh, we went out and collected a lot of incremental samples. It, for those of you that may be familiar with incremental sampling methodology, uh, each one of these squares represents a quarter acre that was sampled in triplicate using ISM. There's about 140 uh, samples, uh, sampling units in this main polygon area. And you'll see that the main polygon that represents the site, you can get an idea of where the general contamination zone was. Um, over here on this eastern border, there was a steep drop off. And so that's why we don't have a lot of samples uh, beyond that. So this, like I said, is a popular recreational area. And so when we were looking at doing our risk assessment and calculating our risk-based uh, thresholds, uh, we were focused in on a recreational uh, hiker scenario. So there was a um, popular hiking trail that kind of went through this area uh, next to uh, the mine impacted zone or through it actually. And so what we did in establishing the exposure area was put kind of a, a buffer, if you will, around the hiking uh, trail and that became our exposure area. So the exposure area was represented by 28 different sampling units. Um, I'm showing, for example, arsenic. There were actually several metals that were um, problematic at this site. Um, within the exposure area, the 95 UCL was 105. We back calculated for our recreational hiker a um, risk-based PRG of 75. So let's refresh. What's the incorrect way to apply that risk-based remediation goal? Well, that would be to apply it as a not to exceed value. And if we were to do that, we would have identified seven different sampling units that would have need to have been replaced, excavated, and replaced with clean fill. But had we had done that, we would have ended up with a post-remediation 95 UCL of 17. We were shooting for 25. Again, way too much remediation. So what's the proper way to apply our risk-based PRG? And that is to establish that not to exceed remedial action level. In this case, we were able to establish a remedial action level of 400, and we only needed to address two of the sampling units in order for the 95 UCL under a post-remediation condition to be below the PRG that we were shooting for. So, just an example comparison of the resource expenditures for this project. Um, ultimately, uh, what ended up driving this cleanup was not recreational hiker arsenic exposures, but we did have some threatened and endangered species concerns that ended up driving the cleanup. Uh, but hypothetically, if the hiker were the only receptor that we cared about within this exposure area, under the incorrect application of the PRG, we would have had about, well, half a million in cleanup costs. But if we properly apply the RAL, the remedial extent is much smaller, the cubic yards of soil that would need to be excavated is smaller, which definitely helps when you're talking about hazardous disposal fees, right? And so, it could be that we would have saved about 350K 
in our overall remediation cost by properly applying that risk-based threshold. So it can definitely be a cost savings uh, if you do it right. But there are points to consider here, and these are a lot of the, <laughs> the big buts. This type of an approach is not going to be appropriate for all sites, and so it's something that um, you need to make sure that you are considering as you do your risk assessment because how you define those exposure areas is gonna be really important. As you saw, depending upon how you define that exposure area, you can kind of um, tweak the system, if you will. Um, a lot of times, uh, if you're inscrupulous, you expand that exposure area to include a lot of clean stuff and that way it drives your overall average down and it dilutes out your risk. So if you're a regulator and you've got someone that's proposing this type of an approach, this is something that you need to be looking at. Have they expanded that exposure area to work in their favor? And another thing you need to consider is whether or not there's actually random uh, exposure within that exposure area. Sometimes within an exposure area, maybe there's something that would make it more attractive uh, maybe there's a certain, I don't know, there's a butte that everyone likes to climb, or maybe it's in more in a residential setting. Maybe there's a playground area, uh, something that, that would be an attractant to a child specific exposure scenario. And so you need to make sure that it is truly a random exposure because remember, we're after that average within the exposure area. Another thing to really make sure that um, you're paying attention to is whether or not you have um, acute or subchronic the short-term exposure potential for the contamination that has been left behind. And so it, I think you saw in the examples, we're not cleaning up every single sampling point that is above the PRG, but what we are doing is making sure that the average meets that PRG. But because there is some contamination that's left behind, you need to make sure that you don't have any contamination being left behind that could result in a short-term exposure problem. And so the RAL needs to not just consider the chronic exposure, but it also needs to look at the acute potential. Now there's also uncertainties in the cleanup levels. Um, as I showed you before, you know, in those back calculations of the cleanup levels, there's a lot of different terms that go into that, that calculation. And so the EPC is only one term. So there's the toxicity values. The toxicity values, those have inherent uncertainties that go along with it. Uh, when you're selecting values for your exposure, um, parameters for your different receptors. So for a soil intake rate or an exposure frequency, a lot of times if it's not a standard default, you know, residential or commercial worker scenario, sometimes we have to use our best educated guesses as to what the proper exposure frequency should be for a recreational scenario. And so you need to think about and consider the uncertainties that go into those cleanup levels that are being derived. And if you, there is high uncertainty, it may be that you're okay with applying a PRG as a not to exceed value because it gives you a little bit more uh, security in your cleanup. You also need to consider your regulatory requirements. Not every state, not every uh, federal agency will embrace this averaging type approach uh, with open arms. <laughs> and so you need to pay attention and talk with the regulators at, at the outset, a priori, before you ever start to embark down this path to make sure that it's something that they're going to support. And uh, because if it's not, there's no sense in pursuing it. I think it's also important to consider too, this may not be a, an approach that can be applied depending upon um, kind of where the state of things is. If you're part of a voluntary cleanup program, it may be that the standards that you're going to be held to don't allow for this type of an approach. So pay attention to the regulatory realm that you're working in to make sure that an RAL type approach is appropriate. So the hypothetical example I gave and also the real world example that I gave, um, we had quite a lot of data to work with. If you're in a situation where you're kind of in a data poor environment, or maybe there's quite a bit of uncertainty that goes along with your data, um, this may also not be the approach for you. 
uh, it's also more challenging to apply this type of an approach when um, you have samples that are representative of composites or incremental samples that represent a large area because you don't have that spatial refinement within that sampling zone to be able to pick out certain places within the sampling zone uh, to remediate. So you need to think about the site data that you have available. Uh, you need to think about the cost effectiveness of the selected remedy. It may be that this, you know, I, the example I gave, it actually made a difference in cost, but it might not depending upon if you have a homogeneous uh, contamination situation. Or it could be that the application of this type of an approach would result in kind of pox of, of remediation and you need to kind of create a contiguous zone. So it's something to just be thinking about when you're doing your remediation. Um, a key one is going to be community acceptance. Uh, because you are leaving residual contamination in place, uh, that can be quite challenging to communicate. Also, the statistics of this uh, can be quite challenging to communicate as well. And so statistical expertise is another piece of it. The, the example I gave was a very simplistic way to uh, calculate this RAL, but it can be quite uh, convoluted and complex. You can use geospatial statistic. Um, you could use area averaging, and so there may need to be statistical expertise, outside statistical ex expertise that you need to hire. So uh, I've provided a couple of additional resources. EPA Region 8 has an excellent um, website that talks about the proper application of PRGs. There's also a guidance document uh, that is a great resource for those that are interested. And I'm also available for questions as well. So I'll leave you with this. Have you been doing it wrong? Um, if, if you take away nothing else, uh, you know, the next time you're handed a, a risk-based cleanup level, at least you think to yourself, what is this based on? How should I be applying this? Where is it to be applied? And uh, hopefully you can take that nugget with you and apply it uh, in the future. So questions, I think we've got a few minutes. I saw a hand. Yes, a lot of mining sites were compliance to uh, grain that might have that rock and soil. Traditionally, we're back to like residential areas and soil and granular materials. But working on a site where we had some bedrock and soils, uh, it seemed like we're being held to the same concentration levels or, or measuring the same concentration the same weighting you know, in bedrock versus you know, loose soil areas. Is there a way of managing that or weighting that so that the factors in better in terms of the you know, I, I think so. And I think, again, it probably comes back to how are you defining your exposure area? And maybe it's supposed to be that it, you know, maybe you need a different set of cleanup levels for a bedrock situation versus a soil situation. Maybe you need to define your exposure areas differently, um, especially if there's bioavailability considerations uh, between the two. Maybe you need two different sets of cleanup levels. But I think if you're uh, being held to just one standard, it, you could spatially weight that bedrock area lower than a soil zone. But again, all of that would need to be discussed you know, with your regulator team a priori before you, you embark down that path. I have one. So how do you appropriately integrate background or baseline conditions? Because for a mining site, that's absolutely paramount. Absolutely. Um, and so this is all about applying risk-based remediation goals. But uh, as you know, you know, sometimes those risk-based remediation goals are lower than background. And so what you're actually being held to is to cleaning up to background. And I could probably do a whole other presentation on how to properly meet uh, background-based remediation goals. Um, but in concept, it, it depends upon what is the statistic within the background data set that you are trying to meet. Background is not a value. It is a distribution. And so it depends on, are you trying to meet the average? Are you trying to meet the 95th percentile? Is it a, a 95 UTL? And so the statistic in that background data set that you're trying to achieve will dictate how you try to meet that, that threshold. Yeah, I think we have any questions online too, just so we're not 
My question was, um, is there a pattern you've seen with where the, uh, uh, the risk-based approach is more accepted by the regulators? It seems like if you were doing it like hard, it's going to be a lot harder to push through this being acceptable compared to, you know, broad-based area. Um, you know, I'm not sure if, if just kind of a, a broad sweeping statement that, oh, you know, X state is more... Uh, you know, amenable to it than, than Y state. But I think on a site by site basis, I've seen it, it gain more traction if you don't have um, a lot of residual contamination left in place. I think um, if you can um, demonstrate that you are making sure that you're meeting both a chronic and an acute um, exposure potential, I've seen it uh, gain more traction that way, especially if you're not leaving behind some key hot pockets of contamination that, that tends to kind of get stuck in people's craw. <laughs> uh, Do we have time for yeah. one more? Uh, great presentation. Uh, can this be applied to establishing ACLs, alternative cleanup levels or concentration levels in a groundwater scenario? Theoretically, yes. Um, I, I think, again, it depends upon what is the basis of the cleanup level that you're trying to meet. Um, and so you need to look to see, is that cleanup level um, more of a chronic type exposure scenario? And if it is, then you could be looking at, at long-term averages versus single point values. So yes, in concept, yes. So we talked about soil, but I think it, it, I've seen it applied a lot with sediments. Um, and it conceptually, surface water would be a bit more challenging since the medium is actually moving, but. One more, if there's any other questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Welcome back after the break. We all had a chance to check out the vendor uh, spots across the hall. This will get us started on the water session to bring us to lunch. So the, the first presentation is from Joe Gilbert with Arcadis, and it's the conversion to a no-purge groundwater sampling at a former mine in New Mexico. So, Joe. Hi there, can you hear me all right? So I'm Joe Gilbert with Arcadis in Helena, Montana, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, conversion to no-purge groundwater sampling at a former mine in New Mexico. Um, specifically, I want to talk to you about a pilot study that we conducted on uh, comparing a no-purge groundwater sampling system for compliance monitoring at a mine to a, the, the mine's existing system, which consisted primarily of low flow sampling techniques. I'll go through the pilot study, uh, talk about the sampling methods and approach that we used for the uh, pilot study, um, talk about the statistical and graphical analysis we did on the data that was collected for the uh, uh, pilot study, discuss some of the findings, and then obviously I know I'm giving away a bit of my hand here, but talk about the benefits of the conversion to no purge system for compliance monitoring at this mine. <clears throat> so, we did conduct a pilot study at a, at a closed molybdenum mine in New Mexico. This was an open pit molybdenum mine that closed in 2014. Um, at the mine, there's a little bit more than 100 monitoring wells that were used um, since 2014, since the mine's closure, to monitor remedial actions associated with the mine closure and reclamation. Prior to 2014, those 100 wells or so were used for um, monitoring uh, operational uh, groundwater quality um, at the mine. So associated with these monitoring wells is a long established um, database that started basically in 2002. So there was a long period of record associated with a lot of the compliance wells at the mine. Um, these wells therefore were really important for assessing uh, continued success of the remedial actions that were going on at the mine. Um, and that was a key component to this pilot study. So what our pilot study consisted of was a side-by-side -side sampling um, using 
both the mine's existing low flow sampling methodology and a no purge method. And in our case, we used hydro sleeves. Um, there are other no purge systems out there that are commercially available and, and some that are proprietary, but uh, we used hydro sleeves and I'll get into the reason why in a little bit. Um, our pilot study really focused on um, the side-by-side -side comparison and making sure that our no-purge system was deployed at the intervals that the mine had, had uh, their pumps deployed at. So we were looking at an apples-to-apples -apples groundwater comparison. Um, the pilot study was focused on a subset. We didn't do this on all 100 wells. We did it on about 12 of the of representative wells throughout the mine. Um, the mine itself is a big open pit mine with tailing facility. Um, there's a, quite a diverse hydrogeologic terrain there. Uh, there's an overlying alluvial aquifer. There's underlying uh, fractured bedrock aquifer. So we chose wells from both of those terrains. We chose wells that had been installed, uh, that had been installed a long time ago, relatively recent ones. And we looked at wells that had different constructions, some you know, just a few feet deep, some more than uh, you know, up to about 500 feet deep or so. And ultimately, our, the purpose of our, our pilot study in this side-by-side -side comparison was to try to see if the no-purge method would, would provide representative groundwater samples and we could switch to this method for long-term monitoring. And really, we were focused on trying to find uh, um, efficiencies with respect to health and safety of the people that regularly work at the mine, um, try to reduce our material consumption, and uh, one big component was to just save time overall um, with the compliance sampling. One real key aspect to, to our pilot study was regulatory engagement. And this is something we tried to embrace early on during the pilot study um, uh, when we were writing the work plan associated with it, was to bring the regulators in um, early. The mindset we were talking about is heavily recreational regulated, there's a really uh, close uh, regulatory oversight component to what the compliance sampling, uh, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a regulatory oversight component to the, regula to the compliance sampling that uh, is pretty involved. The pilot test then, we, when we brought the regulators in at the work plan stage, we made it a collaborative effort between the state and federal regulatory agencies and they had input kind of all the way along in the pilot test. And, and really this became an important fact uh, so that they would have acceptance of this uh, method moving forward if it was successful. So a little bit about the mine's low flow sampling method. Um, I'm sure some of you are probably familiar with low flow sampling. Um, it's a fairly common practice used for compliance monitoring or just groundwater monitoring. Uh, for groundwater monitoring wells overall. At this particular mine, a variety of monitoring wells exist. I kind of hinted on that earlier. Um, they were largely uh, all different types of wells, steel, PVC. Some are very shallow, some were extremely deep. But the mine overall used the same basic setup. They had dedicated bladder pump systems. And I have, I think, this is just a little schematic of a, a typical bladder pump setup. There's a dedicated bladder pump in the well. Uh, there's a little bit of discharge tubing that needs to be maintained at the ground surface. There's an electronic control unit that actuates the bladder pump, feeds water and act or excuse me, feeds air line down and uh, is used to help retrieve groundwater for the sample. And all of this is actuated with uh, compressed air. And at this particular mine, they used a regular rotation of K tanks of nitrogen gas which are fairly large and kind of cumbersome if you have to do this uh, all the time. So there is a pretty, not overwhelming, but there is a setup at each groundwater well um, that you have to set up, take down during the course of any given sample. There are a couple of wells at the mine that are low yielding. Basically, they're not really conducive to the low flow sampling using the bladder pump and they're purged dry. So there is a some wells at the mine where there is an issue with the generation of purge water and being able to get a representative groundwater sample out of the well um, in absence of a low flow bladder pump. So that was another consideration that we needed to, to think about. Um, overall, the you know, low flow sampling at this particular mine took about three full-time staff to, to complete. Uh, compliance sampling is done on a quarterly basis. 
fairly straightforward, but those three people would uh, sample these 100 wells uh, over the course of a quarter, and by the time they got done, it was time to flip the calendar and start all over. So it was, uh, it was definitely full-time work. And that's something we're really aiming at trying to help out with is, is trying to reduce that labor effort. So why did we choose Hydra Sleeves and, and why are we thinking about a no purge system? Um, really in short, because they're simple. Hydra Sleeves are not a particularly new technology. I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with them. Um, they're very straightforward. They're about the length of a disposable baler, about 36 inches typically. They consist of a, a plastic bag or a polyethylene sleeve with a little collar at the top. At the top of the collar right here, there's a check valve that, uh, is a, that opens when you um, retrieve a sample. And basically what you do is you lower this bag into the well. It stays deflated until the time of sample collection. And the hydro sleeve only fills when you pull up on it or when you retrieve it for, um, to collect a sample. So very straightforward, very simple. That's kind of the point of what we're going for here is let's get rid of all this equipment and use something very simple and straightforward. Um, in order to make sure you're getting a representative groundwater sample from the interval you've deployed it at, it does have that check valve in there that I mentioned. Um, and the point of that is that you're grabbing that water column right where the uh, top of that hydro sleeve is deployed. Um, a nice thing, they can be deployed for hours to months. Because they don't fill with water when, until they're retrieved, um, when you're doing quarterly sampling like we're doing at this mine, you basically pull the hydro sleeve that's in the well out, you decant off that water for your sample or whatever you need it for, you take a brand new one and you lower it and just leave it in the well. It doesn't fill with sample until you retrieve it the next quarter. So very simple, very straightforward. Um, hydro sleeves also can be uh, customized either... Um, they can make custom sizes for you, or you can deploy them in series or parallel if you have multiple screen intervals, things like that. Or if you have QC samples or additional sample volume you need to collect, they're very straightforward for uh, allowing you to be able to get the adequate volume. Um, and for our study, um, being an a open pit metals mine, we are looking at primarily inorganic constituents, so dissolved in total metals, major ions, TDS, things like that. So hydro sleeves are perfect for being able to analyze those constituents. Um, I skipped over this one. So uh, really, Low flow sampling is built around an idea that you need to get rid of stagnant wellbore volume prior to sampling. And uh, kind of the theory or the idea around hydro sleeves or really no purge sampling in general is that groundwater actually flows continuously through monitoring well well screens. Um, and that's because the monitoring well is more permeable in the surrounding formation. You get constant flushing of that well screen. And therefore, this idea that you need to purge a well or that you need to stabilize parameters may not necessarily be true or really be necessary uh, in order to get a representative groundwater sample. So part of our pilot study was to prove this out by doing a side-by-side -side sampling. Is the, are we getting a representative groundwater sample out of this well if we get rid of the pumps and the established method and just insert a hydro sleeve? Um, that's kind of the idea behind them. So our particular pilot study was done in several phases and, and a large reason for doing different phased approach was to establish with the regulatory agencies that we could isolate or try to eliminate the effects of seasonality in the wells um, at the mine. So we conducted phase one in 2018. As I mentioned before, we, we engaged about 12 wells, but six of those wells were um, sampled side by side in the first and second quarter of 2018. Once we received those initial results, which were pretty favorable, we added six additional wells for phase two and sampled all 12 wells for uh, samples or for quarters three and four um, in phase two. We did have uh, really good analytical results, which I'll get to in a minute, um, but 
we had that regulatory engagement component and we, we pre initially presented our phase one, phase two findings to the regulators. They wanted us to expand the data set and make sure that uh, you know, we've, we've thoroughly vetted this process. So we repeated the, the uh, 12 well sampling for an additional quarter back in 2020 um, and came up with consistent results. So there wasn't uh, anything anomalous about phase one or phase two. So we went out and, and collected the samples, had them analyzed by the mine's regular commercial lab, um, and we compared that data, the, the low flow system data, with the um, hydrosleeve no purge collected data, and we analyzed that data both statistically and then we just displayed it graphically for communication with the regulators. There are two uh, basic statistical evaluations that we did and uh, the first one is just we calculated the relative percent difference between the two methods so um, you can see the equation for relative percent difference a being the uh, hydrosleeve uh, concentration for a given constituent B being the uh, uh, low flow bladder pump system uh, analytical result for a given constituent um, relative Percent difference is just expressed as a percentage, and I'll get in on the next slide as to how we looked at this particular criteria. The second criteria that we looked at um, was related to the mine's quality assurance project plan. Um, there are field duplicates that needed to be collected uh, as a regular component of their compliance sampling. Um, and in their uh, QAP, the quality assurance project plan, uh, it basically says for the collection of field duplicates, if the sample result differences were less than two times the analytical method reporting limit, they meet quality cri control cri criteria. Basically, if you're looking at two sample results from the same well for uh, a given sample plus its field duplicate, if their uh, variability is less than two times that reporting limit, um, they're comparable data. So we looked at our... Um, no purge sample with respect to the actual sample in with respect to their their quap um, on the next slide uh, is just an example of the statistical comparisons and i have one of the wells mmw 19a on the chart um, on the in the first column is the low flow bladder pump results on the second column is the hydrosleeve results and the relative percent difference is in the third column there um, we established a, a relative percent difference criterion of plus or minus 20%. Basically, if the relative percent difference that was calculated from the two results was plus or minus 20%, we considered that to be a good result or that the, the data was comparable. Um, overall, you know, we had really good constituent results. You can see uh, one wet relative percent difference down here for lead um, did not meet the relative percent difference criteria. And where we did um, have some issue with establishing a good relative percent difference, it was always where we had very low constituent concentrations, very close to the laboratory reporting limit, and very close to, uh, well, actually, in this case, it was an estimated laboratory value that was compared. So we're talking about uh, concentrations well below any regulatory threshold level for decision-making purposes. So. Um, uh, in general, things with relative percent difference looked really good. Um, and then also just with respect to the QAP and the QAQC criteria, we also saw that same thing where we had detections of constituents um, that were, you know, basically substantial. We did see good, good uh, agreement between the two methods. We also uh, did graphical comparisons of the data. Um, and all we did was a simple, straightforward one-to-one -one plot. If you can look at this uh, chart I've got on the left, this is MMW19A. Uh, on the y-axis, we've got plotted the hydrosleeve concentration. And on the x-axis is the um, low-flow bladder pump system uh, method. And a, a true one-to-one -one plot, if you have the exact same result, the, result the, the two concentrations will plot right on this 45-degree line. Uh, here. And uh, you can see we have really good agreement for most all constituent concentrations um, for all, all of the phases, basically. 
uh, 19A was not analyzed in the phase one. It was one of the additional wells that was brought on. You can see there's a couple of outliers here. This is the, these are those lead results that I showed on the last slide. These, and if you look at the actual uh, axes, you can see they're at extremely low concentrations where we saw a little bit of variation. But overall, very good agreement from the two different sampling systems. So what we found in our pilot study was that there was good agreement in organic constituent concentrations between the two different sampling methods. The low flow bladder pump system uh, worked really well, but the no purge system, we weren't able to see any, any variation or any systemic sampling bias associated with the no purge system. Um, we did test against those different well conditions. Uh, we had different hydrogeologic conditions out there. We had different well constructions out there. We tested those things, and we also tested against seasonal variability and didn't really see anything uh, in the data that would suggest that those, those play a role. Um, so from that uh, analysis, we, we recommended that the no-purge method would be suitable for ongoing compliance sampling at the mine and that we'd have representative data to be able to compare with uh, the established data set for each of the wells out there. Uh, we presented this data to the state and federal agencies. They approved uh, the use of the conversion to hydro sleeves in, 20, in the in second quarter and in the third quarter 2020. We did actually pull all the pumps out of the wells at the mine and began sampling just using no purge methods. So uh, obviously there's, there's a lot of benefits there. Um, the primary one, um, but not the only one is just overall less time spent at each well. Um, we've since since that third quarter of 2020, we've got almost an entire year worth of sampling under our belt now, and I can tell you, um, the time you spend at a well is uh, substantially less. Um, there's no equipment setup time. There's no takedown time. You know, it's very simple, straightforward. Uh, it's kind of a, in, uh, a just a very simple method for, for getting our groundwater samples. At the low yielding wells, we eliminated purge water and disposal issues. Um, we're no longer even producing any purge water out of any well, so very straightforward. Um, and as mentioned, we basically eliminated all of those, uh, all that equipment and made it very straightforward for the field sampling teams out there to continue sampling without needing any type of uh, or without needing a lot of additional equipment. Um, we reduce the safety hazards uh, associated with just manual handling. You know, groundwater sampling is fairly straightforward, even low flow sampling, but just eliminating that equipment, lifting, moving uh, uh, that stuff around, and in particular, those nitrogen K tanks, uh, we've eliminated, and that's helped out tremendously. Since 2013, too, we've also worked with the mine on integrating and giving their, uh, the field staff out there um, field tablet computers and updating their, their field multimeter instrumentation to be able to have a, a digital field data collection system. It's really improved the field data integrity and combined with the no purge system, they're, uh, they're getting really tight um, and minimizing the time that they have at each well. That's about all I've got, I guess, do we have any, are there any questions or concerns or thoughts? Yeah. What was your overall labor change? Yeah, so good question. Um, it was about three full-time people. We are down to two, I can't say they're full-time. We complete the, the compliance sampling in about a month now with two people. And the third person moved over and helps out with some NPDES sampling and some other mine operational things that are still going on out there. So um, we basically made a full-time job for three people, a part-time job for two people. Yeah? Have you guys done any work implementing this at other sites to see if you have similar results? Yeah, actually we have. We've, we've, we've actually helped another client uh, do a conversion at a mine in Salt Lake City. Uh, to this using the same basic um, uh, pilot study outline and, and, and regulatory engagement. So we have seen some, some good success that way for sure. Yeah. Uh, I've got a statement and a question. As a person who spent a lot of time purging wells, <laughs> and builds a lot of hours, 
Thanks for nothing. <laughs> sure. I, I've been hearing about no purge techniques for you know some some years now, but I don't. I'm not aware of it. it's really uh, gained widespread acceptance. I might not just be loop on that. What's your sense of how accepting regulatory agencies are of this technique in sites where maybe you don't have such a long period of record, or maybe it's infeasible, or whatever, you don't want to spend the money to do like a comparative study like this. Is it gaining much traction? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, what's the regulatory environment like? Um, it's actually really good. Um, I think the key, I mentioned it in the, in the presentation a little bit, is to engage the regulators early on when you're thinking about this process. At this particular mine, it is very heavily regulated and they were very skeptical. So the other aspect of designing this pilot study was to say, hey, listen, we're not gonna go crazy here. Let's, let's start with a subset that's representative of what we see at the mine and let's get a phased approach and have you know, test for variability, test for seasonality, and make sure that we've got uh, uh, consistent results before we go too far. And I, I think things are, uh, at least with those regulators, things are, are, are good since they've accepted it. And, you know, where we've deployed the same basic idea elsewhere, um, we've met far less resistance. So I, I think this is taking off for sure, and um, hopefully it'll, it'll, it'll continue to grow. So we'll have time for some other questions if there's any. Yeah. So what type of wells were do you expect this not to? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, where we have had difficulties really comes down to well conditioning. Um, where we've seen problems with turbidity increases or unstable field parameters, it's really been in old wells where we've got steel casings, um, and they haven't been redeveloped in years. There's either scale or something going on down the hole. And that can usually be remedied by um, uh, a redevelopment program. So um, there is a way around it. But yeah, I mean, the troublesome wells tend to be the older kind of uh, uh, steel wells, if you will. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. We have Katie Seipel from Environment, and she will be talking about the increase in sulfate reducing bacteria in groundwater resulting from hydraulic bulkhead. So please welcome Katie. Thanks. Can you guys all hear me? Great. Thanks, Dan, and everybody else for making this conference happen. Um, it's really nice to be back in person. <laughs> Um, as Dan said, my name is Katie Seipel. I'm a senior environmental scientist with Environment Inc. in Bozeman, Montana. We are a firm that specializes in geochemistry and biogeochemistry of mined environments. So we're particularly interested in microbial community analyses in mined environments. Um, today I'm going to be presenting some work from a little bit of a side research project we've been doing at the Glengarry Adit site in the New World District of Cook City, Montana. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers on this, um, Seth, my co-authors, Seth D'Imperio, uh, Lauren Bozeman, and uh, Dr. Lisa Kirk. And because this is a long-term ongoing project, I'd also like to just acknowledge that this is um, made possible because of the work over decades by many people, including um, Mary Beth Marks and Sunny Thornborough of the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I can't go without thanking Tetra Tech and Shane Matoliak in particular for allowing me to coordinate our field activities with his. And um, Alan Kirk and Henry Bogert were really involved um, and really spearheaded a lot of the design and implementation of the actual bulkhead construction at this site. So I'd like to acknowledge their contributions. Also, um, Dr. Skarupa at the Montana State University Center for Biofilm Engineering 
as well as colleagues past and present from environment have all contributed to the sample collection and microbial analyses, molecular work, DNA sequencing I'm presenting today. Thanks. So a little project history. This is a long-term project. Some people here are very familiar with it and others have never heard of it. So I'm gonna review the project a little bit to um, start. It's um, the Glengarry Adit is, as I pointed out, in the New World Mining District outside of Cook City, Montana. That's in um, just northwest, uh, I'm sorry, northeast of Yellowstone National Park. Um, you can see on that map, uh, I guess I should show you here. And the Glengarry Adit is specifically this red dot at the headwaters of Fisher Creek. And it was, it's a classic ARD situation with low pH and high metal concentrations as shown on the left. And it was draining, it was considered the major load contributor to Fisher Creek and potentially even one of the biggest load contributors in the drainage in general. So Alan and Tetratech and Henry Bogert all got together with the Forest Service and designed this um, plan. This is a cross section that shows the adit and what the goal was to cut off drainage from the portal over here on the right side of the screen. And then what you'll see on the left is that this involved um, installing a grout curtain and a raised plug up here in this vertical shaft. This area in yellow is, um, was a major mineralization zone and there was a lot of infiltration coming in from this part of the workings. So one of the first things they did was go in and close this off. Then they installed these four um, hydraulic engineered hydraulic bulkheads in the adit itself. These are major construction efforts. We're not just talking about throwing a little bit of concrete in the, in the hole, just to be clear. Uh, I'd also like to point out this blue vertical line in the middle here. This is a monitoring well they were um, kind enough to install during the construction activities. They actually drilled from inside the working straight up so they would ensure that the screened interval of the well was inside the workings behind that first bulkhead. So we would be able to see what that impounded groundwater looked like. And as you can imagine, this didn't just happen in one season. Um, some of you that may be familiar with Cook City know that it's um, a high of a relatively high elevation setting, alpine setting, and really it's only snow free for three or four year, uh, months of the year. So this construction happened over a period of three years, 2004, 2005, and 2006. Um, this is a look at the portal. I'm gonna point out a couple features. The portal pad involved um, a lot of construction and staging area, as well as two sediment catchment ponds here, and a little bit of uh, this historic <coughs> mine included in the fenced off area. This red circle shows you about where the portal itself was. You'll notice that um, the, uh, this drainage is right to the lookers left of the portal. And um, the area extends down along this edge of the trees here. Um, so this was portal pad construction. When you rehab these tunnels and do this work, you actually need to plan ahead and worry about what's gonna to happen to the water and sediment as you're doing construction activities. And they did that well here. The bulkheads themselves, as I said, are not just a pile of concrete haphazardly put in a hole. It involves construction with six inch steel beams um, that are faced with strips and then lagging to create a form, essentially, for your bulkhead. Um, these, and you can see at the top there and here, there are cement pumping lines that were used to place the cement behind the forms in these structures. And beyond that, what they did is they used burlap and grout to ensure a good contact with the wall and really make sure this is um, a watertight setting. And as a result, you end up with these really well-constructed watertight hydraulic bulkheads. In between each of the four bulkheads that I showed you in that cross-section, the tunnel or the adit workings were backfilled with waste rock. There were certain areas where they may have added some more grout 
or cement for strength and stability. And at the portal, they uh, reclaimed the surface and backfilled it to limit access. And today, um, there's a little different perspective. I know the pictures are a little dark. Um, what you see is that the area has been naturally revegetated to look like the surrounding landscape. And um, this is that row of trees I showed you before. The historic mine features are still there for context, <coughs> historical context. But those areas that had sediment ponds and a little road, it's all been reclaimed. This is that drainage, looking up that drainage that I pointed to. The portal is somewhere right down here in the bottom right of this image, and it's unrecognizable today. Um, and huge success. We decreased, well, we, they decreased drainage from this feature by 99%. So they essentially shut off the loading to Fisher Creek from this feature. So it was a huge success. Um, so we at Environment, as I pointed out, are interested in geochemistry and um, microbiology, and we want to know what's happening in that impounded groundwater. Now that you're not letting it drain, that same water is allowed to back up inside the mountain. And what's happening to it? What's it doing? What's the chemistry like? Um, as I pointed out before, there were, we were able to sample water from this draining at it before and tell that it was an ARD situation. Um, this is Lisa in the tunnel itself collecting some samples. And this sample is called, uh, this site was called F8A. Oops, I'm sorry, wrong button, getting ahead of myself. Um, and I also pointed out that monitoring well that they installed, which was really great for us um, because the workings filled within 60 days. 400 feet head of water filled up to create artesian conditions at this sampling point. And this is the top of the well. This is an image of that well before when they installed it in the workings before they closed it. So now, because they took the time to install this well, we can say what's happening in the groundwater at this site. I will point out that they have since put a packer in and it no longer freely flows <laughs> unless they pull the packer for sampling. <laughs> so now that I've told you where we're gonna measure chemistry, I'm gonna show you some chemistry. So just consider yourself forewarned. Hey. Um, this is a time-based graphic showing uh, the, the span of sample collection on the x-axis. And these horizontal lines uh, indicate the period of attic closure between 2004 and 2006. On the left, we have the pH axis, which corresponds to this blue line. And I'll just straight away point out that the pH before closure was right around three, sometimes above, and sometimes as low as two and a half. And then post-closure, it rose dramatically to about five and a half or six, and it's really stayed there since. Uh, on the right-hand axis, you'll see the dissolved metal concentrations that corresponds to aluminum in black, copper in orange, and zinc, or, yeah, zinc in red. And uh, although the aluminum dwarfs the scale here, you do see that all of these drop significantly post-closure. So this is a classic scene where we've cut off oxidation and we've remedied the uh, acid rock drainage production in this setting. But if we look at some other chemistry, again, we have pH here in blue, corresponding to this left axis, but I now show the dissolved oxygen on this axis as well, which corresponds to this gray line here, which was high when it was open to the atmosphere and has since dropped post-closure, um, oscillating a bit. There's a little noise in the data there. On the right-hand side, we now have iron and sulfate in milligrams per liter. And these correspond to this brown line and this green line. And I think you can all see that these two constituents rose post-closure, which was a little bit interesting at first. And we thought, what on earth is going on? But we did some modeling and we learned, well, we, we confirmed that actually there's most likely over the years, jerosite mineral precipitation during the open oxygenated phase, and that precipitate, when that pH rose, jerosite is a mineral that actually dissolves when pH goes up, which seems a little counterintuitive, but that dissolution of jerosite most likely led to this elevation of iron and sulfate. 
And um, these concentrations peaked around 2011. And um, that was around the time Dr. Kirk was finishing her PhD and has really gotten involved in the microbial ecology of these mind environments. So and she said, let's go collect some samples. <laughs> so she worked with Shane and um, our colleague Lauren Bozeman to go get a microbial community sample from the well in 2013. Um, since then, we have also seen stabilization in these parameters, sulfate and um, iron and even DO, dissolved oxygen, has really dropped off and stabilized. So we at Environment have decided to more recently go back and collect some more microbial community analysis samples from the well. And that's what I'm going to be presenting today. Before I get into results, okay. I'd like to take a moment to tell you why we care about microbes and why we think you should too. Because we are all interested, I'm going to use an example of acid rock drainage here. Classic ARD involves oxidation of pyrite, which releases some hydrogen ions that contribute to acidity. And at a pH of greater than 4.5, this abiotic, gen generic abiotic reaction is pretty common dominant. But when we get into lower pHs and we have uh, biological influence from iron and sulfide oxidizing bacteria, what I'd like to point out is that that one molecule of pyrite leads to way more acidity production. So in this case, these microbes are not necessarily doing what we would hope, but understanding that they're capable of doing this is really important to all of our objectives. So thinking about neutralization, a common abiotic neutralization technique is to add carbonate minerals to a setting to offset the production of acid generation potential. Here I show a generic reaction with pyrite and uh, calcium carbonate and some water and oxygen to create uh, ferry hydrate and gypsum in the solid phase. So that produces no oxygen. It basically eliminates the, I mean, excuse me, produces no hydrogen ions. But um, bacteria can help us with this too. Microbes um, known as sulfate reducing bacteria, we call them SRBs, can really work to take sulfate and metals in solution to keep up, um, to, to take up these um, constituents by reducing the sulfide and forming metal sulfur complexes such as fer uh, pyrite, iron sulfide. And this, produce, this neutralizes the potential for pyrite to become acidifying. So back to what we do at Environment. Um, we went back to revisit. We went to the site in 2013. And uh, there's a picture here of some of the biological flocculant that was, uh, purging, was purging from this artesian well while Dr. Kirk was there sampling. So we were able to collect this material and use it for our community analysis. Um, in the seven years that lapsed between these two samples, we have learned a lot at Environment about how to get a really good look at community analysis in situ, in, in a setting. So we use this, these things we call biocoupons. They're perforated sleeves filled with a relevant rock material. In this case, we used um, sterile quartz sand because we didn't have material from inside the mine itself. Um, and we sterilize these in an autoclave at our facility and bring them sterilized to the field to deploy them in a setting, in this case, into FCGW um, 100. And we leave them there for a while to allow the microbes to grow on that surface. And then we're able to remove those and preserve them and analyze them. So that's what we did in 2020. Oops, sorry, getting ahead of myself again. Um, once we have these samples, which we collect aseptically, so we can't keep all the, all the um, we can't make it sterile when we're out in the field. But we can t use techniques that we've developed and protocols that environment's particularly good at to keep the sample as, as clean as possible so that we don't contaminate it with our own bacteria from our hands or from our breath or blowing around in the environment. 
those samples, we bring them back to our in-house molecular lab in Bozeman, where we can extract the DNA, and then we amplify it with PCR. A lot of these settings don't have a lot of bacteria, or you might not get a lot of DNA out of it, so you want to make a lot of copies so that you can be sure of what you're analyzing when you send this amplified DNA to a sequencing facility. So there are facilities, the same way we can get our gen genes sequenced these days, we can send these um, microbial communities off to be sequenced at these facilities. And what they send us back is the relative, the, the amount of the different sequences that we had. And we then use our institutional knowledge and um, literature and published databases to characterize those communities. So um, we take the microbes and we say, who's there? And how many of them are there? Now, we can't get down to the species level, but we can get one level closer with genus, or one level away with genus level analysis. Um, it's really uncommon to be able to get a true species analysis because these microbes are changing a lot too. Um, further to that, we're not only interested in who's there, but what they're capable of doing. So if we just look around this room, we could put people's names down and say, so-and-so's here, and Joe's here, and Lisa's here, and all these people are here, but what do they do? Let's categorize them by geologists, and mine engineers, and, and regulators, and consultants, and put them into categories so we can understand the, um, what the functional capacity of the group is. And we do the same thing with microbes. So finally, to some results, <laughs> this is the re um, relative abundance of the sample we collected in 2013 and um, categorized by function here or sort of groupage. What we have in green are um, SRBs, those sulfate-reducing bacteria. The light green are anaerobes that are not capable of SRBs. Now, not all SRBs are anaerobes, but most of them are. So for the sake of today's discussion, I'm going to just assume that the SRBs we have are aerobic, uh, anaerobic. That means they cannot live in the presence of oxygen. So if we had them in this room, they would die. There's too much oxygen here for them. Um, the blue group, I'll jump over to this very dominant blue group, is the opposite. Those are the aerobic bacteria. They absolutely need oxygen to live, just like you and I do. So what we have in the middle are these interesting group of facultative anaerobes. And these are sort of the switch hitters of the microbial communities. They can either use oxygen when it's there, or when it's not, they might use sulfate or nitrate or something more curious like arsenic. And these are interesting microbes that may be serving an interesting purpose for us as well. And then I'd like to point out this tiny sliver of light blue. These are uncharacterized bacteria. This goes back to the origin of our data analysis. These are not, un, they are not unimportant. They just haven't been classified. There are billions of <laughs> types of microbes in the world. And they're just, we just can't keep up with what they all do. So these are, this is a small class here that we just don't know quite what they're doing. And so what is this? pie chart tell us. And what, what I would say is, this is a mixed community of aerobes and non-aerobes, which speaks to the fact that we have fluctuating oxygen and maybe, uh, maybe we have a stratified environment where there's oxygen at the surface, but there is some anoxic conditions deep in the mine. Or maybe there are isolated niches where there's no oxygen. It, it's a little hard to tell exactly, but that's the interpretation. So let's revisit what the chemistry was doing at this point. Remember, this sample was collected during where this orange line is. And this is right about the time we started to see this drop in sulfate and iron. It hadn't stabilized yet, but it was dropping. And oxygen had still been kind of fluctuating at this point in time. It even went up after this. Now look at where we go to this next sample that I'm about to talk about. Oxygen was very low. And iron and sulfate had generally stabilized at this point. And that's reflected in the microbial community analysis as well. So what you see here, again, same color scheme, SRBs and anaerobes in 
uh, green, they make up nearly 80% of the relative abundance of the sample at, in 2020. So this really is confirming that, yep, we have very anaerobic conditions that are now established in this site. And we're really going to be reducing that sulfate that maybe still be released from Jerosite. We're not quite, you know, without knowing exactly where the sulfate's coming from, that would be my guess. And saying, these guys are here and they're doing their job. We have way fewer aerobes, almost none, and fewer facultative um, anaerobes as well. Interestingly, we have a little bit larger population, 12% or almost 13, I, oh no, 10%, sorry, of uh, uncharacterized bacteria here, or microbes. So it's kind of an interesting look at how it changed and how that confirms what we saw with the chemistry and goes hand in hand with the chemistry. So oh, in conclusion, I'd like to say that before we get to the microbes, the adit, hydraulic bulkheading of the Glengarry adit was unbelievably successful. Not only did it cut off the drainage that was loading into Fisher Creek, it actually also improved the groundwater quality of that impounded groundwater. So it was a, sort of a twofold success. Um, the jerosite solubility, as I pointed out, was an interesting story to tell with the sulfate and iron production we saw, or release that we saw. And that the post-closure bacterial community that shifted in this really helps tell the story as well. The aerobes that decreased in um, relative abundance may well have been those ARD um, acidophiles, the, air, the, the bacteria that drive ARD. Um, meanwhile, the dramatic increase in SRBs is likely to be the communities that will help um, continue to improve the water quality at this site and explain the later decreases in iron and sulfate that we saw. Um, so, goodness, sorry about this. There we go. Um, I hope if you remember anything from our talk, my talk is that microbes matter. And um, these little invisible creatures not only can affect global economies, but can also impact your mind site. And if you take the time to understand them and understand what they're doing at your site, you can also take actions to help optimize the system you want to function. So this presentation that I just gave you was about sort of a reclaimed site, passive, we're not doing anything to these bacteria, we're just looking at who's there, purely out of interest. But my colleague, Dr. Kirk, is giving a talk tomorrow about how environment uses this sort of technique at a large scale operation to help them plan and mitigate their water quality issues at this site. And so this is really important to applicable sites, not just, or active mine sites, not just a reclamation site like this. Um, so I'd encourage you to attend her talk tomorrow to see how we, we apply this in an operational setting. And with that, anybody have questions? <laughs> yeah? Have you uh, analyzed for TOC or are there any organics? Um, have an idea what the SRBs are using as a carbon source? I, I don't know because I don't know specifically because we don't have that data. Um, the chemistry that we have available is based on the long term monitoring of the site in general. And we have, um, since that project is actually wrapping up, we've started collecting some of that data ourselves with permission of um, the Forest Service and in coordination with Tetratech. Um, but we haven't done any TOC. I, I suspect that it could just be from um, the cellular material that's built up over time. So these bacteria don't just grow and then live forever. They grow and die in a cycle just like we do. <laughs> and um, that, that structure of the cell could be contributing a small amount of carbon to the system. There was another question, yeah? Great. Thank you. Did you, was uh, iron bacteria, did it play part in any of this? Did you identify that? Or? Um, that's a great question. I don't have those data with me, but yes, I believe there were some iron cycling bacteria in this community, and um, I can take a look and get back to you on the specifics of that if you're interested. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> since the monitoring well in Artesian, was there any other um, 
locations where there was kind of a new, um, you know, spring that developed. New springs. Yeah. I, my understanding is no. Can I put somebody from Petrotech on the spot on that one, Shane? I think that you're correct, Katie. The only yeah, your well became wildly artesian. My well, huh? <laughs> uh, there's another one out there that was artesian and is now only seasonally artesian. I think that's a larger uh, climate change thing, perhaps. It's definitely gotten drier out there. As far as seeps, the only one that comes to mind is uh, right around where the added portal was reclaimed. We think what's happening there is just there's some shallow ground, not ground water necessarily, but there's some fracture flow near the surface that comes out. So I, I wouldn't attribute that to flooding necessarily. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, no, I'm not aware of any anything else. Yeah. They did a lot of grouting to try and keep the water in and not allow it to just start springing out all over the place. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. session, Steve Dent with CDM Smith, covering Not Your Average Contaminant, Tools and Techniques for Evaluating Mercury Contaminated Mindsets. Well, now for something completely different. Actually, those previous uh, talks were actually good segues. We'll be talking a little bit about sulfate reducing bacteria and differentiating background from um, other risk-based screening criteria. But um, what I I've been doing the last 10 years is focusing primarily on uh, mercury contaminated sites and in particular uh, mercury contaminated mine sites and it's not your everyday metal you know of course there's toxicity there's exposure risks but once there's an aquatic food web in play it becomes very very unique and different and it's got to be handled in a different way because we have a lot of success stories of cleaning up hot spots and, and you know, areas that pre present an exposure risk. But we don't have a lot, hardly any success in these legacy sites that have ended up with elevated concentrations of mercury in the food web. There are very precious few examples of uh, success stories. And that's something that we're trying to change. But one of the problems about that is differentiating what background contribution is and what the source area contribution is. Because there are plenty of sites out there that have fish tissue cons um, consumption advisories that are not impacted by a, a particular point source area because it's an unusual, unique pollutant. It enters the global atmosphere and deposits all over the landscape. And so if the conditions are right, you can have a problem without a point source. And so when you do have a point source, a contaminated site, you have to figure out, well, what's the contribution of the background and what's the contribution from this particular site? Because we don't want to clean up beyond what the site's contributing. In, in Superfund, we're not allowed to, right? We have to figure out what that contribution is, and it's not easy. So I'm going to present today basic, a basic grab bag of ideas, analyses, and concepts related to mercury being a unique, system, uh, a unique contaminant that um, is, is a, it's a tricky little puzzle, right? So we're gonna talk about why it's so unique, the different types of mercury sites that we deal with. A lot of them are very specific to mercury. Uh, the fate and transport, this unique metal transports and, and phase changes in very interesting pathway relative to other things like arsenic and lead. Um, then we'll talk about the mercury assessment and then analysis, you know, what do they tell you? Which analysis to use to tell you what you need to know? All right, are you dealing with just a hot spot and exposure issues, or are you dealing with mercury entering the food web? And if mer mercury is entering into a dynamic food web, the plot thickens, right? So there's different direct mercury measurement tools in the field. There's standard versus trace uh, mercury analysis in the laboratory. Um, there's different applications for what that data will tell you. 
And there's also some very new analytical tools that are a bit of a game changer in the mercury assessment world. Right? So we'll get into these uh, mercury speciation evaluations that aren't just whether or not it's organic or inorganic, but groups of species and their mobility and toxicity, as well as this new, and I think it's going to be a game changer for the industry, is a stable mercury isotope fingerprinting, where it's basically environmental forensics. You know, where, who done it, right? So mercury is unique. One of the reasons it's most obvious is it, it's the only metal out there that's a liquid, right? It evaporates, it volatilizes, it enters the global cycle, right? And so if I were to drop a droplet of mercury right here on the table, it would start to evaporate and the concentration of mercury vapor in the room would increase. If you have mercury fillings, you're breathing mercury out right now in your breath. You have to be careful around blanks. If you're in the lab, if you have a lot of mercury fillings, you can contaminate your blanks because you're breathing mercury. Um, it follows preferential pathways. It's liquid and it's dense, and so it's going to travel downstream, right? Over hundreds of years, um, these things end up in a nice little location and they're not moving anymore, but when they're dumped out, a lot of times it's not right below where it was dumped out at. It's moving underground and it's finding preferential pathways just like groundwater does at times. And it's also very, it's got very low solubility. So if it is underwater and say a stream bed, it's not going to go anywhere. It's, it's, not gonna, uh, it's not going to dissolve in the water and you can go to a site that's 100 years old and take a scoop of sediment and you'll still find beads of mercury there, right? From 100 years ago, because that kind of locks it in. So that's a very unique aspect to this particular metal. Inorganic mercury, much like any other metal out there, it's got a large range of mobility and toxicity. But one of the problems is, is inorganic mercury can be converted to methylmercury, the organic form that builds up in fish. It's the only form that we care about when it comes to the food web as far as building up in the fish. We're not talking about exposure if you get the fish that is going to be toxic to touch. But what happens is it builds up in the food web. It, biomagnifies, which is different than just slowly building up, up the trophic ladder. It's like a hockey stick curve. So we're talking about orders of magnitude increases in concentration from the water to tissue in, say, like a large mouth bass. So types of mercury sites. We have the chemical plants, chloralkali plants. There's a lot of old chloralkali plants that are being cleaned up right now because they used to use liquid mercury as the cathode and anode, right? If you have a liquid cathode nanode, you don't have to worry about scaling. Um, pesticide manufacturing. Well, mercury is toxic, so it made a nice pesticide. And so there's a lot of old pesticide manufacturing plants that are pretty nasty. We're working on one now in New Jersey. Uh, Coal-fired power plants, probably the biggest contributor to atmospheric mercury out there right now, right? Because as a global community, we have a lot of reliance on coal-fired power. Uh, nuclear weapons manufacturing. If you're familiar with the Oak Ridge National uh, Labs, that reservation, um, they used to uh, make nuclear weapons at this facility. It's loaded. It's one of the hottest spots in the United States because of the, the nuclear weapons manufacturing that went on there and the use of mercury in that process. But what we're interested in is mercury mines and retorts or historic gold mines and silver mills. Because everywhere you dug mercury up, you're going to have a lot of mercury associated with mercury ore. But they use that mercury to uh, mill silver and gold, right? So a lot of these sites in California, the hot spot of pretty much mercury contaminated mine sites in the United States, we have this, these yellow dots here in California that represent old abandoned gold mines. Here closer to the coast, you see a lot of red dots. Those are cinnabar mines, right? The, all, the objective was always to find a really close mercury deposit near your gold mining operations, right? So you didn't have to ship in really heavy mercury. And so they have all these cinnabar mines associated with all the gold rush that occurred throughout that gold rush period. And these sites, there's in, in California right now, there are over 40,000 abandoned mine site features just in California, right? That are uh, all on the list to eventually be buttoned up in various degrees of um, contamination. But um, so this is just an example of one state, the biggest hot spot in the United States because of the gold rush. Um, and there's a lot there. And 
these watersheds are screaming hot, right? So over like a hundred year period of time, the stuff's been sloughing off these contaminated sites, going down the watershed, building up in reservoirs. There's a lot of water supply and control reservoirs in California, and they have trout in them that are higher than sharks in the ocean. Sharks are naturally high. They're an apex predator of the ocean, very long food web. They have really high concentrations of fish. And by the way, um, public service announcement, don't eat a lot of shark or you'll probably end up having a hard time walking down the street. But in California, they have trout that are similar levels, right? It's really heavily contaminated. In the United States, there are fish advisories for every state now. Um, the difference between the yellow and blue is the yellow states decided they're going to do watershed to watershed. So they issue an advisory. They go out and they do the testing and say, this one's good, this one you have to be careful. Over here, the blue states, well, they said, okay, it's just too tough to really pin it down. We find enough high levels of mercury in fish in enough different watersheds that we're just going to say blanket advisory over the entire state. So, um, but these advisories are the way they are because it's not just sites, right? It's not just contaminated mercury mines running off into the aquatic ecoshed. It's, it's global deposition. It's, it's coal-fired power plant deposition. It, and it's the right conditions to convert inorganic mercury to methyl mercury. It's a, it's a very complex web that causes it to be a problem. And so we have to go into each site, look at the food web, and determine how are we going to differentiate the background from the, the source. And sometimes that means you're going to clean up to a level that leaves the fish above a consumption guideline as long as you've addressed the, whatever's coming off the source area. Another illustration of this is a USGS sam sampling that occurred of 367 streams, freshwater streams in the United States. This curve here shows the distribution of exceedances um, for mercury concentrations in fish. This line right here is the 300 part per billion consumption guideline. 25% of all fish sampled in all these different watersheds throughout the United States were above the consumption guideline. And you notice here the light purple triangle and then the dark blue circle. Um, the purple triangles are mined, mine impacted areas, and then the blue uh, circles are unmined. You can see a very even distribution between the two because there's problems when there's point sources and when there's not. And so that just complicates how we approach this and how we solve the problem. The instinct is to, okay, we need to bring the fish down below the consumption guideline. But if there's conditions there that are conducive with mercury methylation, you could remove all influences from a particular mine and still be well above the consumption guideline. So we have to be able to tease it out. So just a little bit on how this happens. Mercury enters an aquatic ecosystem, whether it's deposition from the atmosphere or running off from the watershed into the bottom of, say, a receiving water body like a reservoir, an inorganic mercury. And that inorganic mercury enters these quiescent bottom zones and sediments and undergoes mercury methylation when they gets into an anaerobic condition. We just heard a talk about anaerobic microorganisms. Well, sulfate-reducing bacteria, iron-reducing bacteria, methanogens, they're all responsible for converting inorganic mercury to methylmercury, but they need to be able to operate to do that. So if there's oxic conditions there, if there's nitrate there, they're not going to be able to do their thing, right? So the conditions have to be ideal, and that's typically when it gets low energy in the bottom of these lakes and reservoirs. So what that, oops, once converted, this methylmercury starts going through algae to zooplankton, young of your fish, and then to larger, more predator fish. And in each stage, it amplifies. And we'll get to a graphic that shows kind of the scale of amplification between each trophic level. I'm assuming here. Uh, to take a snapshot of the sediment water interface, over here we have not only oxic conditions, but aerobic conditions, right? So if you burn through all your oxygen in the surface sediments, you might still have nitrate. If you still have nitrate present, you're going to still be in an oxidizing environment, and those sulfate-reducing bacteria aren't going to be operating. But once that's all consumed and you start reducing your metals, they usually 
precede uh, accumulation of methylmercury in, in the bottom waters, you'll start seeing reduced forms of manganese and iron enter the bottom waters. And then as you start burning through your sulfate, the sulfate reducing bacteria get to work, you start getting methylmercury transitioning into the pore water and then diffusing up into the, into the water column. But the problem with evaluating mercury is that it's really difficult to track if you just use total mercury analysis. I know we're always trying to save money on analysis, right? Well, let's try to, try to solve the problem with using just total because methylmercury analysis is a bit expensive. But if you're dealing with a food web issue, you need to get a handle on what's going on with methylmercury and it doesn't track well with total. So here's a graphic of hundreds of different mercury contaminated mine sites and their subsequent fraction of methylmercury of total with changing total mercury concentrations. Here you can see with decreasing total mercury concentrations, you get increases of percent mercury. There's a lot of factors that go into that, but it's an inverse trend. But here, the sim those similar sites, as you move down distance from the source area, you get a higher increase in methylmercury. And if I was to show you a graph of total mercury at distance from the mine site, it would be opposite. You'd see a decrease in total mercury and an increase in, in methylmercury. And there's a couple of factors there, right? The type of mercury present at the mine site, is gonna be a lot of mineral bound mercury that's not available for those little microorganisms to convert into methylmercury. And as that moves downstream, it, weathering and other transformational processes breaks it apart makes it more labile and available. But also as you move downstream, you're mixing in the mercury runoff from this whole other watershed. And if you have a large watershed, you're getting a lot of background sources mixing in there too, which is typically more available than what you just dug out of the ground. All right, before we get into the analysis, just a basic backdrop of what a typical mine site would look like. Here you have a source area up in the hills. You have a mine and a milling operation some contaminated tributary that's running off into the watershed into larger and larger reaches as the river migrates down into typically a reservoir. Um, a lot of these are water control reservoirs up in deep watersheds. Um, and as you migrate down, you get varying changes of composition of mercury. And typically down here, not only is it more labile and ready for methylation, but you have conditions down here that are more conducive of mercury methylation. So we get into what kind of analysis to use and when. We Probably most of us have exposure to using XRFs, X-ray fluorescence. Um, it's great for total mercury in soil and sediment at high concentrations. The problem is it's not very sensitive, right? Literature values say you can get down to you know, 2.5 micrograms per gram. In sites I've worked at, typically we get non-detects below eight, but it's pretty high concentration considering um, uh, threshold effect concentration is about 0.2, a little below 0.2, right? We can't use this to screen for that risk, exposure risk for ecological risk in the sediments. But it's not bad at the mine site proper where we have screaming hot levels and we're trying to, you know, determine where the hot zones are, you know, the, the big drivers of exposure risk at the actual mine site. But down here in the watershed, this type of analysis isn't really going to tell us much. It's going to give us just a bunch of non-detects. We have oh, uh, sensitive little bugger. Direct analyzers that you can bring out in the field that have much lower detection limits. Um, we have the Lumex, the Milestone DMA. They have single digit part per trillion con um, detection limit capabilities, but you're out in the dirty field with potentially mercury vapor and mercury contaminated dust. It's really difficult to achieve those lower levels of uh, concentration without contaminating it. In the lab, they typically do this in a class 100 lab where everything's very clean. So when you start getting really, really low concentrations and evaluating them, you need to be able to um, keep everything very clean. And so, um, but these are more applicable to the whole watershed. Um, it, total mercury is what it basically looks at, but the Lumex does have a, the capability of, of looking at mercury vapor. Um, it, there's capabilities of doing soil sediment, biota, and, and vapor. Biota, these samplers typically have a little bit of error associated with them, but they're a good quick fix. Um, I've seen areas where they bring a milestone DMA, DMA 80, and set it up on the beach. 
right? And there's a fishing derby, and they start just processing samples. And there's a little bit of error there, but it's real rapid, real-time data, and it can be a useful tool. But the real workhorse in mercury analysis, when it comes to moving into the food web, is the trace mercury and methylmercury analysis, the EPA methods 1631 and 1630. Those are very highly refined, accurate methods. You send them into the lab. They have sub part per trillion levels. And we'll talk in a minute here about why sub part per trillion levels are not only a real thing, but they're really important when it comes to mercury building up in the food web. These are good for most types of media. Um, the problem is it's, it's, it's expensive analysis. So typically in projects, it's, there's a pushback on overly using trace mercury analysis. But again, if you're worried about what's going into the food web, there's no other way you're going to be able to track that other than being able to look at what the water concentrations that algae are living in, for example. Um, it's easy to contaminate. Oftentimes it requires special training and specially cleaned sampling gear. So it's a, it's a complex process. But it gives you great information. You can get the fraction of methylmercury of total, which is an important metric when you're trying to look at the productivity of any methylating system in, in a watershed. You can use it for all media, and it's ample sensitivity for pretty much any environmentally relevant conditions. Right? If you're getting a non-detect with trace level techniques, that's typically not something you'll have to worry about. When you apply methods like these, you can start getting at the percent mercury, methylmercury of total, which is a surrogate indicator of methylmercury production, right? Methylmercury is continuously being produced in sediments and is continually being destroyed by other microorganisms in sediment. And so what's there at any one snapshot, the percentage doesn't, it seems funny to consider a percentage of methylmercury of total as a rate but in all, intent, all intents and purposes, it is a rate because there's always, there's always organisms creating it and always or, organisms destroying it. So any snapshot is a surrogate indi indicator of production rate. But if you really want to get to where the rubber meets the road is, is to evaluate pore water, which takes quite a bit more resources. I'm working on a project right now. Next week, we're bringing out a mobile lab. And we're setting it up and taking cores and extruding them and putting them into a centrifuge. And we're actually physically extracting poor water on site. It's expensive, but that's the real indicator of what's getting into the, into, the, into the water from the sediment. That's that first step, production in the sediment, migration into the poor water, and then diffusion up into the water column. Here's some, col here's some uh, example sediment columns here. These two top ones are of a water column above the sediment water interface that are anaerobic, right? And so you have a lot of methylmercury production at the surface sediments. This is just a sandy core. Down here, this is an example of a core with an oxygenated sediment water interface. You can see that zone of methylmercury production is pushed down into the sediment. A lot of remedial actions associated with mercury in, this, in these systems is to maintain oxic conditions. But you can really get a good evaluation if you use both total and methylmercury when you're looking at these. Uh, sediment cores. Methyl mercury uptake in the food web. So this is why trace mercury is important when we're looking at food web. These are the multiplication factors between each stage in the trophic level, starting at the water, going to algae. That's the biggest leap. It's a concentration factor of up to 100,000 times, right? So what's in the water concentrates and sorbs into algae, and, and it's body burden is 100,000 up to 100,000 times higher than what would be in the water column. And that's of methylmercury. And then each subsequent jump in the trophic ladder, you get a two to five time increase in concentration. So what that equates to is concentrations in the water of methylmercury, less than half a part per trillion, is more than enough to give you fish tissue body burden of over 300 parts per billion, which is the food uh, the consumption advisory that the EPA has set to limit your consumption of fish if it's over this level. And so that's all it takes is less than half a part per trillion. This is why we need trace mercury techniques when we're evaluating these things. And as far as fractionating your types of mercury in your species, well, when you get to the large predators, most of that mercury generally is in the methylmercury form. 
But these smaller critters will have a higher percentage of total. And so if you're trying to track the actual mercury that's transferring through the food web, you need to be able to look at what's going on with methylmercury specifically, especially at these lower stages here. In a project we worked on down in California, we looked at zooplankton. And uh, between the wet season here and the dry season here, we see the green bars is total mercury for a wet and dry season on, on zooplankton body burden. And the green bars are methylmercury. Now, we have an increase in both from the dry to the wet season, but we have a much, dramatic, much more dramatically high increase in total mercury. And if we were just using total mercury to evaluate this zooplankton, we would think we would have a massive food web problem associated with this wet season, but we wouldn't because all this mercury in the green bar would not transfer to the next trophic level. It's just the blue bar that would transfer. And this is just an example of a, of a method to, to extract zooplankton from a water column that I developed for the Santa Clara Valley Water District down outside of San Jose, where you pull a large, a large mesh uh, zooplankton net. The nice thing about a large, large mesh zooplankton net is all the algae falls through. And you can get a look at the base of the food web, which changes in real time to water concentrations. And so you can send it half off to for enumeration and speciation, and the rest off for your analysis of both total and methylmercury. And so it's a, a lot of folks are hesitant at looking at the base of the food web. It's very accessible, and, and it's really not that hard to do. OK, so let's get into some of these other analysis tools. All right, so we, uh, here we go. Selective sequential extraction, SSE. This gets confused a lot. Um, people will order the analysis and try to figure out what to do and how to interpret the data. Um, this is a qualitative assessment tool, but what it tells you is it takes soil and sediment samples, and it's gonna give you information on its mobility, it's gonna give you information on its toxicity, and um, its basic availability to undergo things like methylation or be transported. What it does, it breaks it up into groups. So you have up here at the top, these are two different methods. The SSE method that you know, breaks uh, mercury uh, groups down into five different distinct groups. And then the EPA 1300 or 3200, which breaks it into four. This one is an EPA approved method. But what these groups are is essentially they take a soil and sediment sample and add water. What extracts with water? Okay, that's really labile. It's, it can dissolve real easily. It's highly transportable downstream. It's extremely available for mercury methylation. Then they start adding weak, weak acid soluble. Okay, that would be a surrogate indicator of what happens when if you eat it or, or other processes that aren't as, or a little bit more aggressive than just water. And then they up the intensity of the digesting agent. And each, each stage gives you a different group of species that are mobile and bioavailable in a different way. And the further down the ladder you go, these here aren't mobile and they're not available for biological organisms to process. And so if you take a watershed and you go to the source area and you take samples and you walk all the way down to say a reservoir and do this analysis, you get a readout like this. These top Three here, the FC samples are around the mine site proper. This FC00 is above the actual source area. These large kind of dark red burgundy colors and brown are the F4 and 5 fractions, the very recalcitrant non-bioavailable fractions around the source area itself. This is typically what we see around mercury mines, a lot of unavailable, heavily complex mercury. As you move down the watershed, you start seeing a growth in the pattern of this green bar, which is the F3 fraction. We go back here, the F3 fraction is the organocomplex fraction. It's mobile, it's available for use by microbial organisms. And we can see here, this analysis showed us the picture of that mobility and the bioavailability moving down the watershed. It's qualitative, right? This isn't a quantitative snapshot, but it's telling you the general idea and picture of that availability. There's another way to represent it. 
is just to use the distance downstream and plot each fraction separately. And here, the color would be red for the organic fraction as it moves down. It's inverted from this picture with the mine site proper, moving down towards the reservoir, the, the reservoir being up here. And at this point in time, this is a combination of background sources and source area sources. All right, so the final element I want to talk about is stable mercury fingerprinting. This is going to revolutionize mercury assessments, right? This is the forensics of the mercury analytical world, okay? So what is an isotope? All elements have different isotopes, right? What makes it an element is the number of protons and the number of electrons. That never changes, right? But what does change is the number of neutrons. That neutral charge particle changes. And when that changes, the weight of that particular atom changes. So through mass spectroscopy, we can differentiate different fractions. And here's a typical breakdown of a mercury sample, right? The biggest fraction is the mercury 202. Second biggest is mercury 200. There's all these different fractions. And these are the big ones. There's over 40 for mercury. But the big ones here have a specific signature and a size of their little pie wedge. Every source of mercury has a little bit different configuration, right? It's like a fingerprint. And some, there, there, you will run into some sites that are similar enough that you won't be able to differentiate, but typically different sources have a different signature. And if you can dial in on the differences in signature of the background in your source area, now you're starting to get into being able to differentiate downstream sources and how much actually came from your site. So it, it gets rather complicated in the isotope evaluation world. There's three different ways that these, these isotopes fractionate. There's mass dependent geological chemical processes that uh, are preferential for different weights. The size of the actual atom preferential pathways and it'll fractionate in a specific way just based on weight. The other two are mass independent, and they're re related to whether it's an odd or even number. And it gets kind of into the kind of wild uh, physics of spin of the particles. But they will undergo different fractionations in different biogeochemical processes. And if we use each of these different phenomena of fractionation, we can track how those signatures change, because that signature from the mine site is going to change as it goes downstream. And as it changes, we need to know how it changes so we can track it. If we can track it, then when we have a sample in, say, a largemouth bass in the reservoir downstream, we can understand the processes that it went through and track that signature change and then compare it between background and, and source area. And so essentially what you do is you get a good, really good representation of the background signature. And sometimes that means you're going to go to multiple locations that represent different components of the watershed that are mixing. And then you're going to get a good representation of your mine site area, your tailings, your waste rock. And then when you have those two end members and you're confident about your end members, you get samples down in the downstream area in different media. And you put those through different mixing models and you're able to tease out fractions. And where they've done this, it's really interesting, is in the Great Lakes. So you have Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, Lake Ontario. And they've looked at three sources. So they have three sources. They have watershed contribution. They have industrial contributions. And they have a precipitation, just atmospheric deposition contributions. And what they were able to find and differentiate is that Lake Superior and Lake Huron have a pretty minimal contribution from industrial sources. So from a policy perspective, they don't have to worry about those too much, right? But over here, Lake Michigan, Erie, and Ontario have pretty significant industrial contributions. And now they can use policy around those, those systems to regulate discharge from the various industries around those lakes. Um, there's a mindset that we're working on right now that we've been able to um, go halfway down the watershed. And we found about 40 to 60% of the water transporting through the system, 40% for the dissolved phase, 60% for the particulate phase, is from the mine site. 
we are able to determine that definitively, right? And so when we change, turn the knobs at the mine site on the different types of you know, source areas that are contributing to that load moving downstream, we have a fraction target that we can start looking at and track the reduction in that mine contribution in the load transported downstream. So it's a hugely powerful tool. We're also going and we're taking uh, isotope samples of sediment, pore water, zooplankton, uh, benthic invertebrates, young beer fish, and predator fish. And when we have this completed, and hopefully next year will be ready for presentation, this is going to be a revolutionary new approach to evaluating mercury sites and to really target what your real cleanup levels should be. You know, is it, is it going to be based on just risk or is it going to be based on background? And what's that contribution of the background to this food web? So just to summarize um, my scattered thoughts, it's a very complex element to work with. Um, it, it's much, it's, it's, it's traits through the aquatic ecosystem are very unique. There's not a, another metal like it. And you really need to answer the questions of what are you trying to address? Are you just trying to address exposure issues? Or is this, has this developed into a fish consumption issue and a watershed um, a food web issue? And if it has, well, good luck because there's not a lot of success stories, but we're getting there. Um, these tools that you use are going to be really important. And it it's sometimes might take a lot to convince folks to they're needed. But if the moral of the story is there's not a lot of success in buttoning up these sites that have contaminated food webs. And so we need to start using these newer kind of innovative approaches to evaluate uh, how this particular tricky little element is migrating through the ecosystem. All right, so with that, I will just go ahead and take care of questions. Yeah. Hey there. Um, I'm sure you're observing, as I am, that mass spectrometry has evolved into this incredible uh, group of acronyms describing a whole host of different methods with the low detection limits for this, these goals. I'm wondering if you're doing HPLC coupled to a particular type of mass spectrometer, and, and further to that, is there a commercial laboratory that you work with that, that you think is, is best suited to provide that type of analysis? Right, so this is the, currently right now in the United States, there's one lab that's doing it. There has been more than that, but uh, Brooks, Brooks Applied in Seattle, their machine went down and due to COVID complications, they are projecting they're gonna be up and running for isotope analysis next year. Um, but the USGS uh, lab in Wisconsin, they've been doing it for about 20 years now. Um, so it helps to have a teaming partner like the EPA to get access to those labs. Um, but they, they worked with that Brooks Rand to use their uh, trace mercury setup associated with the mass spec. So it's kind of a hybrid between uh, the, the standard workforce for trace mercury analysis that Brooks Rand uh, developed, and they coupled that with the mass spec. And they've been using that for quite a few years. Um, but Brooks Applied eventually started offering it, and then their, 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 their analyzer crapped out, and they're currently getting set up to offer that commercial service again, and they're out of Seattle. So Brooks ran turned split, and then the analytical version is Brooks applied right now. So next year, that will start being commercially available. You need to find a teaming partner to use the lab, uh, the USGS one in middle in Wisconsin. So it's a deep ICPMS, or is it with the isotope analysis, or what's the front end on the, on the mass spec? The front end is, it's, it's um, the, the term for it. Um, it's the front end of the trace mercury analysis setup. So uh, it, it, I can get you that information, but I, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it collects it onto a little gold trap. It's, it goes through a very long series of chemical extractions. Um, I can't think of the name of it at the time. So, yeah, it's it's a hybrid. 
it's a hybrid between the Brooks Rand system and instead of, instead of feeding it into the cold vapor atomic fluorescence spectrometer, they go into the GC or the mass spec. Oh, yeah, we use Brooks for selenium. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So methylmercury is what's partitioning onto the tissue, but through their other interactions with the environment, their the organic mercury is going to be in in the, the body burden as well. But that doesn't transfer when. When another organism consumes that organism, it's primarily methylmercury that's, you know, everything else passes through the digestive tract and then methylmercury starts partitioning as they grow into muscle, tissue, fat, skin. And so um, that's why higher up in the food web it gets, so it, like algae, it's gonna have a lot of total, like inorganic mercury associated with it. Zooplankton can range from anywhere from 15% methylmercury to 90% methylmercury, depending on the conditions. We saw that one graph I showed where between seasons, um, the wet season had a lot of total mercury on it because it's a really flashy system and really, you know, chocolate milk rivers of lots of turbidity and, and particulate. And so uh, as they're grazing, they're bringing a lot of that in. And so they have a lot of that non-transferable mercury in their body burden, but it's the methylmercury that's going to transfer to the next food web or the next stage up the trophic ladder. And so by the time you get to like say a large, large mouth bass, it's going to be mostly methylmercury. And that's with, there, there are some larger predator fish that have more total associated with them than methyl. Um, so for many years, it had just been an assumption, oh, just use total analysis for fish. They're finding there's enough differences that it might be worth getting a handle on at least a subset of what the fraction of methyl is because it might not all be there. And, that, and that's the real indicator of what you're, if they had 75% methylmercury and 25% inorganic, from a consumption point of view, you'd only be concerned about this 75%. Maybe one last question back here. Yeah. Uh, the distribution of uh, various sources of mercury, um, if, you, if you're size, I'm pretty interested in that. I just was interested to know. Uh, in the Middle Great Lakes, industrial source was identified as an elevated source. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular industries that are uh, associated with that mercury processing? Or Around the Great Lakes? Or, so a lot of a lot of their source comes from w wastewater treatment plants, you know. So just munis municipal and industrial wastewater treatment plants discharging, and so they've been a really aggressive on their regulations on what kind of um, um, discharge they're allowed to have in their in their discharge to the to the Great Lakes. Um, there's also a lot of coal fired power plant deposition in in those areas. So um, and then. Uh, there, in certain areas, there's a bunch of old um, chloralkali plants. It was big in, in that area, especially moving over towards New York. There's just kind of a hotbed of them. So there's a bunch of old. There's a. I mean, just east East Coast has a lot of these old chemical facilities, and and so there's a, a wide variety of sources. Thank you. If you have more questions for Steve, maybe yeah. catch you at a sure. break or yeah. lunch. Lunch is across the hall, so um, and we're planning to be back here at one. And again, just a reminder that the drawings for the drawer prizes will be later this afternoon uh, before the afternoon break. So we'll see you back at one. Thank you. Jump into the the first afternoon session, which is what's happening in Butte. And up first is Joss Bryson with Atlantic Richfield Company, and he'll be discussing applying nature-based solutions in mine reclamation. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Again, I'm Josh Bryson. I work as a liability manager for Atlantic Richfield Company uh, out of Butte. Uh, thanks to Susie for putting this all together. And uh, I'm happy to see some of my peers in the audience that can answer some of your technical questions. So when I get stuck talking at the 30,000 foot level, I might call on them. So um, 
So we've been working on uh, abandoned mine reclamation in the Butte area for about 40 years. And during that time, we've seen some significant improvements both in water quality and, and the soils too. Uh, we'll talk about how we got to, to where we are today and where we stand with those uh, water quality standards and how we're gonna implement nature-based solutions uh, as a component of the final remedy in, in Butte. Um, Atlantic Ridge Field is a successor in interest to the Anaconda Mining Company, the Anaconda Company. Uh, with that, we uh, you know, took over the assets in addition to, of course, the liabilities. And as I kind of mentioned, we've been doing remedial investigation design and actions in Butte for nearly 40 years, not only in Butte, but through the entire upper Clark Fork River watershed. Uh, here's Bipsu, which is near and dear to my heart, and it kind of encompasses all of Uptown Butte. It covers about 4,200 acres, beginning uh, down at uh, Timber Butte in the, this area, uh, all the way up to about Walkerville. Uh, Butte, of course, is, is built on a steep slope, and all that stormwater reports from the hill straight down to, to Silver Bell Creek. Um, over the course of our work, we've uh, remediated about 600 acres on, across the Butte Hill. We've addressed uh, either through waste in place and capping or by removal about 8 million cubic yards of waste. And we've also ziplined uh, hundreds of feet of storm trunks, repaired uh, dozens of illicit connections, installed four hydrodynamic devices, and uh, my notes are hiding from me, and done about 10,000 linear feet of, of curb and gutter. All that work has resulted in significant improvements to surface water quality, and I put some of those key milestones on here. But over that time, we've seen generally an 89% reduction in the total recoverable copper concentrations in Silver Bell Creek at stream station SSO7. And SSO7 is kind of at the outfall of Butte Party Soils, and it'll also act as one of our compliance points under the new consent decree. We've seen similar results for dissolved water quality, and this isn't near as related to those surface water quality elements or the BMPs that we've implemented, but by control of impacted groundwater. So today we're able to capture and treat about 630 million gallons of impacted water per year prior to clean discharge to, to Silver Bell Creek. Over this time period, we've seen about a 65% reduction in dissolved copper concentrations. And you can see we've now uh, kind of dipped below the, the Montana DEQ7 dissolved copper standard. But when you look at the data set, kind of uh, instead of looking at those annual averages, when you start to look at it a little more granular, you can see that we still do have exceedances of dissolved copper standards. Um, so we know we, we still have a little bit of work to do, not only from you know, surface water quality standards, but also dissolved. Um, right now, we're unable to meet total recoverable copper standards most of the time during wet weather events. So when it rains, we're generally exceeding those standards. And then on occasion, of course, during base flow, we exceed dissolved copper. Um, so Butte, the, the San Francisco of the Rocky Mountains, complete with trolleys and trains, uh, a cosmopolitan city that was hosted dignitaries and once home to more than 90,000 residents. A uh, city that was described as wide open and for, for primarily two reasons or three reasons is open 24 seven, had all the speakeasies so we didn't really much care for uh, prohibition. And of course uh, it was home to the infamous uh, Venus Alley. So, um, and without, uh, you can't talk about Butte today, especially without giving homage to the M&M that just recently burnt down. So, you know, the home of the sack lunches and cigars and, and beers with breakfast, so. So Butte was built upon a, a highly mineri mineralized uh, hill, of course, um, and, and today it still sits right next to an active mine. Um, we have the largest national historic district in the United States, which is, of course, historic by nature. It has uh, lots of aging infrastructure. The TSS load and uh, total recoverable copper and total recoverable zinc loads exceed national standards by approximately six times. And when it rains, that, that rain hits the slopes that, that range in, in steepness from 6% to 12%, and it rushes down the, the Butte Hill and reports to Silver Bell Creek. And then Silver Bell Creek, its flow is con mostly made out of uh, flow contributed by Blacktail Creek which just recently was uh, flown at about two CFS. Uh, so it's an extremely small receiving stream. So we get these really heavy loads rushing down the hill, impacting the receiving stream, and we're unable to meet those water quality standards at our, our compliance point. It's compounded even more so that Blacktail Creek upstream of our operable unit, it always exceeds total recoverable loads and dissolved loads often. So we, we didn't get the benefit of uh, reducing 
necessarily before until we got the consent decree. Now we get to account for those those opportunities. Uh, right now, I think our polishing plant up in Butte Mine flooding was discharging about seven CFS. So seven CFS in Silver Bow Creek right now is, if you want to call it artificial flow versus those two CFS of, of base flow from Blacktail Creek. Um, enter the consent decree. So we know we got a lot of work to do um, and, and we just got there with this agreement uh, by the four primary stakeholders, EPA, DEQ, Butte Silver Bow County and Atlantic Richfield Company. That was lodged by the, the US Federal District Court in November of 2020. And that work described in the consent decree will provide for reclamation of an additional 180 acres across the Butte Hill in what we call unreclaimed and insufficiently reclaimed sites. Um, we'll evaluate 13 additional uncaptured sub drainages in Butte Hill. Uh, and if necessary, we'll install low impact uh, developments or BMPs at those locations to manage stormwater. Uh, we'll evaluate the Copper Mountain Sports Park and the, the Clark Tailings Repository up there and see why we're having groundwater issues. Um, we'll optimize our existing groundwater system, the one that currently captures 630 million uh, gallons per year in tree set. We'll, we'll take a look at it for uh, O&M optimization purposes. We'll expand our hydraulic controls so that that groundwater system right now will be expanded to better protect Silver Bow and Blacktail Creeks. And we'll also install four primary uh, uh, stormwater basins at the base of the Butte Hill. And then that's kind of what we're going to focus on with the nature-based solutions. So the consent decree, I think it was over 1,100 pages, and, and uh, some people claim to have read some of, all of it. I've read some of it and know a little bit of it. Um, to, to roll that information out, we kind of got in, engaged in a very active, aggressive community engagement process where we hosted over 30 different meetings to, to communicate with the public, to educate them of what was in the consent decree and, and how that related to what would, was going to be in, done in Butte and what the, the, the project would look like. Uh, seven of those meetings were specific to that, just that. You know, what will this project look like? Is it going to be, you know, very, very uh, uh, rectangular stormwater basins that are going to be lined? Are they going to be more naturalized ponds? Uh, is it going to be public, publicly accessible? Are they going to be fences? So through that entire process, we're able to integrate, you know, feedback from the community and come up with a plan that we thought not only met our remediation needs, but also met the, the needs of the inland user. And this is generally what, what we came up with. It's uh, all total, it's about 160 acre uh, parkway, a green space in the center of Butte. Um, has over eight miles of trails, uh, has the stormwater basins integrated into it, provides for education and cultural opportunities, in addition to, you know, hopefully providing some, some beneficial socioeconomic impacts. Um, we designed it in such a way that we thought that the uh, the interface between what was remedy, what was required by the consent decree, and the additional that was obtained through the negotiation, what's the, the kind of icing on the cake, to where that interface is very delicate and, and generally unnoticeable. So here's one of the basins at, at Buffalo Gulch, and this basin decides to treat the 10-year, 24-hour SES type 1 storm event. This basin itself is, will hold about 20 acre feet and uh, we'll act uh, uh, to treat all the outflow from, from one single, buff the single Buffalo Gulch sub drainage up on the Butte Hill. Um, so how it works is, of course, water flows in kind of through this four bay where we expect to settle out all this, most of the solids. Then we'll go directional bore underneath the railroad line to the first of a series of four permanent pools where we'll have additional settling and on down the circuit until we finally discharge to Silver Bow Creek. Um, this is showing like a, the base flow condition or where we just have our 30% pools full, but when it fills up, generally, you know, this entire area will be inundated with stormwater during the 10-year event. The design team, um, which Scott, Scott's here and, and, and Devin are here too, kind of planned this to, to look at the 90th percentile design storm. So we didn't want to design a system that would only treat and function and look good during the one, one event every 10 years. We wanted to make sure that the channels were designed, the permanent pools and the, the banks were designed in a way that would, would function uh, from an engineering perspective, water quality perspective, but also from an aesthetic perspective. So what the team did is really evaluate the 90th percentile design storm to determine what those inundation zones would be. So we can saturate our, our wetland species and our fringe species and kind of maximize the, the interaction between the, the surface water, impact of surface water and the vegetation for phytoremediation benefit. Uh, 
um, you can see that the, the basins themselves are quite effective in knocking out that, that peak flow. So here's the hydrograph. And you can buy the, all four by basins combined, the one at Buffalo Gulch, Grove Gulch, Northside Tailings, and the one at Diggins East, we're able to knock 120 CFS off those peak storms. So that results in capture of sediments that would uh, be going to the streams, retention of those, and being able to clean those out uh, from the four bays during our own M cycle. Um, total, we're capturing approximately 5,000 acres and treating those within our, our, these basins, these four basins plus the 13 subdrainages I spoke of. So that, that's an area quite larger than Bipsu, and it even encompasses properties out towards Beef Trail Road south of town. Um, all total, we have about 50 acre feet of stormwater storage capacity, and about 30% of that is dedicated to this, these retention pools. And these retention pools are meant to provide not only water quality benefit by providing extended retention periods of 30% of the total volume, but also they serve a kind of a, an aesthetic purpose or meet our balancing criteria. So with these pools, we'll be able to maintain that nice wetland fringe to keep it green and saturated even throughout the summer months. Uh, it's a nice visual uh, uh, benefit to the sites, and it also provides a water source for our recirculating, recirculated water features. So typical of uh, some landscape designs, but maybe not naturally, we're trying to integrate you know, small, I wouldn't call them mountainous channels, but small rivulets and, and little cascades. So you'd only have the visual effect, but also the audible benefit of listening to those in the community. Um, so by doing all this and, and taking more of a, a, a nature-based solution approach versus kind of a, what do I call a geometric kind of line system, really focusing on, on you know, maximizing you know, the, the cost-benefit analysis or, or using materials that were even more easily maintained, uh, we were able to, to kind of find some ecosystem services out, the, out of this that result in you know, multiple uh, overall net positive impact on, on across uh, different uh, measurements, uh, such as ecology. So right now we have about seven ecotypes across the project areas and about 51% of those areas are t uh, right now um, blighted or, or impacted by historic mining contamination. When we're done, we hope to have about 11 ecotypes across the project area. Uh, none of those comprising more than 20% of the total land space. We'll also uh, plant native species, which will foster habitat. 82% of the total spaces will be uh, reseeded with native species. And the, the, the balance of the area will be available for public use. So things like uh, hardscapes, playgrounds, and of course, parking lots to furnish those, uh, walking trails, things like that. Um, We've designed our interpretive signs to be placed at heights, uh, so it's not only you know, uh, ergonomically correct for, for a standing adult, but also for, for a child and even somebody in a wheelchair. And the team's even gone so far as to think about the, the color palette. So if somebody that was colorblind were to be looking at our wayfinding signage, they'd be able to interpret it due to the contrast of the colors that we selected. Uh, fire remediation and carbon sequestration. Um, we found that we can increase carbon sequestration by 35% and stormwater capture by 84% simply by varying the size of the trees when we plant them initially. Uh, once those trees have aged 24 years, or 20 years, excuse me. By the time those same trees have reached 50 years of age, they'll have captured 53 million gallons of impacted stormwater and sequestered nearly 2 million pounds of carbon. Uh, right now our team is doing a logistics analysis and through that study, we've determined we can capture or, or offset carbon uh, impact by about 2,800 equivalent tons of carbon dioxide and also save about 500,000 miles traveled uh, with our haul trucks. Uh, biodiversity, uh, water management, our irrigation systems, instead of being typical like the irrigation system in my house that's set up on a timer, this will be based on moisture sensors in the soil. So those irrigation systems will only come on when, when they're, they're triggered to based on moisture content. Um, our team's even conducted a, a bloom analysis so we can sequence our plantings and select our species so that we have a healthy bloom in the spring, summer, and fall to, to help our pollinator species. Um, we're even, uh, as part of negotiations, we've agreed to construct a fishing pond at Northside Tailings. Uh, it'll be a little bit over one acre in size, about 19 feet deep, and, and we hope to work with uh, Butte Silver Bow and Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to, to stock uh, native cutthroat trout. Uh, sustainable practices. Um, we've been able to salvage about 100,000 cubic yards from a recently completed MDT project uh, uh, by completing an access agreement, agreement allowing them to stage their, their burden materials 
on our property, we in return got that 100,000 million, 100,000 cubic yards of material that we can use for general fill or structural fill. Uh, by using the leapfrog model at the Butte Reduction, or excuse me, the Diggings East site, we hope to salvage another 90,000 cubic yards of material that can be characterized as clean fill material for backfill. Um, from residential and commercial development projects, both in Silver Bow County and Gallatin County, we've been able to acquire about 50,000 cubic yards of topsoil. Uh, and the stuff from out of Gallatin County, of course, has a pretty high organic matter content, uh, exceptionally high compared to what we can find in Silver Bow County. Many of the materials that, that we'll specify will be uh, sustainable. Um, so whether that be wood products or bamboo or, and hopefully most of the products we get, you know, other than the bamboo, we can hopefully get from local, local vendors. Um, the Silver Bowl Creek Conservation Area begins a new script for a community beyond Superfund. And this is one of the things we kept on hearing, you know, what is the impact to socioeconomics? What about, how's it gonna impact me as an individual or a town as a community and, and can it drive any economic improvements in town so um, in general uh, the answer is, is yes uh, we hope um, economically speaking uh, this park space uh, requires no initial investment from the county whatsoever it's all being paid for by atlantic richfield company um, so when you think about a typical park that's built somewhere is they usually use bonding and any revenue generated through tax or property tax increase would go to offset that bond. In this case, there's no bond. So all, every dollar produced is a dollar that can be reinvested in the community. Um, these spaces have been shown to, to be able to retain retirees. So the impact of 100 retirees in a community is equivalent to about uh, uh, an annual investment of a new business of about $4 million. Let's see if I can find my mouse. No. Lost my notes. Um, they also provide for, for you know, health and wellness benefits. So there's intrinsic health benefits by being uh, adjacent to nature. Um, uh, the, one of the studies I reviewed showed that you know, uh, kids that are able to, to be creative in a park space, you know, generate a bond with that space so it minimizes future vandalism and acts of violence within the community. Um, eight miles of trails, like I mentioned, we expect to see positive impact to you know, see people out walking the trails, which results in better well-being better you know, underlying health condition and reduce obesity rates. Um, prior to the consent decree, one of the potential solutions to managing the stormwater was construction of a modern water treatment plant. So utilizing mechanized or chemical-based treatment solutions in the center of our town. Um, and thinking back on it, I think uh, what we came up with here was a much better alternative because what would it have looked like if we would have had a, a massive water treatment facility in the center of town that would have had to treat stormwater, which is extremely flashy to begin with. Um, and what value would have that provided to the community versus what we're doing here, where we have benefits to biodiversity, sustainability, and socioeconomics. By, by applying nature-based solutions, we expect to see a net positive impact across many different standards. So um, whether that be your health and wellness, uh, wildlife, uh, recreation, or socioeconomics, we think all those things will happen. Little uh, tip of the hat to the team. Uh, Woodard and Curran Trek is here and they've been working mostly on the stormwater modeling. We've got a few folks from Pioneer that have been working on a lot of the civil designs and a couple of the project sites. And of course, Land Design Incorporated out of Billings helps us out with all these, these awesome graphics. Um, it's the first project in the world to be pre-certified uh, uh, or in the United States be pre-certified -pre gold uh, or higher. Uh, and of course, the first Superfund site in the United States be pre-certified either post, pre or post construction. Thank you. Any questions? Ah, sorry. I've got a question on one, on one of your slides that had a, a reclamation or using recycled materials and one of the things you had was like old head frames turned into park benches. And one of the things was uh, mine or tailings water, and then it turned into something. What did it turn into? Mine or tailings water? What did it turn into? Yeah. I and on one of the slides, it just showed it what a, a, another material reused. 
I'm not I'm not certain exactly what you're referring to. So the, the storm water will come out the Butte Hill, be treated in the ponds, and will be discharged clean, close to meeting standards, and, and so we'll create. We suspect that the total load will be reduced. Uh, suspended sediment load will be reduced by up to 80% in the four bays. And then we hope to see you know, up to 30% reduction in dissolved contaminants constituents before being discharged in Silver Bow Creek. But we're not proposing to reuse uh, contaminated water for any purpose on this project. They will be reused for recycling the, the water features uh, for, for kind, of, kind of that audible and visual effect. But beyond that, there's no intended reuse. Okay. I think it was the, uh, the water features is what I saw then. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? this design consider some of the climate change concerns that, that may be uh, showing up in your uh, Climate change concerns. Uh, so the parent company uh, uh, I am employed by, I represent at Lankers Field, the parent company I'm employed by, BP, we have a, a global climate model and we project it out 50 years. So some of our specialists in our RET group, they, they came in, what they told us is that we're going to see less frequent storms, but much more intense. So it's not necessarily that the volume of the total storms being contained is going to increase. It's just that they're going to be fewer and far between and much more intense. So we're trying to accommodate that within this and provide enough freeboard or additional sediment storage to accommodate those future events. But beyond 50 years, we haven't done any analysis. More questions? Thank you. Okay. Next, we've got Growing Trees in Butte Underground with Scott Rosenthal from Montana Technological University. Thanks, Dan. Good afternoon. Dim lights in the corner. Got to make sure nobody falls asleep, right? Uh, we have had a name change. I don't know if everybody's heard. We are Montana Technological University. Some say we had a divorce. We're no longer Montana Tech of the University of Montana. Back when I was there, it was Montana College of Mineral Science and Technology, and we started 121 years ago as Montana School of Mines. But we're still Montana Tech. We're still maintaining the branding as best we can. So a plug all of what I'm going to talk about was led by Paul Conrad. He has a day job, and school started this week. Uh, I usually have a day job, but I'm on sabbatical, so I'm taking the opportunity to do things like this. And then he's had two uh, graduate students, Cosmos Apukuwer and Francis Income, who uh, will look at what they did to grow trees here in, in Butte underground. There's another picture of Butte like we just saw. We're over here on the west side at Montana Tech. And the area we're looking at is on the west side of, of Montana Tech, just a long bluebird trail at the end of Park Street. Little history, in 2010, Montana Tech was gifted 65 acres from Atlantic Richfield, which included the Orphan Boy Mine, which is a historic lead zinc silver producer from about 1890s to 1956. We're about 700 feet north of the Orphan Girl Mine, or the World Museum of Mining. 2012, we began the de decline. That's our, our first blast. Um, it was normally run at 10 foot by 10 foot at 15% grade. Uh, this work was done by contractors and 700 feet was completed in 700 months till we, whoops, wrong button there, broke into the uh, orphan boy shaft at 100 feet below surface. Since uh, 2013, this, this lab has also been used for classes, uh, or this facility has been used for classes, labs, and research. We, we run a practical underground mining class every semester down there. We use it for geomechanics, ventilation, survey labs. Um, geologic engineering uses it for uh, mapping and weathering of rocks underground. Um, mining, geological, geophysical engineering, plus OCK Health and Safety have, have been doing student research at both undergraduate and graduate levels. We are connected to the Orphan Girl Mine at the 100-foot level. We use this to support the Orphan Girl uh, 
and, and the World Museum of Mining. It also provides us uh, two additional emergency access and egress points. So we've actually got four ways in and out of the mine if we need it. Whoops. A little more history. The facility is not funded by the state. None of our, our academic funds go to this facility, so we rely on industry partners. Stillwater has donated us a, a mucker underground load haul dump unit. Uh, we have a shop relocated, one of the EPA 50 by 120 steel buildings from the, the um, pole plant was relocated for us. Golden Sunlight donated a dry when they closed, so now we have change facilities for our students, so the students can actually change on site. They don't have to wear dirty, nasty clothes on their way home. Uh, JS Redpath donated a whole bunch of bolts, mesh, other operating materials that we need. And then Mindsight Technologies has actually provided us with Wi-Fi, so we have Wi-Fi underground, which is kind of cool, but we do have to put a password in so the kids aren't down there on Facebook and God knows what else. As you can imagine, a student takes a picture and there's somebody without the safety glasses and we hear about it immediately. So try to limit that, <laughs> passwords. So our facility, here's the portal. We come down 15% to the orphan boy's shaft. From there, it's level all the way over to the orphan girl. Um, we've got an underground compressor, secondary escape and ventilations off the orphan boy's shaft, and then the area we're looking at is our greenhouse, which is over here. These side workings were all developed by students as part of that practical underground mining class. There are some historical workings up here in yellow that were left over from the Anaconda Company. Some areas that we've broken into up here, this area here is intact. So you can go down and look at the nice timber um, sets that they had for support and other areas have just collapsed. So pickling of the timber had varying qualities. But we're going to talk about focus on the greenhouse. That's our entrance to the greenhouse. Remember we're a school of higher education. We're not flash and flush of money. So we do things that work, practical solutions. And there's our greenhouse. Originally this was about a 10 by 10 uh, drift run underground, and then we slabbed off one side to give us about 18 feet wide room. So not very big, but big enough for us. The nice part is it's year round. If it's 100 degrees outside, it's 48 degrees underground. If it's 40 below outside, it's 48 degrees underground. So we have a constant temperature. We don't have to add any supplemental heat. So, and it's insulated from those extreme storm events we just heard about are snow. We do have to add grow lights. And that's how we control daylight under there. So there's our grow light bank right on top. It's not the first time trees have been grown in Butte. At the Kelly mine in the 70s, uh, it was reportedly over 10,000 tree seedlings were produced at the Kelly. I also know that at the Bunker Hill mine, they had an underground greenhouse and in Val d'Or, Canada, just to name a couple others. So it's nothing new, but it's something revisited here in Butte. So what we proposed for the research was that BIPSU, acronym, Butte Priority Soils Operability Unit. Uh, we wanted to help restore tree growth here in Butte. The trees that we were focusing on, we think are native to Butte, quaking aspen, dug fir, uh, Eastern Mountain Ash, Canada Red Choke Cherry, Western Mountain Ash. So there's the Bipsu again. So what we wanted to do is collect some soil samples from the different areas across Butte, get some seeds that are native to Butte, pre-treat those, prime them for germination, plant those soil seeds in the soils that we gathered, and nurse the, the seeds to maturity. Then try to harden the seeds in semi-sultered environment, AKA move them from the underground to a surface greenhouse uh, before we plant them, then plant the seeds on, on selected sites where we collected the soils. So we also wanted to perform control. So we, at the same time we planted seeds for the underground, we planted seeds in our surface greenhouse at, at Tech, and that provides a control set. 
something that we can compare success rates against. There's our five sample points up here, and then referring to the second set of uh, research was the Clark Mill site where we actually did get to plant some seeds. We'll come back to that in a little bit. So first, we planted seeds. We just gathered the soil, planted some seeds, watered them, nothing grew. What we figured out is most likely it's because we didn't do any sort of pretreatment to those, those soils we collected. So we had a lot of big chunks and very few finds. So the next lot of seeds, we actually did some uh, mixed peat moss and vermiculite, placed those in cheesecloth, got those to, to sprout, and then transferred those into to pots. And then as the trees got bigger, we'd move them to larger pots. So on the second go, we had success. So this is our greenhouse full of nice little trees, close up of some of the trees here. Um, and then against our control, we had fairly good survival rates. So the blue is the uh, underground greenhouse, the orange on the right is the surface greenhouse. Uh, sample two had very poor survival of anything. And we're pretty sure on, on looking back at that, that was a very uh, low pH soil sample that we had. So we didn't get our pretreatments correct there, but overall fairly good. Um, potting mix is a, the one that stands out that beat us at least in the surface greenhouse. So things were going along well until we had the groundwater rise. A couple of the groundwater in the orphan boy and orphan girl tend to mirror our snowfall about 18 months later. So when we get a good snowfall year, pretty soon the water rises. And in 2018, it rose about two feet above the 100 level. So we had uh, we basically floated our greenhouse out the portal door, unfortunately, and that then killed all the nice trees we saw oops, in that picture. So unfortunately, the floods got us. So we thought, well, we'll try it again. And because of the flood, we did this second round of research just on the surface using a surface greenhouse. Again, we collected the samples from the same five sample locations um, using uh, seeds native. Um, we wanted to monitor those, harden the seedlings, and then actually plant those at the, at the Clark Mill site. So we planted those in October. We pre-treated them, grew them in the greenhouse, and then planted those on the Clark Mill site in October of 18, and then observed them in 2019, in the spring. Our survival rates, uh, we had 19 aspens, four survived, about 21% sagebrush, uh, 19, we had a 95% survival there, shrubby potentilla, 88%, and choke cherry about 71%. Before anybody asked the question about why did we plant sagebrush, we also do some support for our friends in Wyoming and they like to grow sagebrush as part of their reclamation. So we were trying to see if we could be successful at growing sagebrush because it's not really on the list of native trees to butte. There's our shrubby potentilla and planted out at the Clark Mill site. Future work. Because of the, the presentations we've made at uh, Society of Mining Engineers, um, all of our works on the digital commons in Montana Tech, some folks in South Africa looked us up and we're actually working with Inzufect uh, on a climate cha change low tech method solution beyond 2050s. And it's supporting Sabanye Stillwater's South African operations with trying to plant trees on their uh, rehabilitation sites. So the intention is that Stillwater Sabanya would build their own greenhouse underground in South Africa and then replicate in reverse what we've done. So we have a proven methodology, have known control of the surface greenhouse. We want to start again this fall, trying to grow trees underground with the hope that by next spring, we'd be able to uh, be planting those out on some sites and monitoring those. Questions? In the back. Yeah, just a couple questions. On, on your first set, you mentioned your control in the, in the uh, above ground. Did you use the 
same soils then in that control? So you control for soils as well? Yes. And then what did you do for, for uh, did you do a temperature control at all? I mean, because it was constant temperature underground. Um, did you do any kind of control for temperature? And if not, did you find a greater germination rate above ground than you did? Uh, all the all the seeds were generated basically in the lab downstairs in our building, and then divided up between the surface and the uh, underground greenhouses. So the germination was was controlled. The soils in both samples were the same. Um, the control of the surface greenhouse, I do not know that answer. What's the advantage to growing them underground versus uh, starting them underground versus? Surface. The nice part is if we if we get a germinated and planted say now, our trees could be up to twice as high as if we have to wait till say planting in in March. So that by if we plant them say in the fall, we should have a, a hardier, larger tree, and then hopefully its chance of survival through the winter is much greater. Got a trick question nobody asked. Are these trees still alive at the Clark Mill site? No, because the vandals came in and plucked all our little red flags and then took all of our plants. So somebody didn't want us to demonstrate success, I guess, unfortunately. So hopefully on the next time when we do plant some trees, we've got a little better control. <laughs> Next time, maybe we won't put flags out. We'll just survey them in so we know where they're at and don't advertise that they're transplants. More dogs. More dogs. <laughs> what do you attribute the low success rate to quaking aspens versus the others? We were actually quite happy with our success rate on aspens. Um, I can't tell you the benchmark we looked at. It, it's lower than the other species, but we thought it was pretty good compared to some other research. Oh, sorry, way over. Do you have plans for the underground flooding? Do you foresee that happening again? And do you have a plan to control that? Uh, we pump. Yeah. Yes, so we, we do monitor it, and now we, we pump and discharge to maintain that level a little bit below us. Do you anticipate uh, looking at either pine, spruce, other things that are more comparable to higher elevations in Butte uh, to try and grow, or what's for the future, I guess? We're open to try anything except those little funny green plants you find at the dispensary. <laughs> So initially we focused on just trees native to Butte, but um, I guess that's part of why I'm here is, is we could experiment and play with just about anything because we've got a, a concept that's proven and it works and be worth trying other species. We can do sunflowers. <laughs> yes, yes. And cannabis, no. Yeah. And, and hemp, I suppose we could as well, but. What do you attribute your high uh, success rate on the sagebrush to? Because those were started from seeds, correct? Yes, they were started from seeds. Yeah. Uh, I'd say dumb luck, but we've done it once again. <laughs> so we're trying to share that with our friends in Wyoming who have to grow the. Yeah, because they've had terrible luck with seeds. Yeah. No, we've had good luck. Um, we haven't had a, we sent a few um, plants over to them, and we haven't got a report back recently how those are surviving, if the transplanting worked or not. But we hope to. I was just wondering, uh, has anyone ever thought about using plants to improve your quality lines? Instead of having just pure rocks? Maybe not 
I don't know if anybody has looked at using plants underground for improving the air quality. Thank you. Thank you. Again, just one quick reminder for those uh, attending virtually, if you have any questions, please continue to type those into the chat. So up next is Jim Jonas with Copper. He'll be discussing a geochemical investigation of a metals contaminated alluvial aquifer in Butte. Thank you. So what I wanted to talk about today was what we looked at almost 10 years ago. And this is really an investigation of that alluvial aquifer between the Parrot tailings and Silver Bow Creek that has been discussed previously. It took probably well over a year of discussion with input from all the different groups involved with this project to get to a plan that I'm going to show and, and really just hit the highlights here. Trying to do the investigation took probably well over a year and at least a year of analyzing the results. And overall, what we were interested in doing was what you would do in other alluvial investigations where you're interested in attenuation. We're trying to identify those mechanisms. We're trying to calculate the strength of those mechanisms. And ultimately trying to estimate what that longevity of the attenuation is going to be. There's a couple pieces that we had to be uh, really cognizant about when we were doing this investigation. One of them was looking at the anoxic conditions. We knew that there was very low dissolved oxygen in the setting. We had thought that the primary mechanism was going to be iron co-precipitation with these metals. Well, iron is sensitive to that anoxic condition. So we wanted to make sure that all of our sediment that was collected was maintained under anoxic conditions. That meant from the time that it came out of the drill hole, it was under argon through all of the investigation. Made it very challenging and lots of time spent working in a glove box. And it also created some problems with the results that I'll explain a little bit later. So thinking about this alluvial aquifer, you have to go all the way back to when these tailings were placed in there. And this is a map of 1904, showing three key pieces here to help give you reference. Where the Parrot Smelter is, where the KOA is located on Blacktail Creek, and where the two creeks uh, meet together in the Slide Canyon area. Another piece that's important as a reference is this bedrock alluvium contact with thinner alluvium being closer towards the Berkeley pit, towards the uh, north of Parrot Smelter. And getting thicker as you more approach KOA and move away from that bedrock alluvium contact. In the 1950s, you can still see the town growing up around this area, but tailing still exposed at the surface. And more present day, now you can see where the Berkeley Pit is, and again, where those locations are. Now, the area we focused on is in between Harrison Avenue and Caw Avenue, mostly. And the locations where we collected these anoxic core samples are indicated with those pluses. So I'll, I'll kind of show these different uh, wells and the core samples moving from upgrading to downgradient. Now, with the analysis, we tried to do this in a phased approach because we knew what, by the time we got down to our phase four, our column study, we would only have the ability to really look at a handful of samples. But on the bulk side with the XRF out in the field looking at core, we got hundreds of measurements. And the idea was trying to, trying to figure out what should we move forward with, uh, what samples should we move forward with moving from the bulk properties to the mineralogy, from the mineralogy to the adsorption desorption study. With that first phase, the bulk properties, we were focused on total metals. And the big question is we could get out there and get a lot of XRF measurements. We couldn't send as many into the lab for ICP analysis, both looking at 
total composition, total metals within the sample. So the question is, how good are those XRF measurements compared to the ICP measurements? Uh, and really, this comes down to how the measurement is done. With an ICP, we're doing a total digest. So we're seeing the metals throughout all the rocks. Whereas with the XRF, you're only seeing really what's uh, coming back as a response from that X-ray that's going into the near surface of that sediment coming back up. What we saw was that the correlation between what was in the ICP and the XRF, the XRF always had more metals than the ICP. Why might that be? And we saw that with zinc, we saw that with copper. That could mean that what we're seeing is this surface phenomenon, that the metals are adsorbed to that surface or near that surface. We saw it similarly with iron and uh, even more so with manganese. Now, our initial thought, conception of how this system worked was that iron was co-precipitating those metals. So do we see correlation between the XRF, iron and copper, iron and zinc? Not really. So this was kind of that first question as to, okay, if it's not following what we thought it was with that co-precipitation of iron and zinc, what other property of this material could it be following? What we started to see, especially with zinc, was higher zinc concentrations with the XRF measurement associated with some silts and clays. We didn't expect this. Now we know that silts and clays, they have absorption sites, there's a lot of surface area. But we didn't think that that was going to be a primary mechanism moving forward. So hold that thought because we'll get back to that. Now the other piece when looking down gradient following uh, those different wells from the parrot tailings towards the creek. Piece to keep in mind was looking at the lithologic log in association with that XRF metals. We start, start to see these trends emerge at discrete locations within that depth interval that was measured. Where we saw these silts and clays bind, bounding these uh, more sands and gravels, those silts and clays adjacent to that sand and gravel tended to have higher concentrations of copper and zinc than the sands and gravels. So we, we saw this not only close to the parrot, but we started to see these trends uh, as you went down gradient as well towards creek where those silts and clays have higher concentrations than the adjacent sands and gravels. It was less evident as we got closer to the creek, but nonetheless it was there and this helped us with thinking about how to move forward. So we got to the end of phase one and what did we really come walk away with? We knew that the XRF was going to be bias high, that it was probably really focused on what was near that surface. So if we wanted an overall concentration, we needed to stay with the ICP, but the XRF might have helped us understand that this does tend to be a surface phenomenon. We also found that that copper and zinc concentration, it didn't really correlate well with iron. So uh, that mechanism may not be as important as we initially thought. And that really that copper and zinc was associated with those fine grade sediments that are adjacent to those flow zones. So moving into phase two, what did we try to analyze, we were, we were looking at what you typically look at, acid base accounting. We were looking at the X-ray diffraction to get at the mineralogy. We went a step further and went down to the microscopic level and we're doing some electron microprobe analysis and some sequential extraction. I'm, I just got time to talk about the first three today, so we'll just kind of skip through, uh, skip over the sequential extraction at this point. So with acid base accounting, now we weren't really interested in your typical acid-based accounting. Is there going to be more acid produced than neutralizing potential? What we were interested in mostly was what form that sulfur was present in. Was it there as sulfate? Was it there as sulfide? And the neutralization potential, could some neutralization potential, how much, had been consumed by that acid water moving through this alluvial aquifer for probably a uh, hundred years or so. With the total sulfur, what we saw is kind of what you expected, at least when you're closer to the source, we had a lot of sulfate in that aquifer. We had a lot of sulfate associated with those sediments as sulfate, either as soluble or sulfate, solu uh, sulfate sulfur. Not really a whole uh, a lot of sulfide sulfur, except for maybe a sample here or two. That, that one that sticks out closer to the creek on the bottom there is 
likely influenced by or lots of organic matter that was in that sample. We look at the neutralization potential. There was slightly less as you were getting closer towards that source. Uh, but you know, this is this is variable. It, it, could you see a trend there? Possibly. I, I think the point was that the neutralization potential as measured by the ABA wasn't completely gone. So moving on to X-ray diffraction, you know, again we're looking at kind of a bulk where you take a, a full sample bulk in comparison to looking at the electron microprobe, which I'll describe next. And we're interested in what minerals are present in that sample. And we even did some clay mineralogy as well because we started to see that there may be this association between zinc and clays. And what we compare it to is the host rock, the Butte Quartz Monzonite. And what we see with feldspars are that all of the samples had a lower abundance of feldspar compared to the Butte Quartz Monzonite. Feldspar tends to weather, tends to weather to clays. That was expected. Quartz. Quartz tends to be more abundant. It's slower to weather, so you would expect to see more of that transported and uh, not chemically weathered to the extent that, um, that you would see other minerals, such as hornblende and amphibole, which uh, weathers relatively quickly. And you can see we're near detection limit on most of those samples. With the clay abundance, we saw mostly montmorillonite and illites. So uh, uh, interlayered clay with some interstitial area for absorption, ion exchange is what you typically see there. Now it, it differed a little bit depending on where you were in the aquifer, whether you're close to the site, it seemed to be more of a smectite type of clay, whereas it was more dominated by montmorillonite further down. And you know that was important when we moved to the next step to try to understand uh, how that zinc might be associated with those clay minerals. So we took a few subsets of samples, very small amounts of samples from these aquifers to look at under the electron microprobe. Now, there's a couple of things that we couldn't do. We were trying to keep samples anoxic. We know we couldn't keep them anoxic underneath this uh, type of, of setting to try to get that sample ready. We had a very small, I mean, we're talking about looking at individual grains uh, is that representative? Maybe not. The other thing we can't tell with the electron microprobe, so we really can't tell how those minerals were precipitated. We know they're there. We can see them. We can't get the specific mineralogy, but we can tell the elemental composition. And if it's a carbonate type phase, well, we can't see carbon in the electron microprobe because we have to can't coat the sample with uh, carbon to analyze it. We also can't see speciation, which could be important with iron phases and that co-precipitation. So what did we see? The first phase I'll look at here is a, is a manganese phase. And this is representing a primary mineral that is within the ore body, rhodochrosite, is what we expect here. We see rhodochrosite with smithsite, so that's where we see this association of manganese and zinc in this inclusion of a feldspar. You can see there's a little bit of copper in there, but it's not all that dominant. This is something that we didn't expect to see. We saw these manganese coatings and cements between grains. And the interesting part about this was really that copper content, uh, you know, upwards of 16%. We didn't expect this relationship, and it's clearly a secondary precipitate. But like I said earlier, can we tell when it was formed? Was it, has it formed in the last 100 years? I couldn't, couldn't tell you that based on this information. Now we look at the iron phases, and what we saw on the primary iron phases isn't all that surprising. We see some hematite. We see what looks like a pyrite grain that may have been converted to an, an oxide phase. And we see that pyrite grain coated with secondary iron precipitates with some copper and zinc associated with it. When we look at secondary precipitates with iron, again, we do still see that copper and zinc as we anticipated, but that copper concentration isn't anywhere nearly as high as what we saw with that manganese secondary precipitate phase. And then we get to zinc, and this was probably the, 
the most surprise we had in this, in this study was the amount of zinc in these clays. It was approaching almost 20% on an elemental weight basis, which is way more than you could expect from just absorption or ion exchange on this. So there was definitely this strong relationship between zinc and the clays. So overall, with that second phase of the mineralogy, what did we find? Well, sulfur is mostly present as sulfate. We really didn't have much sulfide present. There was some neutralization potential. That copper was associated with the manganese precipitate and zinc was with phyllosilicates. So we took those steps, uh, took those samples and took them a step further into the next study, which was the batch study. Now the batch study, we mixed different ratios of sediment with water. We did both uh, contaminated sediment with clean water and uh, contaminated water with clean sediment. We did them at uh, probably five different ratios and we collected samples at a day, seven days, two weeks, and after a month. Oh, the unexpected result of having an inert atmosphere over these samples was that we lost carbon dioxide. We lost the alkalinity from the sample into the water or into the, the atmosphere, that argon atmosphere. Well, what impact did that have? Well, it changed our pH. So after a day, we were in that range close to what was representative of the aquifer, roughly six or so in some of these samples. But you can see over time, because of that loss of CO2, that pH shifted upwards, almost a full pH unit in, in all of our samples. So when we look at the batch resorption results as a whole, we have to take into account what does that pH change do to our sample and our results. In the upper, uh, I don't know if you guys can see, the upper, this side here, this upper uh, right, you can see the control sample didn't lose much zinc in this sample. This was a silt clay sample. And you saw that zinc over time did decrease in all of the uh, sediment to water ratios. And most importantly, I think out of all this study is this chart on the side that kind of represents what's in solution versus what's on the sediment or attenuated. And what we saw over time was that it shifted from what looks more like a absorption curve where you have small amounts absorbing um, and depending on the solution concentration, you get more, but you tend to reach a maximum to what happened in 28 days, which tends to be more of a straight vertical line. And a straight vertical line represents some kind of a solubility control, so a precipitation. And you can see even at 28 days, you know, did, did it, is it still absorption but getting deeper into that sediment? We can't quite tell. We didn't run the experiments quite long enough to tell whether or not this was just changing that maximum absorption capacity and that zinc particle or zinc ion was getting deeper into the, the clays or whether or not it truly was making it a new clay as that zinc's phyllosilicate. So we, we, uh, we had to leave it at that and just know that after all of this, the importance that clay plays with zinc attenuation and release. So with our column study, we really could only get down to six samples. And we had these columns constructed of glass. Again, everything was done in an internet environment. We collected water, kept it underneath a glove box. These were all sealed. We kept all of our water that came off the column on, in another glove box. And with these six columns, we did two adsorptions. So with sand only. And in this case, we did uh, sediment with low metals and water with high metals and acid. So we're trying to see what we can force on there. And that acidity also played a role. And I'll, I'll explain this in the next slide. And we did four desorption columns. And one of those desorption columns, we decided that we wanted to put in little nuggets of silt and clay because we expected that that might have an importance with respect to zinc and uh, how long it would take to desorb that zinc or flush that zinc out of that silt and clay compared to just the sand and gravel. We tried to pump that water through those columns as slow as possible. We were trying to reach equilibrium and as much as possible, although that's, that's difficult 
to completely mimic what's happening in the groundwater. Uh, but we also then tried to use a tracer test to understand how much pore volumes went through that column over time. So hopefully then we could relate it back in a meaningful way to what we have in the field when we start talking about flow, uh, flow pass and flow rates. So with the results, we, we tried to track this in a mass balance point of view. And this is one of the attenuation columns or the adsorption columns. And what you can see is up to about 15 to 20 pore volumes, we saw retention. We saw retention of copper, cadmium, and zinc is what's shown on this chart. After about 20 pore volumes, that neutralization potential that was readily available was consumed. And we started to see the pH start to rise again, that acidity breakthrough. With copper, what we saw was after about 30 pore volumes, we had flushed back out the same amount of mass that we put on, and it kept going. <laughs> you know, you think about this, and it, it makes sense now, uh, thinking about the Butte Hill, we're at a copper ore body. We put acidic water on material from that copper ore body. We're going to get out more copper. But it does show that how much copper is available, quite a bit more than, than what we um, had put on there. Cadmium, after about 100 pore volumes, what we put on or loaded on the column was flushed out. With zinc, even after 100 pore volumes, we still didn't get back all out. There was still about two thirds of it attenuated on that column. And when we looked at all six columns, we saw the same response with the two columns that were doing the adsorption experiment. Cadmium copper released, zinc retained to some degree. With the desorption experiments on an overall net mass balance, we saw a similar effect as far as how much was released from the sand and clay column as we did the other ones that were simply just sand columns. And I think the point here though is that the mass may be the same, but the impact to the pore volume and timing of release is going to be different. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in the summary and conclusions. Now, the way that we saw this system, we kind of broke this aquifer into four different zones. One zone that was very close to the source, very acidic, very low pH. Zone two, we started to see some neutralization. We started to see iron, lower concentrations coming out in iron. Uh, zone two. Zone three, we started to see manganese. We also saw copper and zinc. And then, and then zone four really represents more what's uh, associated with Blacktail Creek and the confluence of those two zones. And one of the key components was this depositional environment. And we noticed this trend when we went from zone one to zone two to zone three. That in zone one, it wasn't, it was, it was more sands and silts intermixed no clear distinctions, but as we got closer towards, towards the creek, we saw these very fine lenses of silt and clay. And, and I gotta say that part of this, that we were able to see this level of detail was the drilling method that was chosen was a sonic rig. So we got complete cores. We were able to get really detailed uh, information about those. But the, the next piece really is that we see this attenuation on silts and clays adjacent to those sands and gravels. And that that's an important aspect of knowing then the interaction or how that water flows through the system. And, and our theory kind of went to how many silt and clay lenses does that water as it's flowing from the source interact with. And if you've got more discrete lenses, the closer you, you get to the creek, there may be more chances for that interaction along that interface between the the transmissive material and the aquitard. And showing that pH change, we do see a higher pH as you get further down in those different zones. And that could be reflected partly because of that neutralization potential. Could also be like we're seeing specific conductance going down here. Part of that is mixing with other water entering those zones. And with cadmium, copper, and zinc, you know, we didn't see much change between zone one and zone two. It was really zone three and zone four where we saw the biggest changes in that copper and zinc. And the iron mostly came out in zone two, but the manganese came out in zone three. So that, that tends to make sense with the, the copper relationship with manganese. 
And then finally, with the column study, we wanted to play this out over a year time frame. So we, we took those pore volumes, looked at the flow rates in the aquifer to try to just get a sense of what does this mean if, we, if the, the column study does truly represent what's happening in that aquifer. And we didn't see much of a difference between the sand and clay column and the other columns when it comes to copper. But we saw a significant difference when it comes to zinc and the time frame that it takes for that sand, uh, for the sand and clay column to bleed out the same amount of zinc as with the, the sand columns. So I, I think, you know, the importance here really is to make sure that if you're trying to understand your system, do different tests to make sure that you understand that mechanism. Test to make sure that it's not what you initially thought. Our initial thought was that it was just iron oxides. We started digging into it. We, we saw the importance of clays. So I, I would say don't underestimate that importance of clays and attenuation capacity. And I've got to say this, this work represented a lot of different people working on this project. And it, it's been great to be able to share it finally. Uh, you know, there was help from Atlantic Drench Field, from Pioneer, from Woodwater and Curran, Formation, Cascade, CDM Smith, DEQ, and BMG. All of them were involved with this planning and uh, oversight of, of the work that was done. Thank you. Session for the day is uh, tailings reprocessing session, and we're going to get that started with Chuck Boos from Golden Sunlight Mine, and he'll be talking about the regulatory side, overall view of the tailings reprocessing project. Chuck. Right, thanks, Dan. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Good to see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, for those of you, if it's your first time, um, I've been here a few times. I don't know how many. How many times has this been going on, Warren? 29. 29. Oh, probably 26 anyway, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, getting to be a lot of gray beards in the room. I'm, I'm getting to be one of them. I remember when I wasn't. <laughs> but here we are. Hey, I wanted to, uh, to, to read my abstract. I hope you guys don't get bored with that. Um, because it kind of says a lot about where we're going and what, what it is that we're trying to uh, do at Golden Sunlight. So again, my name's Chuck Boos. Um, I've uh, been working in industri industrial minerals. I helped uh, Luzanac, Rio Tinto. I've been in Nevada working out there for both Barrick, Placer Dome. And here I am uh, back home. I Is that too loud? Mm -hmm. And uh, when Dan Banghart, who was the previous general manager, opted to retire after our operations ceased, and they asked me if this is something that I could could manage for them at that particular moment in time it was a closure project and here we are we're going to morph into something different and uh, I won't steal everybody's thunder or, or, or my own but I'll, I'll kind of cover all that uh, a lot of the pictures um, I'm not going to cover um, the construction or any of the any of the work that's going on but more of the context of the project how we got from point A to point B but uh, Steve Lloyd he's our chief metallurgist at Golden Sunlight he's been uh, helping with a lot of different things over the years but uh, he's kind of the brains of the outfit right now, and I'm just kind of the orchestrator. So uh, a lot of people that we could acknowledge uh, in regards to this project or where we're at right now, uh, a lot of them are sitting in this room, and a lot of them are right over here on the regulatory side because, again, communication, as you guys will learn or, or have already learned, is, is key to getting a lot of different projects done. So let me get into this real quick. So um, Golden Sunlight Mine, a case study for tailings reprocessing as a closure strategy. A golden Sunlight Mine operated from 1982 to 2019, producing over 3 million ounces of gold and generating more than $70 million in taxes and $1.2 billion in economic activity for Montana. The mine had both open pit and underground components and operated an oxide mill that generated more than 40 million cubic meters of sulfur-containing tailings within two, impound <coughs> excuse me, two impoundments. Approximately one-third of this material was discharged into an unlined tailings impoundment with the rest being disposed of in a line facility. Uh, seepage from the unlined impoundment is collected using a pump back system that discharges to the line facility. Mining extended more than 800 feet below the water table and due to concerns with potential groundwater impacts, 
uh, avian exposure to acid and, and wildlife to acidic uh, pit, pit lake water. Um, it was recommended that a no pit lake and, uh, and, and no high sulfide backfill be allowed for closure. So our permit uh, requires perpetual water treatment um, and was planned for closure and that's currently is what's permitted and dewatering treated at approximately 620 gallons a minute through a high density sludge reverse osmosis water treatment plant. Uh, sludge would then be managed uh, in a line storage facility. So that's, that's what was currently permitted. And to avoid this unsustainable approach to managing the pit lake, um, Golden Sunlight developed an innovative closure plan to remine the TSF1 tailings, that's the unlined facility, and reprocess those tails to recover sulfur from the tailings, and then use the remaining benign waste material to backfill the pit, creating an evaporative sink condition that would prevent future pit lake and contamination to down gradient groundwater. Uh, the sulfur concentrates from this reprocessed tailings would then be sold to Nevada gold mines for their use in their roaster and autoclave operations. And this novel approach uh, promises uh, to provide more sustainable, less risky environmental solutions than long-term water treatment, while also creating more benefits for the local community at a lower cost to the operator. So I know that was pretty windy, but uh, I wanted to make sure I got that right and to let you folks know where we've been and where we're going. So one thing that you heard, uh, Leaky Tailings Pond, probably never heard of one of those in mining before. Um, there's an opportunity there, we can get rid of that. Uh, as acidic groundwater uh, below a pit, probably never heard of that before. Uh, there's an opportunity to, to, to not only condition, but definitely not have to treat that. Our goal is not to have perpetual water treatment. I think it's a realistic goal, it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, my boss's boss might think that it's going to happen overnight, that we can just turn off the switch, but He's, he's coming to the realization that things do take time, but uh, we have confidence that over time we're going get, to get through that. Hopefully I'm going in the right direction. So, you know, a, a little bit of commercial at the same time, but, you know, Varric has an operating vision. I'm not going to read that to you, but we also have a closure vision, too. And, and as I said before, our goal is not to have perpetual water treatment. Um, we want to create opportunities for divestment. I'm not saying that we're looking to sell the mine today. Um, I think we tried to do that once before, and I don't know if people could run away fast enough, but it reminds me of that, that fellow on that show where he, he's, he's just running around <laughs> screaming. That's about how fast uh, some of the folks were leaving after that. And, and again, when you have issues and, and it's hard to divest or it's hard to close properties and, and your bond is, is you know, pushing $200 million, it's not surprising that people are going to run away screaming. So. But with this, uh, you know, just finishing a lot of our reclamation, we've already lowered our bond significantly. Uh, right now, I think uh, our bond is, got a letter from the BLM just the other day, and I think their calculation was about 132 million. So we're, we're definitely down. It certainly helps to, to do the earthwork. But again, uh, eliminating perpetual water treatment, uh, enhance our uh, um, license to operate, enhance and, and sustain our credibility uh, and reputation, and certainly provide uh, sustainability for those communities that we operate in. I think sustainability is, is, is a big thing. So, you know, I, I talked about communication and communication not only with the regulatory folks, but also our communities. We have a great program um, that's been going on in Whitehall now for 20 years. It's, it's called the Citizens Transition Advisory Council. Um, I'm, a, I'm a member of that. I'd certainly recommend any of you folks that are operators in mining communities um, to think about something about how you communicate, what, it's, what the mine's doing, what it's up to, you know, especially if you're going to go into closure because communities absolutely rely on the taxes that they get from the mining industry. And when they disappear without, you know, without people thinking about how fast that can happen, you know, when mines are done, they pinch their reserves or, or, or economics stop them from operating, it, it absolutely puts them in the bind because those counties start to rely on that. So there's metal mine taxes and there's gross net proceed taxes. And when they disappear, depending on what you're, what, what, what it is that you're doing, um, what?
And when they get it's, more, uh, uh, the conference have friends that you thought you had in the fine past, conference. You oh, you're, you're getting you trained. Start working on getting trained. And that's, this is not a sustainability commercial, but I just want you folks to develop an hour as well. I can to have advocates, you know, in your community about what, what you're up to and where you're going. Bryson Excuse me. gave a talk. Jonas so, gave a talk. Uh, again, these are the things that are important to us. Um, oh, Nick, uh, we're yeah. also, you know, Josh Bryson and Jim yeah. Jonas. Yeah. I, again, yeah. making sure that your community and people that work for you are safe in the mining industry. Oh, great. Um, Ecosystems so we've been doing it right for a lot, of, a lot of years. Bad water. Safe in the mining industry typically. Um, but but if catch, you don't, you know, as a you hurt dog dog pony show on uh, making. You, you hear about it pretty quickly. And then again, your license to operate so definitely suffer. Yeah. So let's get back to, a, to, uh, to my presentation. So. Oh, I, I, I did mention, that. you know, we started in 1982. You know, uh, the 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 design yeah, or, uh, sound design at that particular moment in time. That's um, good. Not lining a, a facility was was standard. I'm not sure what they're talking about now. Just... Uh, you put a slurry barrier in, and that's the issue that happened was Tony part of the wall and the slurry barrier collapsed because they were filling it full of bentonite and left oh. a window. And it wasn't within a year um, we started. All right. The company identified, you know, with the with the monitoring wells down gradient, that there was contamination. Anyway, I won't go into that history. A lot of you folks that that certainly are from the area probably know um, about that, especially if you were around in those days or even worked in the in the in the state of Montana. But um, we've been pumping ever since. So we're pushing 30, 30 plus years of pumping back uh, since nineteen in since the eighties. Uh, just a piece of history, Barrick acquired Placer Dome in March of 06. Uh, we constructed a, a line tailings facility in 95. And as I mentioned before, mining was pretty much completed um, in 2019. So here's our roughly, here, here's kind of the, our current uh, closure alternative. So as I, as I mentioned, the Mineral Hill Pit went down, you know, about a thousand feet and then certainly into uh, into the groundwater table we've been pumping back I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute why we decided to to lower that but um, so it's it's and our current permit requires us to perpetually treat pit water and also the seepage around the tailings impoundment um, and I, I also talked um, a, a bit about you know the the no waste rock backfill or high sulfide and uh, and no and no pit pond some of the sources of our groundwater um, that would go into a water treatment plant that was that that was to be designed for 620 gallons a minute would be um, number two has a liner underneath the embankment and that's that's uh, designed for collecting the seepage and then pumping that that back because uh, of reclaim water during operations that's still seeping and and at some point if we were to close we'd have to manage that that solution so that's part of the 620 gallon um, design uh, the groundwater on the pump back system around TSF1 is part of the design. Pit dewatering, you know, not a lot of water there, but all together. And then the potential for ARD from waste rock seepage around 100 to 300 years in the future. So preferred permitting closure alternative, tailings reprocessing. Um, so when you're, when you're working on, on uh, fin figuring out what other alternatives there are, um, you know, things to consider are, is there something in, in that tailings that has value? So in ours, we, you know, we're pretty fortunate, I guess. I mean, yes and no, but ours has um, a lot of sulfur, like 4% sulfur has some residual gold because, you know, um, those of you that, that work in mills understand that efficiencies aren't perfect. Um, it's an iron pyrite, that's where the, the sulfur source is. There's a little bit of copper, some silver, um, things like that. So. I think if you're thinking about different alternatives, you want to identify if there's any value in what, it, what, what that waste is, whether it's your overburden or whether it's your tailings or, or whatever it is that, that you might have. But, and then is there some, do you have a customer? Is there somebody out there that could take what, what you have? And, and again, you can look a long ways. I mean, some places have cobalt, nickel, uh, again, mercury. Is, is there a market for any of those at some concentration that you can figure out what process we'd be able to concentrate that at. So that was the challenge for us. Uh, they've been looking at it for several years. We knew that, that our sister mines in Nevada were already um, buying elemental sulfur for their, for their processes. So uh, we had that. We knew that if we concentrated, and Steve Lloyd, he's going to give you a lot more detail on, 
on the science on that. But you know, through the flotation process, we can concentrate that up to about 40%, which makes it marketable. Um, so another thing was at the time when we were looking at it, it wasn't going to be economical for us because we're already using our mill. We were operating. We were using that as a grinding facility, cyanide processing, uh, leaching. But now um, our reserves that we had, we went underground back in like 14, 15. Um, that the economics just weren't very good. Barrick was pretty good about kicking the can down the road instead of building a water treatment plant. It was probably more. It was probably better for the company not to build a water treatment plant or lose money processing and making gold, making a little bit of gold there, but losing a little bit of money, but not spending $20 million right off the top to, to build a water treatment plant. Looking back, um, you know, it's probably lucky for us that we didn't, that we, that say Barrett kicked the can down the road, because if we wouldn't have, I can tell you that we would have been treating water and it wouldn't have been economical for us not to do that. They would have just said, well, we're just going to continue doing this until, you know, I guess forever. But now we're at that opportunity where all of a sudden we have all these facilities that we're not using. We got a grinding mill. And again, Steve will show you a bunch of pictures about where we've been with, uh, you know, how we designed it and so forth. But when you can repurpose things, you can save a lot of capital. That made it look better. The company that merged with uh, Barrick back in 18 ran gold. They're out of Africa. But they, they, they understood that's where they cut their teeth was reprocessing tailings and overburden at different facilities throughout Africa and mostly South Africa, and they're still doing it. But they understood it, they got it, and they, they knew that they could eliminate you know, other, other issues, source elimination, if you will. So um, there's some residual gold um, that would add some benefit. And our, our goal here, and, and it's not a goal, it's, it's a mandate, is, is to process everything in that tailings pond. What's the sense of starting? What's the sense of spending 20 to $30 million worth of capital if you're not going to finish the job? So that we're going to finish the job, and if, if Barrick won't take it, we're going to find other people right now that will. That's, that's the challenge that's been put to me is that, um, you know, Barrick has a long life. They need the sulfur. We're going to save them a lot of money um, by providing that. But we can get it done faster and they're okay with me sending it out. So I'll talk a little bit about what some of the other opportunities are um, out there. So again, if you're going to see one thing in this slide, or if you learn anything from one thing on this slide, it's identify if there's any value to that waste that you have. And if you can find a customer for it, you're, you're probably 50, 60% of the way there. So, what are the project benefits? I probably mentioned almost all of these already, but uh, eliminating the, poten the you know, potential perpetual water treatment is the biggest one. Um, you know, eliminating groundwater impacts or source elimination, um, ARD neutralization potential. So we're going to add lime um, when we, before we deposit that, that desulfurized um, tail back into the pit. Um, there's going to be additional reclamation areas, about 55 acres um, that we're going to, that could be used for other, other uh, um, remediation, not remediation, but habitat or something like that. There's going to be uh, a lot of avian um, uh, uh, birds are around the high wall and so forth. So uh, we're going to hire um, more people. So we, we started, I think it was in 15, 16, we had about 175. And today we're about 17. A lot of contractors helping us out. Um, transportation folks are going to be shipping our, our concentrate over the road at a minimum over to Butte um, and then ultimately rail. That's our goal. Um, again, helping sustainability uh, through our CTAC and, and community development uh, councils. And then I think one thing that, this, that a lot of the folks and community around the area um, like is the opportunity that we, you know, we have a ranch close by about 3,500 acres that that there's opportunity for block management. We're not going to change that. Uh, we'll continue on. So this all leads up to a new era for our mine. Um, this is a lot what Steve's probably going to talk more about, but um, here we are. We, we've, been, we've been thinking about this for a good 10, 12 years. Um, so we modified, you know, an existing um, operating plan. We, we tried, we permitted this back in 2010. Um, I'll look at Dan and say we permitted it, but but we didn't pay the bond, and I'm, I guess if you don't pay the bond, you're not really permitted. So we had a little bit of effort there to do, but um, 
I talked about Rand Gold and the and their merger and how that that helped us uh, create value uh, at Gold and Sunlight because they they ex you know they believed in in our tailings reprocessing plan that we had, and we've been working on that since about 2019. Um, so we submitted our application to the agencies back in uh, March of 2020, uh, and and I think as it stands today, we're we probably close to publishing the final EIS, or maybe it is published now. I'm not 100% sure. I missed the last meeting, um, but uh, we're well on our way to get this permitted and and fired up. Um, so you can kind of see some of the history there, and and our goal ultimately is to get shipments out the door by the end of the year. As it looks right now, and I think Steve will confirm, um, that's a, that's very uh, we're very confident that that can happen. I'm not going to cover this slide. Steve actually has this in his presentation, so I'll let him cover these two slides. And uh, you know, generally that's probably my presentation. I just wanted to show you a few pictures of the reclamation program. So we we're in care and maintenance. Uh, we've been working on that, making sure that all of our pumps are working and that we're maintaining our our systems, doing our reclamation. Uh, we've probably um, done about 200 acres in the last couple of years of reclamation. I wish we would have got more rain, but I know that our, our, our inspections of our vegetation show that everything germinated just didn't grow very big. Uh, the weeds did very well. Um, I think they liked as much fertilizer as, as anything, but uh, as you can see, this is, uh, you know, the, the upper one, the upper left is our north dump. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all these in detail. If you get an opportunity to come see us, you know, our door's open. Certainly like to have you come out for a tour if you want. Uh, that's just a, a piece of equipment that I think was around uh, Golden Sunlight back in the 80s, too. That's a, a, a snow cat, but it seems to work pretty effectively, get on fairly steep slopes and do that work. But um, our guys figured it out. They know how to do it. Uh, most of the operators that are working with uh, the contractor were probably uh, raised at Golden Sunlight at some point running heavy equipment. Uh, I kind of talked about some of the social programs, but I think, again, it's important, you know, just to keep the community and your regulators and, and, and your friends involved. And, and even, even if they're not your friends, um, you know, keep them on the, in the loop. So, you know, one of the folks or, or NGOs um, that probably sued Golden Sunlight more than anybody for every application we ever had was Todd Unlimited. And again, I'm not saying anything, anything against them at all. Um, they, that's their... You know, if they think there's an issue, then uh, um, they're going to help us try to remind us of what that is. But my point is, where I'm going with this is they actually wrote a letter in support of this project. So I tells you, um, you know, this is a win-win situation. It's a great story. And, you know, we're, we're pretty excited and happy that we can, can be a part of this, clean up something. I think it, it could be a trend in the mining industry of, of uh, finding value in your waste. So... Um, and hopefully make a little bit of money. We're not out here, we're not going to make a lot of money, but we're keeping the doors open, um, keeping people busy and cleaning up a source of contamination. So um, that for me is pretty much, pretty much it. Um, I, I hope there's, there's questions. We're pretty excited about it. So if there's anything I can do um, to, to answer questions to help you guys out, let me know. Well, how about we just talk about the, the, the concept and then Steve will get more into the details about what the process is. So if there's questions specifically on the context or, or the idea of, of a different alternative versus perpetual water treatment, I can, I can answer those questions. Have you, guys, have you guys looked into rare roots? Are there any in, in the tailings? Um, so to answer your question, no. Uh, there was not, nothing like that in our geology. Warren? Well, Chuck, when I came back to Montana in 1994 after an extended absence, uh, as I recall, I think Golden Sunlight had a couple years of reserves in sight back <laughs> then, and that was going to be it. Yeah. And uh, somehow, over the years, you've always been able to find a way to squeeze more out of it, and it looks like that is continuing to the present day. Uh, I have to admit that after the legal battles that we had over whether or not to backfill the pit back 15, 20 years ago, the thought of putting any kind of backfill into the pit does give me mild chest pains. <laughs> not the only one. <laughs> but I'm retired, I'm out of it, not my problem, and I have every faith 
in the current company and in DEQ to see that it's done properly. And I've, I've always applauded your uh, your innovation. Um, yeah, we've been pretty fortunate. They always seem like <coughs> the light was just about ready. You know, somebody was just about ready to hit the light on their way out the door and got that permit. The timing always always worked out. Are you just planning on reprocessing the unwind scale? Well, we're going to start there. If there's more need for it, um, the other tailing is very similar, so we have talked about it. If that was the case, we'd take a 12-year project to about a 30-year project. Am I correct that the backfill in the pit will be online? Correct. Yeah. So with the concentration, by concentrated, we've taken almost all the sulfides out. Um, we've had all of the kinetic testing done, if you will, for it, and nothing bled through after the, you know, well over a year of data, so. But less than a half a percent of sulfur is going to be left, if, if, if any, if, if any of it, so. And then all the other metals that, that will float with it, too, so. We're going to send it to Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> you put an expletive in there, but I won't. <laughs> Anybody else? Thanks for your time. And uh, again, thank you very much for this and the world. Up next is Steve Lloyd with Barrick, and he's going to continue with uh, this topic, and his is processing side, tailings reprocessing project. So. All right, thank you very much. Okay, well, it's really good to be here. I've also been here just a little bit, not near as long as some of the other folks, but about six years, so it's really great to be able to present here today. Uh, this is, it really is an exciting project. It's been in, in the works for a long time. Uh, Chuck mentioned some of the folks who've been involved with here uh, in this project. One of them is Tom Van Norman. Uh, some of you guys remember Tom. He was a metallurgist before I got there. Uh, Tom went, uh, started the uh, drilling on uh, TSF-1, and that's this, uh, this facility right here. So we look down through the country here. Here's one. Uh, here's number two, which was our operating facility in 19, when we shut down, 19, I mean, 2019. Uh, so there's about 26 million tons of tails in here. And that's what we're after uh, as far as reprocessing this material and then uh, placing it into the pit. And it's, it's going to fill the pit up into this area right in here. Uh, I've got a slide I think a little later on shows that area. Uh, so it fits in there real comfortably as far as in the pit. So that's good news. So Tom, back in the day, back in 2009, had done quite a bit of metallurgy. He did four holes out in the deposit. I uh, went to SGS up in Canada and did some metallurgy. This is basically a bulk sulfide flotation project for those of you familiar with that. So uh, basically roughing, regrind, cleaning, making a pyrite concentrate. This, this property has always been uh, refractive. So the gold is in the pyrite at this property. And uh, there's also in our TSF, there's also some tellurides. This, this uh, area in uh, Southwest Montana is kind of famous for its tellurides. We have four different flavors of those minerals in our facility. And they, they actually add something interesting to the mix as we go along, I'll talk about that. Uh, in 2009 uh, and 10, they did uh, their pre-feasibility study, they got all their act together, and they actually designed a little mill that would be down in this area, and that's what uh, Chuck was talking about. It turned out that that little mill, uh, even though it was never fully permitted, maybe a bond on it, was very, very important for this project because it allowed us to do pre-permit construction. We were able to move that, that little mill, so to speak, uh, into our operating plant and then uh, uh, do pre-permit construction. So we've been busy uh, for quite some time, and I'll show you a bunch of pictures of what's been going on inside the plant as we've demoed the plant and then built the plant back up again with new equipment. Uh, so yeah, so anyway, you can see uh, in this picture, here, here's our operating plant, and our repulper will sit down here. We'll be mining this facility from the north to the south, and we'll be repulping down here and then piping, pumping all the way back up to the plant. We'll be floating it in the plant and then pumping up to a thickener in this area. And then the idea is to go down this ramp 
and then spigot along the west, what we call our west high wall, right in this area. Uh, this area, this side of the pit is unstable. It's called our west shear. And so we'd like to, to spigot along the base of that to support that uh, for its strength and stability. So uh, we'll go ahead here. So SGS then came up with a really simple uh, flotation circuit. And uh, so I mentioned mining. We'll just be mining down at the TSF conventionally with uh, front end loaders and trucks and into a repulper. The repulper is basically uh, just re slurring it. So we de lump it, we repulp it in water, uh, we screen it, and then we pump it up the hill. So uh, it's just a way of getting it fluid again. We'll be pumping up the hill about 40% solids, and you can see it coming up here to the plant. We'll go into a rougher circuit. We have uh, three big 130 cubic meter uh, autocumpu flotation cells. Uh, the, the concentrate goes into a thickener. We thicken it up. We regrind it. Goes into the re cleaner circuit. We make uh, it's about a 38 to 40 percent sulfur concentrate. It, it has uh, our, our goal value down there is about 0.01 uh, ounce per ton. The concentrate will run about uh, 0.1. So we upgrade it about 10x, or from 0.3 grams to 3 grams is about what we do down here in, in this circuit. But the sulfur is really the, the deal that we're after as far as our citric plants down in Nevada. The concentrate then goes to a La Roque filter press. You can see down here, uh, suck all the water out, and then we'll transport that to Nevada, as uh, Chuck mentioned. Then the, the tails from the, rough, the rougher circuit, uh, they go to a pit thickener, as I mentioned before. And then uh, we actually do a little uh, lime amendment, and then it goes into the pit. We suspect that uh, in, the, in the beginning, uh, a lot of that fluid will actually infiltrate into the underground workings. When the miners got done working there in 2019, they kind of collapsed the drifts underground or filled them full of muck. Uh, so we expect we'll have some infiltration into the underground. We'll continue to pump uh, as long as this project is going. We need to convince ourselves and the DEQ that we could turn that pump off. So we'll be continue to pump that underground so we'll have a very good idea of the impact of this new material on groundwater quality very, very quickly. So that's a good deal. So, uh, so we'll be very much aware of what's happening. And because we're, we're pumping the, uh, the, the under area underneath the pit, then uh, this is a sink. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to, uh, all the water will continue to come into this area instead of going out. So as long as we're putting tails in and uh, until we've convinced ourselves otherwise, uh, this will be a sink. So the groundwater is, has a cone of depression underneath the pit. So it won't be expressing itself in springs and seeps and things like that. Right? That makes sense? So this is what our, our circuit is like. And then uh, here's a little computer model of uh, what it's going to look like. Uh, here, here's our rougher circuit. You have three big 130s. And then the, here's the rougher tail pump. Pumps up to the pit. And then it runs outdoors to a thickener out past here. And it, it runs to the regrind mill. Here's our first cleaner circuit, uh, these three machines here. First cleaner con comes back to the second cleaners, and then second cleaner con goes to this thickener here, and then actually goes across the street over to our Lorox filter press. So we've made good use of our existing facilities to squeeze all this in there. Uh, Chuck had mentioned that uh, uh, Barrick had merged with Rand Gold and the fact that these guys had done a lot of tails reprocessing in Africa. And when we presented this to them, they challenged us. Instead of building that little mill down below at the TSF, why don't you guys just repurpose your plant? And so that's what we've done. Uh, and I'll be showing you quite a few pictures of how that's gone in the last couple of years, actually, as we've been working on demo and then construction. So this is what the mill looked like. Uh, uh, it was a, uh, in this area was our grinding circuit. So in the background, you got a, a 2,000 horsepower rod mill. And this is our 3,000 horsepower ball mill. Uh, we got screens here. Uh, so this is what this mill looked like uh, before we really got going. We actually uh, leased the liner handler from Montana Tunnels up the road and took the liners out of the ball mill before we started taking the mills apart. So once we got the mills off of their pedestals, we brought a company in from Salt Lake City and they used a diamond rope saw to cut these very large pedestals and, and to, uh, they flattened them off. You can see that uh, these pedals used to be at this height right here. So now they've, they've been cut down appropriately. Uh, we had an a engineering company for this with Samuel Engineering down in Denver. And then we've also, uh, you see this big excavation here. Uh, 
un underneath the grinding circuit was this large six foot deep footing. And we excavated this area and we expanded that footing. And in this picture, you can see uh, a little later on, as so we've got our iron in there, the guys are filling it up full of concrete. These are all pump footings and structural steel footings right here in the plant. So it's a pretty big deal cutting those pillars down. We, we cut those pillars into about 25 ton pieces, uh, drilled holes in them and picked them up with basket hitches and put them in a loader bucket. So they look like, uh, they look like something from Machu Picchu. You can imagine a 25 ton block of concrete. Uh, that's what they look like. And then uh, that, that worked out pretty slick. So once we got the, uh, uh, the pillars cut down, we built some very large steel platforms that went over top of the concrete uh, for the roughers and the cleaners. And here you can see they're, uh, they're complete. Uh, and then we started installing our cells. These, came, uh, these cells were actually built down in Mexico. The cells were, but the, uh, the mechanisms were built in Finland uh, they're by Autotech. And you can see as we just progressed along here from June to the end of June, July. I'll have one more picture here showing what it looks like about today. We're just about done with the mechanical install for all these flotation cells. So we've taken uh, basically everything out of that circuit, uh, took the structural steel out, all the tanks, all, all the platforms, all the stairs, uh, put new, new concrete, new structural steel, new tanks. Uh, so we're just about done with that part. Here's a, here's a little dim shot of what it looks like today. So looking from the air direction, this is the last rougher. Uh, number two, here's three, here's the cells in the background. This is this area where the rod mill and ball mill were at. So the guys have done a great job. And one thing, a, a big shout out to Mountain West Industrial from Salt Lake City. They've done a great job here without incident or accident. So really proud of those guys. So then uh, uh, this summer, we, we approached uh, DEQ about is there, can we do some work outside of the mill? Uh, so we amended our, that little, that, uh, that permit to include a few areas outside the mill, because this is, this is the rougher thickener. So I mentioned between roughing and cleaning, we take it to the thickener, we thicken it up, and then to the regrind mill. Uh, this is the uh, foundation for the rougher thickener. And you can see it progressing from excavation, rebar. There's two big mats in number eight. And then uh, to all the pedestals. Uh, and then finally, we're just forming up the footings. Uh, it's backfilled now. We're just getting ready to pour the uh, the curb around the outside. So the guys did a great job on this. So that's one of our outside projects. Uh, did I miss one? Yes, this is uh, uh, something else that Rand, the Rand Gold guys challenged us with was concentrate storage. So when we talked about building some covered concentrate storage, uh, we thought, well, you know, uh, one of the fellows there at Rand Gold said, why don't you use your secondary crusher? So we had the secondary crusher building. It was full of crushers and screens and all that kind of stuff we didn't have any use for. And so we decided to go ahead and demo it. And uh, this picture here, you can see the crusher, uh, part of the crushers here is two uh, seven foot Simons crushers. The screens are gone now in this picture. Uh, a lot of the infrastructure is all gone. Uh, here you can see we've, uh, th this is a number four galleyway for you guys who've been there before. Uh, we actually uh, filled that full of fill and then poured it full of concrete so the floor is flat now. And then here you can see what it looks like today. We've got bollards around the structural steel that remains. And we're actually pre-assembling the uh, steel for the rougher thickener inside this, this building. This, this building will we'll get some economy blocks along the round, around the outside. And this will hold about 2,500 tons of concentrate. So it's a great uh, way to reuse one of our buildings and, and give us some good con covered concentrate storage. This stuff is, uh, is reactive with water, so uh, uh, it, makes, it, it makes acid, so it's very important to keep it dry. We'll be taking the, wa the water out of it with the Lorox filter press, so it'll be about 07% uh, oh, moisture as it's sitting here, but we don't want it to be outside, and we don't want the guys who are transporting it to be outside, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Very important to keep the material in that state. Mayor, I just wanted to show you uh, a different little different view. This is a good view of the, how much uh, this 26 million tons lays in the pit. This comes up here. Here's the ramp coming up out of the pit. So you can see it fits in there very comfortably. Here, here's that west uh, high wall I talked about. It's got shear zones on both sides. Uh, that's why it's unstable. Uh, what else we got here? Here we have our pit thickener. Uh, process facilities, we're, we uh, will be, as soon as we get our permit, we'll be constructing this feature and our repulper down below. Those are the two big features we were not able to do until after our EIS is done. So uh, 
in a few weeks here, when we get the permission, we'll be going uh, wide open to construct this, uh, the pit thickener and its water treatment facility, and also the repulper down at the Tanley's Dam. Just a little picture here on how we're going to mine. Uh, this is the TSF, TSF-1, and here's two. The repulper is kind of right here in the middle. And uh, the idea is, is, to, is to mine into the wind. So this, this, this facility has about a four foot uh, soil cap on it. And so what we want to only remove the cap as we need to. And we don't, because it'll, it'll generate wind on the, I mean, uh, dust. So we want to really uh, mitigate that dust by only taking this off when we need to. Then as it comes off, we want to coat, we want to reclaim right away. So as we start mining from the south, this is a, this was an old draw. This is a draw and it was a little ridge in between these two areas. So we want to uh, mine from the north to the south. And as we mine down, we'll take the soil off of here and put it in the background. So we'll co-reclaim as we're, as we're taking the tails out, cleaning it up, we'll be putting the, the top soil right back in, in the back as we're going right along, you know. So that's how we'll do that. And it looks like right now we'll be doing uh, just conventional mining with excavators and, and trucks. We've done, uh, in this facility, we've done four test pits. Uh, the DEQ allowed us to do some test pits. We've done one in, this is kind of the slime area. We've done, a, uh, like out in this area, we've had four of them now, where we've uh, dug pits almost 40 feet deep. And the idea was to, you know, put equipment in there. Uh, what kind of traffic ability did we have? Did it pump? Did it liquefy? Did it stand up? Did it slump? Uh, and the answer to that was no. It didn't do any of those things. It didn't pump. It didn't liquefy. It didn't slump. It stood straight up. Uh, we had a few of these open for a few months. And uh, so pretty competent. We had, uh, we had loaders in there, we had excavators in there, we had dozers in that cut. Uh, and so that's really a good news as far as traffic ability on the tails as we think about mining. We'll be starting up in the winter now. We'll be starting up in, you know, late December, January. So we got our work cut out for us, right? As far as working with wet tailings. So there'll be, a, uh, this repulper kind of sits right in this area. And I have a big conveyor uh, feeding it that has two hoppers on it that you can feed from either side with a grizzly. Uh, this, this, this TSF has uh, some metal dumps in it that were there on purpose. We, act, we, we take material from the mine, uh, from the mill that has uh, salts on it. We call it salts. It's been contaminated with cyanide and we buried it in these tailings dam. We, we have one today in TSF2. We did it on purpose. But we're going to encounter that material. So we know that. So, so that's one reason why we have uh, grizzlies on our, on our hoppers. We'll have a magnet on, on our feed belt. Uh, we'll be watching that real close. And if we find a, a dump like that, we'll just rope it off and then clean it up with a magnetic grapple and then keep right on going. So we expect to run into those kind of things. One thing that's very interesting about this uh, TSF is uh, there was quite a, quite a bit of cap rock went on it before the, the, the soil went on top. And it was pretty big. So I've, I've seen pictures of this cap rock like this. Uh, all these test pits that we've done on TSF1, that, that rock is non-existent. Our rock here is like that. It goes away over time. It's not hard rock like, uh, like Troy or some other place where you guys have been. This stuff uh, dissolves. It just, it just goes away. Very interesting, very interesting part of that. So we're not expecting to run into a lot of big coarse rock on the grizzlies over top of these hoppers. We're just not seeing it in, in our test pits. Yeah. Okay, okay. This, is, this is a little video here I want to show you. This is kind of fun. Uh, let's see if I can get it to go. Can I just click on it? How do I? Here, I'll get it. Go. Can you can you get it? This is kind of this is a little demo video. Yeah, so that's how you demo a dust tube. That's a 35 ton dust tube. Uh, we had greens cut it in half. And then cut it at the bottom, and then we threw it over with the excavators. So that's how you get rid of a 35-ton dust tube. So that, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Uh, we've just been really successful as far as uh, demoing uh, safely and effectively, uh, going back, back in the same facility, uh, new concrete, new steel, uh, new equipment. Uh, we're just about to the phase right now where we're doing piping. So we're piping and electrical is, is on the view screen at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, kudos to the agencies working with us and uh, our contractors done a great job. So, any questions? Yeah. 
guess I lost track a little bit. So you said you're going to use a conventional line with all the tailings? Yes. And you're going to dry them before you put them in? No, they, they, uh, they, they're, they're about, uh, the tailings right now are about 15% moisture. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done a lot of drilling on, on the TSF over the years, uh, three or four different campaigns. The tails are, are just about drained down. Uh, Ten years ago, they were 25% moisture was the highest moisture content. Right now, we're down about 15. And you can barely ball it up. At 15%, you can barely ball it up. So it's, 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 real, it's real good as far as, uh, you know, loading and hauling and digging and all that kind of stuff. I thought you had a uh, key watering yeah, we, well, actually on this end, we have a repulper. We repulp it with water at this end, but up on the other end, up on the concentrate end, we have a Lorox filter press. Takes all the water out of the concentrate. So we ship, the, we ship dry concentrate and the highest sulfur concentrate. So that's our highest cost in this whole product is transportation. Yeah. Yeah. What did you say the depth of the tailings are? What's that? The depth of the tailings? The, the, the depth is about... Uh, about 140 feet, 145 feet is the maximum depth at the very south end. So we start up uh, only about 50 feet deep in the, on the north end, and then we go down, you know, like in an old draw, you know, you know like that. So uh, yeah, we'll be, and we'll take out the embankment as well. I mean, the whole thing will look like a draw when we're done. So it'll be back to where it was in the beginning. Yeah. Steve, what was the water treatment of reclaimed water you showed on your process flow diagram? Okay, so uh, reclaim water, we'll, we'll be, uh, like on our tailing thickener, our pit thickener, that water comes into, back to the plant, and it goes right into our internal reclaim uh, tank along with uh, the concentrate thickener overflow, along with the filtrate from the Lorox filter press, and it just goes right back out again. So we really aren't going to treat reclaim water so much as we are just to reuse it. So I think when you think about re treating, it's more, uh, it's just we're keeping it in the circuit, and we'll reuse it over and over again. We've got about a 500 gallon makeup water requirement for this project. So we'll be, uh, we have a 800 gallon a minute, uh, we actually 1200 gallon a minute uh, water right on the Jefferson Slough. But we expect only to use about 500 gallons of that uh, in the beginning. As, as, as the pit starts to, as we slow down the infiltration into the underground, we should start pit, building a pit lake, a, a little pit pond. And then we hope in year three that we can start reclaiming that or pumping that and then decrease our, our uh, freshwater usage out of the sloop. One thing we have to be careful about is uh, high pH water depresses pyrite, the very thing we're after. And so uh, when we get to that point, we want to just make sure we're backing off of that line mitigation that it going into the pit so that when we start recirculating water, it's about neutral pH, you know, 7, 7, 5, something like that. Yeah. Oops, sorry. <coughs> is the... Uh, uh, underground dewater my, uh, water going to be utilized at all in any of the circuit? So, so we, we're, we're working on, uh, uh, Chuck mentioned uh, Chuck Unlimited has uh, really kind of given us their support. But one of the questions they asked us is the exact, exact question, is there any water you can use on, on your site uh, versus slough water from the Jefferson River? So we've been actively pursuing that. We, we've tested the mine water uh, in our flotation circuit. We've tested uh, some of our... Uh, historic uh, uh, spring water, which is called the rattlesnake. We've tested that. We also have a string of pump backs between TSF1 and TSF2. We've been testing that water. So we're in the middle of that. So uh, yeah, it looks promising so far. I would say the results are promising, that we will be using some of our own water to offset fresh water. I would say that looks very, very promising. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thanks very much. I really appreciate it. All right, well, one last presentation for the day here. So up next is Mark Rhodes with Hydrometrics, and he'll be talking about the East Helena Slag Removal Project. Mark. Thanks, Dan. All right, the last one of the day. I promise not to make this take too long since I know you're all ready for happy hour. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit here about uh, the slag recycling that we're taking on at the 
former Sarko smelter in East Helena. Um, the site now has uh, been owned by the Montana Environmental Trust Group. They are a court-appointed trustee who took over the site during after the Asarco settlement in 2009. Um, they've been tasked with uh, implementing the cleanup and ultimate disposal of all the properties that uh, Asarco had owned um, during their time of operation. Um, we've actively since 2009 been going through our corrective measures, uh, completing all of the required corrective measures to get site closure and the last item on our list for corrective measures is dealing with our slag pile. Um, this slide here kind of gives you an overview of what the facility looks like today. Um, the ET cover, which we constructed over the former plant site, demoed all the buildings, um, built that evaporable transfer tip cover over the top of that to prevent infiltration. Um, we reclaimed and redid about a mile and a half of Prickly Pear Creek. Um, there used to be a dam right here known as Smelter Dam, which used to impound two lakes up behind here. Um, we removed the dam, restructured all the creek um, in order to drop groundwater from flowing through our site. Um, we managed to uh, reduce groundwater levels flowing through the site by more than 10 feet, um, which has helped reduce uh, the amount of contaminated soil that's in contact with groundwater. Um, so you can see here the slag pile really is the last non-green item we have left out here from that former smelter site. <laughs> uh, a little background on the Sarko smelter. It operated from 18, 1888 to 2001 when the Sarko went into bankruptcy, it closed down. Uh, the main product that they were producing was lead bullion. Um, but alongside with the lead bullion, they were also producing zinc, sulfuric acid, and copper and rich spice and mat. Um, from 1888 to 1927, Asarco was producing mainly just lead bullion. Um, as their concentrations started coming in that they were smelting, started getting higher and higher concentrations of zinc. Uh, so in 1927, they constructed a zinc plant, which they were taking the uh, blast furnace material as everything came to the blast furnace making the lead bullion. They would take that molten blast furnace slag, run it through a zinc plant and fume off the, slag, fume off the zinc and then dump everything up on the slag pile. Uh, that operated until 1982 and in 82 when that shut down they went back to just running everything through the blast furnace and disposing of their slag up on the slag, the slag pile. Um, Right now, we have about 2 million tons of the unfumed slag, which contains the zinc, which is the uppermost lift on the slag pile. Uh, that's the material that we've been trying to market since 2009 on. We know that there's somewhere between 12 and 14% zinc in that slag, trying to find a good market for it and what to do with it. Um, it sure seemed like with as much zinc as was in there, it was better to try to figure out a way to reprocess that and take the zinc out of it than just capping the slag pile itself and leaving all of that material there. Uh, this kind of gives you a picture of how the slag pile was produced over the years. Uh, this southern portion right here, that was the pre-1927 slag. That slag has zinc in it. Uh, that slag was actually poured out in the molten form, so it's a uh, very massive kind of thin sheets. Then after they put in the zinc plant, they, this is this rest of the slag pile right in here. That was also poured molten, but that doesn't have any zinc in it. Uh, that's what we call the fume slag portion of it. And up until 82, that's where they were pouring all of this slag. This is the portion of the slag that we're looking at reprocessing. This is this upper lift of unfumed slag. Uh, instead of that being poured out molten, that part, that part of the slag was actually poured into molds, let cooled, and then was hauled up and dumped onto the slag pile with loaders. So it's uh, anywhere from three inch to four foot diameter chunks of slag just piled up. Um, we just started this process so three years ago really getting serious about trying to figure out 
how we can get rid of this and get, uh, recycle this slag. We were approached by a metals broker um, that had many contacts all around trying to figure out the best way to reprocess this slag. Um, as you guys probably know, there are no smelters left in the U.S. for this material to go to, so it was kind of difficult trying to find where we could take this. We have originally looked at Trail British Columbia. Their facility just wasn't big enough to take this fast enough to make this actually economically viable. Um, so this metal broker had uh, identified Korea Zinc, which is the largest zinc smelter in the world. It's in South Korea. Um, the problem with is uh, East Helena is a long way from South Korea. So trying to find, make the economics work out of how to actually get this material transported to the coast, to on a ship and across the ocean, uh, it took several years of planning. Um, just so happens that the metals market started to rebound, zinc started to become a little bit more profitable, and with all of the new green energy alternatives, zinc starting to become a very highly hot commodity. So this last December, we initiated our phase one of this project. Um, we completed that in May of 2021. Uh, the phase two of this project is in the early stages right now. We're just starting to get a little bit of the infrastructure finalized and hopefully this will ultimately run all the way through December 2028 and we will get rid of uh, 2 million metric tons of that unfumed slag that's on the upper lip of the slag pile. Uh, phase one, which started back in December, was basically we needed to get rid of some of the infrastructure that was on the slag pile. There was uh, two million gallon tanks that sat up on the slag pile that were part of the former Asarco stormwater system. Um, during all of our construction work and the original corrective measures we did at the site, we were using, utilizing those stormwater features to get rid of some of the water that we couldn't get rid of from evaporation. They were very wide, large. We could pour you know, a couple thousand gallons in there and it would go away in a few days evaporating. But up until this year, they were really not doing anything at this point in time and they needed to go away. And on, there was one of the benefits was underneath these two concrete or these two steel tanks was a very large concrete slab which makes a very good place for us to stockpile this material once it gets crushed. So we demoed both of those million gallon tanks and we had to construct a rail spur in order to be able to efficiently be able to move this material out to the coast. Um, we looked at trucking, trucking just was not feasible. Um, so the metals broker, those, those folks worked with Montana Rail Link and they built a new con a rail spur off of the Ash Grove rail spur that goes out to Ashgrove. We built a new rail spur in there for approximately 25 cars that we can fit on that. And that, all that work was completed in April of 2021. The second part of phase two was to actually send an initial shipment over to Korea Zinc. Um, we wanted to make sure that the material we were sending them was the material that they wanted. We didn't want to go through all of the process of getting all of the crusher material set up, all of, go through all of the expense of getting all of the conveyor belts and everything loaded up to be able to do that work. So for this first 2,500 metric ton shipment, we actually put this in super sacks. Um, we sized the material down to 12 inch minus, which is what Korea Zinc asked for in these super sacks. Um, we loaded all of these, this 2,500 metric tons into the one ton super sacks, loaded them on rail cars, set the shipment over. Um, the results from that original shipment that we sent over were very positive. I think they were very happy with the amount of zinc that they were able to recover out of that material. Just a few pictures of some of the demolition going on of the tanks. Um, this took approximately two days to get rid of all of that tank. They grabbed them with a shear, folded it up into little bitty bundles and hauled it all off and we were just left with this concrete slab right here. Um, they've ultimately torn down the walls on that and made it just one big flat pad. That's where they'll crush and stockpile the material on. A couple pictures of the rail spur that they put in. Um, this is the new rail spur right here. This is the main Ashgrove line. These guys right here are now in the process of we're putting in an actual rail scale there. Um, as you can imagine, this slag is a really heavy 
Um, so we have to be very careful of how much we load into each car so we're not overloading anything. Um, it's kind of interesting when you look at what they're going to load in there. You're going to have a great big sand car, and we're barely going to get half of it full before we're at weight. This stuff's quite heavy. Uh, so basically, this was our phase one process. Uh, we used the screens to uh, size the slag to 12 inch minus. Uh, we put the 12 inch minus material into one ton super sacks. Uh, they were transported by forklift over to a loadout facility into the rail cars off our rail spur. They loaded these super sacks into the rail cars. We were getting about 80 super sacks per rail car, um, sometimes a little less. Uh, one requirement we had on shipping everything in these super sacks is we could not rip them. We could not spill any slag. If a rail car showed up at the Port of Seattle with a ripped bag, they would reject that. It'd have to come back. So they were very, very careful not to overload these super sacks. It was some trial and error to begin with. Uh, first time we loaded them, as soon as they went to pick them up, they ripped out and found out you could barely put any in each one of those super sacks. <laughs> So, yeah, the material was transported to the Port of Seattle, and then it was ultimately loaded onto an ocean vessel and transported over to the KC facility in South Korea to recover the zinc. Um, here's a few pictures of them in the super sacks, loading them up, picking them up with the forks, and then we were hauling them right down over to our rail spur there and using a little skid steer loader with uh, forks on it to load them into the sides, into the car. You can see there how little bit we can stack in there. We only had two rows is all you could stack in there. Phase two of our recycling, um, we're just starting to get going on that. Uh, ultimately, we're going to start crushing the slag down to two inch minus. Um, our goal is to be able to crush seven months a year. Uh, and then we're going to transport that slag from our slag pile stockpile using a conveyor system. We're putting in, oh, about eight, 900 feet of conveyor over to a radio loadout facility so we can load just directly off the crusher pile all the way down, run it down into a radio loading facility and load it right into the cars. Uh, our goal is to get 20,000 metric tons loaded a month and hauled out. Um, this slag in the rail cars for this, these larger shipments, it'll be going to Vancouver, British Columbia at that port and it'll be loaded onto the cargo ships and then transported to Korea. Another just a little basically of what I just talked about, a little flow chart of how we're going to get that material crushed on over to the rail cars and then loaded out with our ultimate goal of getting 240,000 metric tons per year. Uh, to get rid of our 2 million metric tons, we're hoping seven years we can get it all going. Um, our goal is to crush an entire year's supply into a stockpile in that seven months. And then in the winter months, we can still be loading it onto rail cars and shipping it out. Uh, here's a picture of the current setup right now that we have for the crushing system. Um, just regular old sand and gravel jaw crushers that they're going to be using. They'll be loading it in to the jaw crushers and crushing it down to the two inch minus. Um, any oversize is going to kind of get rolled back around and recrushed. Um, as you can imagine, on if anybody's ever been on a slag pile before, most facilities that have a slag pile, they never got rid of anything. So who knows what you find buried in the slag? There's a lot of steel. There's a lot of other interesting nuggets of things you'll find in a slag pile. So they also do have a mag on this to recover any steel or anything else that we find as we're starting to dig through this pile. Um, the upper lift itself is a lot cleaner than the lower stuff. It was a lot harder to hide things in the real large stuff when you were burying it. It was a lot easier to hide things when you were pouring it out molten. You could just dig a hole, leave a low spot, pour the molten right over the top of it. Problem solved, everything's gone. <laughs> This is the, where they're going to actually, after they crush it, it'll run down here to the conveyors, and this is where they're going to stockpile. This is that concrete slab where those 2 million gallon tanks were. Um, we ran just a little bit of a test pile here. It's only about a couple hundred yards just to make sure everything was operating correctly. Um, 
and right now we're just basically waiting on more conveyor belt. Um, we have to, we had to have the radial stacker itself constructed. We couldn't find one anywhere that would fit our needs and if anybody that's tried to build anything with steel lately knows it's really hard to get anything from steel ordered and sent to you so that's what we're still waiting on at this point in time. One of the interesting things about us doing this slag recycling project is we're actually doing this under a remedial action. The unfumed slag itself is one of the last contributing sources of selenium to our groundwater plume. And so in order to get the last corrective measure done for this site, we were ultimately going to have to cap the slag pile. Well, we knew there was that much zinc in that slag pile, so we were trying to actually use a beneficial reuse of that instead of just capping it. So one of the interesting things about this is we're actually selling this slag, making money going back into our cleanup fund. So we're actually creating part of our corrective measure. We're getting paid for it. So all these funds that we're generating from the recycling of this slag are going back into our cleanup account for future O&M, any other future remedial actions that have to go on at the site. And as I mentioned, our selenium problem that we have at the site, uh, this is kind of a snapshot of our selenium plumes from 2018 through 2020. Um, we had two main source areas that were early on identified as the main sources of selenium. This one here was on the plant site, and we have this one here that's under the slag pile. The plant site has been capped. Um, so as you can see, as it progresses along, our gap in between the two lobes has, starting to got, has gotten wider. Um, we're starting to clean up the selenium in that. The actual end of where that selenium plume going out is starting to retreat. So we're hoping that once we get rid of all of the unfumed slag will have gotten rid of our major, one of the last remaining major sources of selenium to groundwater. And once we get that completed, we will find ultimately cap the slag pile, regrade all that. Um, one small thing that's going along with that is we also do have a market for the fume slag. Uh, the fume slag is used in the cement manufacturing industry. They add an additive into the cement. They use it to increase strength in their cement. Um, so we are actively looking, pursuing some markets for, so now we have a rail system going on. We may be able to market some of that and get rid of actually even more of the slag at the site and reduce our overall costs to ultimately cap the slag pile and then whatever funds we have left over in our cleanup account for the East Helena facility can be used for other trust owned sites that ASARCO from the ASARCO bankruptcy settlement in Montana, those funds can be transferred over and used in those. And that's pretty much all I've got. Is there any questions? Yes, <laughs> we went through several ports before we actually got to, uh, we originally tried to go through the port of Longview. Uh, just too many environmental concerns. We went through some other issues with other ports in Washington, uh, looked into California and ultimately British Columbia was the, they were ready and willing to take this. So yeah, we did have some hurdles, it took about a year of going through that. <laughs> So with all the insanity in the supply chain internationally, I know I see where apple growers can't get their apples on boats going back to Asia because ships turn around and get back to Asia empty because they can make more money doing that than waiting two weeks to get loaded. Are you guys running into any of those headaches? Plus, international shipping rates are up two or three times over three years ago. So how, how has that been a factor in your economics and your 
We have not run into that issue as of yet. Um, I'm sure those issues are going to arise. Um, the Wontan Environmental Trust itself is not actually part of that shipping. The metals broker that we're at ultimately selling this slag to, they're the ones that are taking on all of that. Um, they do have a contract with Korea Zinc for that entire 2 million metric tons. Um, so based on the fluctuations, we haven't seen any indications yet that none of this is going to happen. So you never know. <laughs> that uh, top layer slag um, to, uh, to recover the zinc. Um, after you do that, could you say you'll also be taking some of that lower slag, the pre-1927 material? Yes, we may, we're looking into that. Um, there's not quite as much zinc in that material. Um, it's basically, if we get down to getting rid of that entire upper lift, if the zinc market is still viable, they'll start taking the rest of that. Otherwise, it'll just get incorporated underneath our cap. Do you have any idea how the zinc content of each calendar compares to other slag piles like Anaconda, Leadville, Tacoma, places like that? I don't. Um, East Helena slag has always been a little different than any of the slag anywhere else, and I think it was mainly just because the ore that was coming in that they were getting lead out of was completely different than the stuff that they were running copper out of, and just it was just the nature of those lead concentrates that were coming in that had additional zinc in them, which is ultimately why they built a zinc plant in 27 to extract the zinc out of it. When the bags had a rip of them, were they sending the whole shipment back or were they send, were they kind of picking through and still just sending the bags? No, they would they were gonna return the entire car would have just had to turn around. So yeah, we made dang sure there was no rip bags and yeah, that first we didn't get any rip bags. They were very, very careful. <laughs> Standard lead PPE, so they're using coveralls, respirators. Um, we are using dust suppression up there to limit any dust, but it is using just standard lead OSHA rules. So they do have a clean room changing facility. They have all the lead placards posted up there. So that's mainly what we're using. One more. How do the economics look on this? Will you make much money? Um, the trust itself, yes. Uh, right now we're estimating we're going to put almost $4 million back into our cleanup account without really doing much of anything. What will Korea Zinc do with the, whatever is left after they process it? Conveniently enough, uh, Korea Zinc is located right next to a cement facility. So once they reprocess that slag, take the zinc out of it, they'll have fume slag. That fume slag will go into their cement manufacturing. So essentially, they aren't going to even have a slag pile. It'll just they'll just reuse everything that comes out. All right. I think that's it for today. Just a couple of follow-up reminders. Uh, please again take a moment to fill out the conference evaluation forms. I know it's easier if you do it the day of rather than letting them pile up till later in the conference. So please take a few minutes and do that. For those of you that are scheduled to present tomorrow, again please make sure you attend the speaker's breakfast tomorrow morning in the Water's Edge dining room. Uh, the welcome, there's a welcome registration tonight sponsored by Tetra Tech. Um, it's scheduled to begin at 5.15 p.m. And lastly, it looks like we're, get to, we're set to get started tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So thanks, everyone. Hope you have a good night.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.